several hundred years ago, the state of Joseon was located on the territory of modern Korea. There were a lot of people living in this state who were engaged in ordinary everyday things, such as agriculture, fishing, fishing and so on. However, what made this state unusual was that almost all of its inhabitants trained every day to become stronger and develop their physique. Yu Su Ji was the ruler of this state, and he carefully ensured that the inhabitants of his state became stronger and more resilient every day. Every morning Su Ji came to his people to supervise how his people were doing their training. Even during their work, many residents did not forget about their training and performed it as carefully as possible. Also, the people of Joseon State had a special place where they trained as hard as they could every morning, and every morning Su Ji came to this place to supervise the training of his people. There were a lot of exercise machines in this place, which were similar to modern exercise machines, thanks to which the people of Joseon could train their bodies much more effectively. Thanks to Su Ji, most of the men in Joseon had a strong and pumped-up physique. In addition to training, some men also adopted a special diet to make it easier for them to build their muscle mass. However, not all men found it so easy to pump up their bodies, and many found it very difficult to pump up their bodies. While some men pumped up their muscles with ease, others tried their best not to pass out during training. Many Joseon men found it difficult to endure such training, but they still tried their best to become even stronger. Su Ji was very proud that his people were becoming stronger and more courageous every day. Several centuries have passed since then, and modern Korea was formed in the place where the state used to be. Choi Young Jik was an ordinary Korean who was actively involved in sports and began to study the history of his country at one of the state universities. Young Jik began training since he went to serve in the army, where there were extremely harsh conditions and strict discipline. During his service in the army, Yun Jik began to become very interested in bodybuilding, and after the army he began to study at one of the state universities at the history department. However, even after Yong Jik started studying at the university, but he still didn't stop training. Yong Jik started going to the gym, watching his diet and leading a healthy lifestyle, and after some time his physique became even more pumped up and strong. After some time, Yong Jik was able to earn his athletic certification and decided to celebrate with his friends. That evening, Yong Jik and his friends had a good time and after the celebration everyone went home in a good mood. Soon Young Jik returned home, and he decided to have a little snack and watch a couple of videos on the Manwa channel recaps before bed. After watching a couple of Young's videos Jik saw in his recommendation feed a documentary video about the state of Joseon and its ruler Sejong. At one point in the video they said that Sejong lived a very short life, and Yun Jik believed that it was because of this that Sejong did not exercise and did not lead a healthy lifestyle. At one point, Yun Jik began to fall asleep and think about what would happen if he ended up in Joseon and became a sports instructor there. Then Yun Jik began to imagine how he could develop a fighting force in Joseon and thereby rewrite the history of Joseon. Yun Jik thought it would be great, after which he quickly fell asleep before he even got to the bed. The next morning, Young Jik woke up when someone started asking him about his cough. The stranger's voice Jik was very soon awakened by the crowing of a rooster. Young Jik didn't understand where the rooster's crowing could be coming from, and he simply decided that he had drunk too much beer last night. By Young Jik tried to wake up, he wanted to pick up his phone, but he discovered that his phone was not nearby. Also Young Jik didn't understand why he woke up not in his apartment but in a traditional Korean house. However, the strongest one is Young Jik was shocked why, instead of a pumped up and strong body, he had a very thin and weak body. Meanwhile, the unfamiliar voice continued to tell Young Jik that it was already morning and that it was time for him to get up. Young Jik couldn't believe his eyes, and he decided to open the door of the house, hoping to understand what happened to him. Young Jik opened the door of the house and a man stood next to him and asked Young Jika, is his cough gone? Also Young Jik saw a small courtyard with people in traditional clothes. Young Jik did not understand anything, and he asked the man standing next to him what his name was. At first the man did not understand Young's question Jika, and he told him his name was Yu Su Ji, and then Young Jik guessed that his father's name was Li Du. The man then confirmed that Su Ji's father was none other than Li Du Sejong who was the fourth ruler of Joseon. Su Ji then believed that since his father was known as Sejong the Great, then Su Ji was the great Prince Jin Yang. Based on all this data, Yong Jik realized that he had somehow mysteriously ended up in Joseon, and that he was the very great Prince Jin Yang. Jin Yang couldn't believe that he was actually in Joseon, 
and he felt that everything seemed too realistic to him. At one point, one of the subjects called Yong Jin Yang, and then Yong remembered that he actually ended up somewhere in the middle of the 15th century, when Joseon still existed. Then Jin Yang began to get very nervous, since he knew what significant historical figures he would have to see, including the fourth king of Joseon Sejong. Jin Yang began to get more and more nervous, and soon Sejong himself called him to give him a special task, and found himself in the same room with Sejong Jin Yang was simply shocked by what he saw. At this moment, Jin Yang saw a very rounded Sejong in front of him, who was having a very hard time breathing and was not at all like the Sejong that Jin Yang had read about in history books in his previous life. Jin Yang couldn't hide his surprise, and Sejong simply assumed that Jin Yang simply hadn't woken up yet, and hadn't had time to come to his senses. At one point, Jin Yang decided to bow down to Sejong just in case, but Sejong himself did not understand what Jin Yang was doing. Suddenly, unexpectedly for himself, Jin Yang noticed how much the structure of his speech and his vocabulary had changed and he began to speak the same way as all the inhabitants of Joseon times. Then Jin Yang began to ask Sejong for forgiveness for showing such ignorance. But Sejong himself said that he did not hear any ignorance in his son's words. After this, Sejong told Jin Yang that he greatly appreciated his talents, and so he asked Jin Yang to rewrite the Kang Mak, which described all the events in Joseon. Sejong said that in order to carry out this assignment, Jin Yan must go to the Chihianjiang Educational Institution, after which Jin Yan went to Chipyangjing. After some time, Jin Yang reached Chipyangjing, where many different scientists usually gather, where they conducted their scientific research. Once in Chipyangjiang, Jin Yang thought that if he found himself in this era, he would have to regularly visit this place in search of various historical data about Joseon. One of the visitors to Chipyangjiang told Jin Yang that if he could rewrite the Kang Mak, he would receive many eulogies and the people of Joseon would honor Jin Yang even more. However, Jin Yan told the stranger that Yom, the Grand Prince of Ampyang State, had much better handwriting, and the stranger thought that Jin Yan was just being a little modest. After a couple of minutes, Jin Yang began to study Kenmak, and he was surprised that he not only understood the local speech well, but also perfectly understood the local written language. After a couple of seconds, Jin Yang noticed that the Kang Mak had very large characters, and he believed that Sejong had some vision problems. Jin Yang also applied his knowledge as a sports instructor from a past life, and he concluded that his father Sejong suffered from second-degree obesity, which led him to serious health problems. In addition, Jin Yang noticed that even though it was quite cool this morning, Sejong's face was dripping with a lot of sweat. Jin Yang then concluded that the fourth king of Joseon, Sejong, suffered from severe diabetes. From his past life, Jin Yang knew that with such indicators, Sejong would soon die and leave behind a successor. Sejong's successor will be Jin Yang's older brother Li Hyang, who will receive the title of King Manjang, who will also die soon after the coronation from severe weakening in the body. After King Manjang, Tan Zhang will sit on the throne, but during his reign, an assassin will break into his royal palace and kill all the representatives of the royal family including Tan Zhang himself. Then Jin Yang thought that he should never allow Sejong to die so early. Li Hyang, who was Sejong's eldest son and who was supposed to be the next successor to the royal throne, arrived in Chipyangjing. Entering Chipyangjing, I was somewhat surprised that Jin Yang was here, since he usually prefers to go to the mountains to hunt. Jin Yang believed that Li Hyang came here for some urgent purpose, but Li Hyang said that he just wanted to check the current condition of the books that would be sent to Sejong. After that, Li Hyang headed towards the exit and told Jin Yang that he did not want to distract him, and that he could continue to do his own thing. However, Jin Yang did not understand how Li Hyang did not notice that the books that were supposed to be sent to Sejong had two small characters, and he decided to stop Li Hyang. Jin Yang told his elder brother that he would like to read some of these books but the characters were too small and needed to be rewritten to make them easier to read. Then Li Hyang felt that Jin Yang really had something to add to these books, and he asked Jin Yang if he knew that Sejong had presbyopia, or senile farsightedness. Jin Yang then told his elder brother that he suspected something similar, but he was not completely sure of his guesses. Then Li Hyang thought about the transients of life since before his father very often boasted of his greatness. Then Jin Yang asked Li Hyang when Sejong began to show such symptoms, 
and Li Hyang said that such deterioration in Sejong's condition began to appear a year ago. Hyang also said that this presbyopa was very different from normal presbyopa, and that Sejong had other symptoms in addition to poor vision, but he asked Jin Yang to keep this information secret. Soon, Li Hyang decided to leave Chipyangjing, and after he left, several scientists entered the room. Soon, Jin Yang began to feel a slight pain in the back of his head and he believed that it was because he had been sitting still for too long. Then Jin Yang decided to do a little stretching for his neck to get rid of the pain. First, Jin Yang tilted his head back, after which he began to rotate his head to stretch his cervical vertebrae. After this, Jin Yang stretched his head forward and his shoulders back, and after all these actions, all the pain in the back and back of the head disappeared. At this moment, Jin Yang experienced an incredible sensation of missing pain while the people who were looking at him did not understand what Jin Yan had just done and why he suddenly felt so good. People did not understand why Jin Yang made such unusual movements, since if he has neck pain, he can turn to a massage therapist. At first, Jin Yang didn't understand why these people were looking at him so strangely, and then he remembered that these people still don't know what stretching is. At that time, people had already begun to practice massage therapy, but at that time it was not very effective, since at that time people did not yet know how human muscles work. Jin Yang then told people that he had recently injured his neck while riding a horse. But after these movements, all the pain in his neck completely disappeared and he immediately felt better. Jin Yang also said that this simple exercise is very good for the neck muscles, and he said that he can easily teach them to do this exercise. After that, everyone sat down at the chairs and Jin Yan began to show them the correct sequence of movements. First, people threw their heads back as much as possible, after which they began to rotate their heads in different directions. With the last movement, people had to straighten their backs, stretch their heads forward and throw their shoulders back. At first, people did not believe that they could so easily get rid of pain in the neck area. But after all the body movements they had done, they immediately felt extremely pleasant sensations. The next day, Li Hyang went to Jip Nio Jong again, but he was somewhat surprised at the pace of what everyone was doing. Li Hyang did not understand how these people could get rid of neck pain in such an easy way and without the help of a massage therapist. Soon, everyone in Joseon learned about an exercise that could relieve neck pain, and soon this exercise became known as the stretching whale. However, despite such an effective exercise, Jin Yang still had another headache. To get rid of this headache, Jin Yang went to the local market where all the necessary ingredients were located. One of the local sellers was extremely surprised that Jin Yang himself deigned to go to the market with ordinary people, since usually representatives of the royal family try not to contact the residents. Jin Yang told the seller that he came here to buy oil such as sesame, but the seller said that he did not have sesame oil, but he did have beef oil. Then Jin Yang handed the money to the seller and asked him to provide him with five pieces of beef butter and that its quality be as low as possible. Suddenly, one of the customers wondered why Jin Yan needed such ingredients as beef oil and several medicinal roots. From his previous life, Jin Yan knew that he was going to die from dermatitis, and he decided to collect the necessary medicines as soon as possible, since in these times, dermatitis was considered a fatal and incurable disease. After some time, Jin Yan bought all the ingredients needed for the medicine, after which he returned home. Soon, a woman appeared behind Jin Yang and said that she noticed how Jin Yang began to increasingly go to the neighboring street. Jin Yang then called this woman his wife and told her that after reading some books in Chip Jong, he decided to try to implement some of his experimental ideas. Then the woman said that she was somewhat worried that Jin Yang now preferred to engage in various despicable work instead of his favorite hunt. Jin Yang told his wife that he was in Jip Yangjiang and there he found an old book that stated the creation of an invention for washing the body, and he would like to create it. This very invention that Jin Yan wanted to make was ordinary soap, and Jin Yan believed that in Josian he could not do without it. In the 21st century, people can still experience various skin diseases that are caused by wearing dirty clothes, thereby causing various inflammations. Any dirt such as rust or sweat could also lead to further development of skin diseases. One day Yong Jik wanted to try making his own soap, so he turned to the grandmother of the owner of the gym where he worked and trained. The ingredients used were natural olive oil, water and the ash of burnt rice straw, and when all these ingredients were mixed and heated, an excellent soap was produced. Jin Young's wife did not understand how to wash herself with oil, 
because if the oil gets on the skin, the body will only become dirtier. Then Jin Yang told his wife that thanks to soap, you can not only wash yourself, but also wash away various stains and dirt on clothes, which made the process of washing clothes and washing your body much easier. After that, Jin Yang's wife was silent for a while and moved on, and Jin Yang for a moment thought that his wife was dissatisfied with something, and he felt that his relationship with his wife was very strained. Jin Yang did not dwell on his wife's behavior and went to the kitchen, where he wanted to prepare soap. Jin Yang experimented with the proportions of the ingredients, and after several attempts he was able to achieve the desired foaming. Despite the good foaming, Jin Yang was wondering how effective his soap would be. The resulting liquid began to give off a strong unpleasant odor, and Jin Yang decided that he should try this soap first. Soon the soap making liquid hardened, and then Jin Yang cut out several pieces of soap and went to test his soap in practice. After this, Jin Yang decided to try the soap in action, and even with some minor shortcomings, the soap cleaned Jin Yang's body and clothes well. Jin Yang especially liked the pleasant smell of the soap which was obtained thanks to the sesame oil in the soap. At one point, Jin Yang believed that he would be able to establish mass production of his soap and sell it abroad. However, Jin Yang suddenly began to worry about Sejong's current condition, as even Taejong, Sejong's father, had failed to get his son to do anything with his body. Then Jin Yang believed that even if his own father could not force Sejong to solve the problem of his condition, then he certainly would not be able to persuade Sejong to take care of his health. Then Jin Yang thought that if he somehow tried to persuade Sejong to take up sports, then Sejong would probably think that his son was just doing nonsense. Also Jin Yang feared that otherwise Sejong would send him to Mirungdo or to Lamdo, which are now known as Alangdo and Jijudo. When Jin Yang finished washing, he figured that he needed to outsmart Sejong with logic to deal with his obesity. Jin Yang also thought that he himself should lose weight and build muscle mass and perhaps this could also influence Sejong's decision to go in for sports. At first, Jin Yan planned to do three basic exercises, so that over time his muscles and body would become stronger, and so that he could lift 400 kilograms of weight. Jin Yang also thought about making bodybuilding a real science, and writing a book on bodybuilding. Jin Yang was confident that if people began to study bodybuilding and train hard, he would be able to create one of the most powerful states of the 15th century. Jin Yang also believed that if a person tries to bring to an ideal state the body that his parents gave him, then he shows respect to his parents. After washing, Jin Yang went outside where he wanted to start training, and the first thing he wanted to start with was pull-ups. Many people who looked at Jin Yang began to suspect that there was simply something wrong with Jin Yang and that he had gone crazy. After doing the pull-ups, Jin Yang noticed that this body had a very interesting natural predisposition. After the pull-ups, Jin Yang began weighted arm extensions and curls, and managed to complete this exercise 29 times. After doing arm extensions and curls, Jin Yang began doing push-ups, and he was able to do as many as 82 push-ups in a row. After doing the push-ups, Jin Yang decided to do the dragon plank and he did this exercise so many times that at one point he just stopped counting how many times he did the dragon plank. Suddenly Jin Yang noticed that even with such a large and sagging belly, he performed all the exercises without any difficulty. Then Jin Yang believed that this was all thanks to the genes of Taejo Li Song Jiwai, the founder and first ruler of Joseon. Soon, Jin Yang finished his training, and at that moment, people came to him and brought him his goods. These people brought Jin Yang several iron dumbbells, with which Joseon could perform even more different exercises. After this, the pleased Jin Yang told the people that he would pay back right now for the fact that these people had made him such excellent dumbbells. Jin Yang received his dumbbells and gave the people 80 kilograms of rice as payment for their work, after which the people looked at the happy Jin Yang with suspicion and moved on. On the way, people were discussing how crazy Jin Yang was since he gave 80 kilograms of rice for these pieces of iron, because even samurai do not have such an urgent need for so much iron. Then the first man began to worry that Jin Yang was planning to gather an army, but the second man said that they had just done their job and they shouldn't worry about anything else. At this moment, Jin Yang had already started training with dumbbells, since exercises with his own weight were not enough for him to effectively pump his body and muscles. Jin Yang's wife's servant, who saw Jin Yang training, told his wife that there was something wrong with Prince Jin Yang. Jin Yang's wife's servant said that they needed to take some action, 
but Jin Yang's wife said that she didn't want to talk about it. Jin Yang's wife's servant continued to talk about how Prince Jin Yang first began to cover himself with oil while washing, and now he gave 80 kilograms of rice for an ordinary pile of iron. Also, Jin Yang's wife's servants remembered the times when Prince Jin Yang used to enjoy hunting with his friends and began to completely ignore his wife. Then Jin Yang's wife's servant asked her mistress what she did in her past life that her husband stopped paying attention to her. Then Jin Yang's wife again asked her servant to stop talking about it, after which the servant immediately apologized and fell silent. At this moment, Jin Yang's wife began to remember with warmth in her heart the times when she and her husband walked around the palace grounds and how cherry blossoms grew everywhere. During another walk through the palace courtyard, Jin Yang gave his wife a cherry blossom branch as a sign of his love and devotion to her. At this moment, Jin Yang's wife picked up that same branch to cut it into two parts, thinking that every day she was losing her husband more and more. Jin Yang's wife cut a cherry blossom branch and told her servants that she would like to go to bed early today, and that she would like to be alone with her thoughts. Jin Yang's wife went to wash herself and next to the candles she saw the soap that Jin Yang had made. Jin Yang's wife took the soap in her hands, looking at it and trying to understand exactly how they should wash. Jin Yang's wife decided to try washing herself with soap, and she began to slowly and carefully rub the soap over her body. Jin Yang's wife was surprised at how the soap started producing so many bubbles and how effectively the soap cleaned her skin. After another workout, Jin Yang decided to wash himself again and he thought that at his next workout he should start training with even more weight. Suddenly someone entered the bathhouse, and then Jin Yang noticed that it turned out to be his wife. Jin Yang was very happy when his wife told him that she liked his soap, which cleaned her body perfectly. The only thing that did not suit Jin Yang's wife was that the soap had too much of an oil smell and she was afraid that people passing by would think that she was the wife of a soap merchant. Then Jin Yang thought that he should replace the sesame oil with pork or beef oil. But all these oils were very expensive, which would interfere with the mass production and sale of soap. Then Jin Yang's wife suggested that her husband use linden oil instead of sesame oil, which would make the soap have a more pleasant smell and make its production cheaper. After that, Jin Yang thanked his wife to which Jin Yang's wife herself said that it was all nothing, after which she immediately became embarrassed. After this, Jin Yang went to a coastal village where one of Jin Yang's acquaintances lived. Soon Jin Yang reached this village, and there he met the same acquaintance who had been a beater during his last winter hunt. During a hunt, this man was seriously injured when he was attacked by a deer, and that time this man saved Jin Yang by taking all the wrath of the angry deer upon himself. Jin Yang said that even though a lot of time has passed since then, he still remembers how this man helped him, and Jin Yang wanted to thank this man. Jin Yang told the man that he would now send his family two bags of rice, two bottles of sesame oil, eggs, chicken and other food items once every two weeks. In exchange for this, Jin Yang only asked the man to report to him every two weeks information about changes in the height, and weight of his children. After this, Jin Yang decided to provide similar food support to 20 more villages and begin to record changes in the height and weight of local children. At first, Jin Yang wanted to give local residents a protein, carbohydrate, and fat diet in order to record changes in the children's physique and their motor abilities. Jin Yang also wanted to show Sujong by a clear example how important it is to stick to proper nutrition, so that it would be easier to get him to start taking care of his health. After this, Jin Yang went to the local blacksmiths, whom he wanted to ask to make him several things. First, Jin Yang showed the blacksmiths a diagram of a training barbell and several iron plates for the future barbell. Jin Yang also explained to the blacksmiths that iron plates should be mounted on both ends of the bar, and that each iron pancake should weigh 30 kilograms. The blacksmiths carried out simple calculations and realized that if they made eight such iron pancakes— then the entire training structure would weigh more than 200 kilograms. Jin Yang also said that over time he would need even more of these iron pancakes. The blacksmiths were shocked when Jin Yang said that this barbell should be strong and stable enough so that in the future he could lift a weight of 300 kilograms. After that, Jin Yang put his hand into his sleeve, pulled out another diagram, and said that he had one more thing to do. Jin Yang took out a drawing and asked the blacksmiths to make one iron plate, and roll its rod about three feet long. Jin Yang wondered whether, given the technical conditions of the Joseon era, it would be possible to make a working Jokian, a firearm that was previously used in Joseon. On the way home, 
Jin Yun thought about how he had undergone many positive changes since he arrived in this era. Also on the way home, Jin Yun told one of the blacksmiths with whom he was walking that now with all his heart he wants to restore order in Joseon. At one point, Jin Yun decided to evaluate some of the physical parameters of the blacksmith with whom he walked to the royal estate. Jin Yun was shocked that this blacksmith had a surprisingly very strong and muscular body to which the blacksmith himself said that he had had such a physique since childhood. Then Jin Yun believed that this blacksmith would be ideal for his first tests, and he invited the blacksmith to become his student on the path of improving his body. The young blacksmith immediately accepted Jin Yang's offer, and did not know how he could thank Jin Yang, to which Jin Yang himself said that there was no need for this. The next day, Jin Yang was going to meet his brother in Chipyangjong. Soon, Jin Yang met with Li Hyang, and Li Hyang immediately noticed some changes in Jin Yang. Li Hyang was happy that his brother managed to lose weight, and then he asked Jin Yang what he wanted to talk to him about. Then Jin Yang told Li Hyang that his complexion had improved after his new hardening method, and then Li Hyang asked Jin Yang what other new hardening method he was talking about. After that, Jin Yang took out a small box, opened it, and showed Li Hyang his soap, after which he asked his elder brother to try using the soap. After this, Jin Yang and Li Hyang went outside to the same water source, where Li Hyang was supposed to try Jin Yang's soap. After a couple of minutes, Li Hyang was pleasantly surprised at how the soap was able to clean the dirt off his hands so easily. However, when Li Hyang smelled his hands, he told Jin Yang that the oil would make soap production very expensive. Then Jin Yang remembered his wife's words that if in the process of making soap he used tetradium oil along with a couple of handfuls of rice, the production will be cheaper. After that, Jin Yang and Li Hyang returned back to Chipyangjing, where Li Hyang took out a piece of paper and began to write something down there. Jin Yang picked up a piece of paper on which Li Hyang wrote that he managed to get rid of severe dirt thanks to soap, and that now all officials should wash their hands with soap every day. Li Hyang believed that despite the price of soap, almost anyone could afford it, but due to the unknown nature of soap, no one would buy it in large quantities. Li Hyang also said that first he would like to force all officials to wash their hands with soap, so that in the future they will start washing their entire bodies with soap. In addition, Li Hyang proposed to first start selling soap at private auctions so that he could impose his own tax on it, and thereby receive a new source of income. Then Jin Yang was once again convinced that Li Hyang truly fully justified his status as the future king of Joseon. Meanwhile, the blacksmiths were actively working to create all those items that Jin Yang ordered from them. At one point, one man asked the blacksmith workers if they were sure that Jin Yang ordered exactly what they were doing. Then one of the blacksmiths said that they would face severe punishment if they made even one mistake during their work. However, one of the blacksmiths told all the other blacksmiths that they must right now destroy everything that they had already done during this time for Jin Yang. However, all the other blacksmiths said that they could not do this since they had already managed to make most of the things for Jin Yang, and that Jin Yang should come for his orders in the coming days. Then this blacksmith told his workers that if money was more valuable to them than their own lives, then they could continue to work on products for Jin Yang. At one point, a man in a black suit and a large hat began to suspect that Jin Yang started all this because he was unable to obtain the right to inherit. Jin Yang really was. The next day, Li Hyang ordered all officials to use the soap that Jin Yang created. Soon, many officials began discussing with each other how they could easily clean ink stains from their hands using soap. People were especially surprised that in addition to ink on their hands, soap also helped remove oil from the skin considering soap to be some kind of incredible miracle cure. The officials were also very surprised that all this soap was created by Jin Yang, who had never before done such things that were useful to people. Meanwhile, Jin Yang was actively training with new barbells and iron plates for them. The first thing Jin Yang wanted to do was do some bench presses, which were great for pumping up the chest and arm muscles. After a couple of minutes, Jin Yang managed to bench press 10 times in a row with a total barbell weight of 120 kilograms. After the exercises, Jin Yang was amazed that his muscles were developing so quickly, as if the god of bodybuilding himself was helping him. Jin Yang finished doing the bench press, and the blacksmith who was belaying Jin Yang during the exercise told Jin Yang that he was doing a great job lifting such a large weight. Jin Yang believed that even though this barbell was more like the barbells that no one usually uses in the gym, it was still very useful. However, at first Jin Yang had some difficulties in making all these rods and iron plates, 
since the blacksmiths not only did not have time to complete their work, but also did not cope with the overall design. After Jin Yang finished the exercises, he told his blacksmith that it was his turn to exercise. The blacksmith immediately got scared and told Jin Yang that if he tried to lift this barbell, this barbell would immediately crush him. Then Jin Yang, with a terrifying look, told his blacksmith that the human body must always develop, and that it constantly needs to be hardened. After a couple of seconds, the blacksmith finally decided to try to lift the barbell, and during the exercise, Jin Yan told the blacksmith that during this exercise he should use both the upper and lower parts of the body. Jin Yang's wife was very surprised by her husband's new transformation, since she believed that her husband was quite slender before, and now his body seemed to shine with strength. Meanwhile, Jin Yang's wife's servants felt that Jin Yang could now be compared to General Wan Man. Jin Yan is flattered to be compared to General Wan Man, and for a moment, he even forgot that he had to ensure the blacksmith. Then Jin Yan began to tell his wife and her servants about how brave and courageous Wan Man was in his youth, and how in adulthood Wan Man became one of the best generals in the entire history of Joseon. While Jin Yang continued to talk about General Wan Man, the blacksmith could no longer hold the heavy barbell normally. At one point, everyone heard a very loud sound coming from the direction of the door. Later, everyone realized that someone started knocking very hard on the entrance gate. Then Jin Yang headed towards the gate with thoughts of who dared to knock on the gate so unceremoniously. Jin Yang did not have time to approach the gate, and people in dark outfits had already begun to approach from there. Among the uninvited guests was also Captain Li Qi, who was Jin Yang's longtime rival. Jin Yang's wife began to express indignation that these people had broken into Prince Jin Yang's domain, and such bravery greatly frightened Jin Yang's wife's servants. One of the men in dark clothes extended his hand towards Jin Yang's wife and told her that he knew where he ended up and that he really wanted the woman to shut up right now. At the same moment, Jin Yang ran up to the stranger and pushed him hard away from his wife. The man fell to the ground and was surprised that Jin Yang was able to push him so easily and knock him down. Jin Yang asked the man how he dared to talk to his wife like that. The other men in dark clothes were greatly outraged by Jin Yang's behavior, and then they prepared their swords in case Jin Yang tried to attack them. Then Captain Li Qi came out from behind his subordinates and reminded Jin Yang how they met at last year's hunting competition. Jin Yang recognized Captain Li Qi and he told him that if he dared to harm his people, he would attack Captain Li Qi without warning, after which he asked him why he came here. Then one of Li Qi's men became very angry with Jin Yang for talking to his captain like that, and then Li Qi told Jin Yang that what he was holding was made of two dozen swords. Later, Li Qi looked at the rest of Jin Yang's rods, and then he asked Jin Yang why he suddenly needed all these rods. Also, Li Qi's people showed Jin Yang the man with whom he went hunting last year, and now this man was in very serious condition. Then Li Qi believed that Jin Yang was planning to organize a rebellion against his own family with the help of ordinary residents, in order to later become the rightful ruler of Joseon. Then Jin Yang told Li Qi that these were just his personal speculations, and then he said that Li Qi was neglecting his authority since he brought his soldiers to his house. However, Li Qi told Jin Yang that he did not need any proof, as he was fully confident that Jin Yang was planning to organize a rebellion with the help of ordinary people. Li Qi also told Jin Yang that he and his people always act this way and always reach the truth. Then Jin Yang asked Li Qi what would happen if it turned out that he was wrong in his arguments, but Li Qi completely ruled out such an option and he was confident that he was right. Li Qi also told Jin Yang that until he told the truth, he would torture people from the villages to which he provided supplies. Jin Yang then felt that even if he told Li Qi the whole truth, he would still not calm down and would continue to try to show his worst side. Jin Yang also thought that after he ended up in this body and in this era, he did not do anything wrong, and he could not know what bad things he could have done before. At that moment, Li Yang came out of the house to try to understand what was happening here. Jin Yang looked at his older brother and was somewhat surprised that Li Yang looked a little healthier than usual. Li Yang told Jin Yang that he personally came here because some bad rumors had started circulating about him. Li Yang was getting closer and closer to Jin Yang, and then Li Qi asked Li Yang to be careful since no one knows what a man and like Jin Yang can do to him. Then Li Hyang asked Li Qi to watch his speech when he called Jin Yang a man-man. Hyang also told Li Qi that Jin Yang was still his own younger brother, and he would like to give him the opportunity to explain the reasons for his actions. Hyang also told Li Qi that even though they were brothers, 
it would not be easy for them to clear their names from such shameful rumors. Then Li Hyang said that if Li Qi did not provide him with strong arguments in favor of his personal guesses, then he would make him greatly regret his words. Jin Young then told Li Hyang and Li Qi that he would need some help in order to explain his motives. Then Jin Young asked the blacksmith to bring him the book he was writing, after which the blacksmith left for a while. A couple of minutes later, the blacksmith returned with the book that Jin Young was writing and he told everyone that he was writing a book in which he described the teachings of a healthy lifestyle. After this, Jin Yang handed over his book to Li Hyang, who became interested in what was so important that was described in this book. As soon as Li Hyang opened Jin Yang's book, he read that a person should express respect for his parents by caring for the body that was given to him by his parents. However, Li Hyang still could not understand how taking care of his body was connected with all the things that Jin Yang needed. Then Jin Yang leaned in front of Li Hyang and whispered to him that he couldn't say this in front of everyone, and he wanted to tell him everything in private. Then Jin Yang reminded Li Hyang of the grave condition their father was in now. Li Hyang told Jin Yang that Presbopa had caught up with his father earlier and he would like to hear from Jin Yang his knowledge of medicine, since he is so worried about their father's condition. Jin Yang then told Li Hyang that their father had recently been dripping a lot of sweat despite the cool weather, and he believed that their father was having bouts of fever. Jin Yang also said that he had some suspicions that their father was showing signs of diabetes, which somewhat surprised Li Hyang himself. Jin Yang believed that Sejong's diabetes developed due to excess young energy which was provoked by Sejong's excess nutrition. Jin Yang believed that due to Sejong not engaging in any physical activity, excess yang energy was accumulating in his body, which could directly affect his vision. Then Li Hyang asked Jin Yang why he suddenly began supplying food to the children of ordinary residents of Kosnoa. Jin Yang said that in this way he learned that for simple weight gain it is enough to eat a few spoonfuls of rice and eggs and his book contains all the reports on nutrition and exercise. Ultimately, Jin Yang wanted to write this book to convince Sejong of what he wrote and persuade him to take up physical activity. Hyang then told Li Qi to recall his soldiers, and Li Hyang said that Jin Yang had absolutely no bad intentions. However, Li Qi refused to withdraw his troops, and he said that he and his men were monitoring the behavior of the citizens of Joseon and that the king would not like the fact that someone dared to challenge the rights of his soldiers. Li Qi also pointed to his soldiers and said that among them were the most competent inspectors of various ranks, among whom there was even one young official who had only recently joined the ranks of his inspectors. Then Li Qi said that he could not leave here until he knew all of Jin Yang's true intentions. After that, Li Qi took out his fan, extended it towards Jin Yang, and said that if they want to drive them away, then let them start with him. Li Qi also told Li Hyang that he should not cover up someone's intentions just because of his relationship with that person. Li Qi also demanded from Li Hyang that he be firm and show the whole world the greatness of the laws of his country. Jin Yang looked at Li Qi and thought that he became the chief inspector for a reason, and he believed that if some measures were not taken, then this problem would not only affect him and Li Hyang. Then Li Hyang told Jin Yang that he would no longer be able to tell Li Qi and he asked Jin Yang to explain on his own why he bought all these iron devices. Then Jin Yang told Li Hyang that he was ready to personally show the purpose of all these iron products with the help of his strength. Then Jin Yang once again told Li Hyang that due to excess yang energy, Sejong's vision had deteriorated, but Jin Yang was confident that if Sejong began to harden his body, he would be able to cope with his illness. Jin Yang also told Li Hyang that Sejong showed virtually no physical activity and he hoped that over time he would be able to interest Sejong to take up physical training. Jin Yang also hoped that he would be able to convince his father to harden his body if Jin Yang showed strength comparable to that of Xian Yu, a general of the Jin Empire. Then Jin Yang believed that if he could not convince Li Qi and his soldiers of the correctness of his intentions, then he certainly would not be able to convince his father. After this, Li Hyang told Li Qi and his soldiers that Jin Yang was developing methods for healing the human body and all his iron devices were needed for training the human body. However, Li Qi still could not believe that all these iron objects, each of which weighed more than the heaviest cauldron, were intended for training. Then Li Hyang believed that it was because of all these iron devices that Li Qi came here with his inspection. Then Li Hyang invited Li Qi to show Jin Yang's strength in order to show them the true purpose of all these iron devices in practice, 
and clear Jinyan's good name. Then one volunteer came out from the crowd of soldiers and wanted to compete with Jinyan in strength. The volunteer told Jinyang that if he lost to him in strength, it would become obvious to everyone that he was lying to everyone. After a couple of minutes, Jin Yen and the volunteer prepared to perform bench presses with the same barbell weight to see which of them would be stronger. Before starting to perform the bench press, Jin Yang explained to the volunteer that this exercise is good for strengthening the arm muscles from the elbow to the hand, chest, and shoulders. However, the volunteer did not accept Jin Yang from fishing and he believed that everything depended on the strength of the person. Then Jin Yang began to perform the bench press and believed that the volunteer was simply afraid that he would be able to defeat the volunteer. Such words made the volunteer even more angry, which only motivated him more to defeat Jin Yang. It was very difficult for the volunteer to hold the barbell, but he could not give up so easily, since now the honor of the chief inspector was at stake. Then the volunteer put in even more effort to be able to lift such a heavy barbell. After a few seconds, the volunteer still managed to lift the barbell for the first time. After this, one of the soldiers who was ensuring the volunteer wanted to see how Jin Yang lifted the same barbell. At this moment, Jin Yang put a little more effort into lifting the same barbell. The volunteer looked at Jin Yang and grinned at the fact that at first Jin Yang pretended to be so strong but now he couldn't lift the barbell. However, by that time, Jin Yang had already performed the bench press eight times, and now he is finishing lifting the barbell for the ninth time. Everyone was shocked that Jin Yang managed to perform so many bench presses in such a short time, and Li Qi was the most surprised. After this, the competition ended, and everyone was completely convinced that Jin Yang actually used his iron equipment specifically for training. At this moment, the volunteer felt very ashamed that he could lose so easily in trying to defend the honor of the chief inspector. Then Jin Yen told the volunteer that nutrition and the amount of training depend on the goal. The volunteer was also very surprised when Jin Yang said that thanks to his diet and training system, he was able to lift weight up to 175 kilograms. The volunteer could not believe what he heard, and he believed that the victory over him simply turned Jin Yang's head after which he left with Li Qi and the rest of the soldiers. Li Qi and his soldiers headed towards the exit, and Li Qi told Jin Yang that this time they would let them go, but he was still under suspicion. Li Qi also told Jin Yang that he would continue to do his duty, and Jin Yang believed that Li Qi was hinting that he would continue to watch over him. Then Jin Yang told Li Qi that in that case he would also watch him and his soldiers. After that, Li Qi finally left and Jin Yang was glad that this time they managed to avoid a serious conflict. From then on, Li Hiang began to help Jin Yang complete his book, and then Jin Yang felt that along with one problem, he also received a good opportunity. Jin Yang also believed that if everything had gone differently, he would have found himself in a more hopeless situation. After Li Qi left, Jin Yang apologized to his wife and told her that he would now be more careful and discuss all his future plans with her. Jin Yang wanted to say something else to his wife, but suddenly his legs began to give way, causing him to almost fall. Jin Yang's wife managed to catch her fallen husband and prevent him from falling to the ground. At this moment, everyone, including Jin Yang's wife herself, felt that Mr. Jin Yang was behaving somewhat indecently. After a couple of seconds, Jin Yang was able to get back on his feet and his wife told him that if he wanted to do this with her, then they should retire to their chambers, after which Jin Yang retired to his wife. That same evening, volunteer Li Qi began to apologize to his captain for failing to defend his honor. Li Qi said that they should not worry about what had already happened, and he told his soldiers that he was able to gain some benefit from what had happened. Li Qi said that among all the metal products of Jin Yang, he was able to notice one interesting thing which was very similar to a metal tubular weapon. Then Li Qi felt that Jin Yang needed this item for a reason, and Li Qi thought that Jin Yang was going to improve the existing firearms. At last year's hunting competition, Li Qi saw how Jin Yang, without any pity, dealt with one of the prey, like a ferocious and bloodthirsty beast. Li Qi could not believe that the Jin Yang whom he saw then was now busy with issues of improving the health of the human body. That day, Li Qi promised himself that he would personally monitor him in order to later reveal all his true plans. Three months have passed since then, and one day something happened that Jin Yang could not have expected. That day, Jin Yan was training as usual, and at one point his wife approached him with the news that she was pregnant. Jin Yang couldn't believe what his wife had just told him, 
and he thought that they had conceived a child that day when they secluded themselves after Li Qi and his soldiers left. At this moment, Jin Yang remembered a moment in his past life when he once again went to a bar with his friend, who told him that he could not go to the gym because he had a three-year-old son. Then Young Jik told his friend that playing sports could greatly change his life for the better giving him a powerful surge of strength and vigor after each workout. Then friend Young Jika asked him if he should listen to advice from a man who had never married in more than thirty years of his life. Then Young Jik jokingly told his friend that he had two spouses, which were his barbell and dumbbell. Back then, Jin Yang couldn't believe that one day he would actually become a father. Then Jin Yang picked up his wife and couldn't help but be happy that he would actually become a father. Jin Yang was so happy about this news that he wanted to convey such good news to Sejong as soon as possible. Jin Yang's wife was glad that the news of her pregnancy made her husband so happy. First of all, Jin Yang decided to do some simple exercises with his wife so that he could get a rough idea of how childbirth might go. At first, Jin Yang decided to do some simple stretching with his wife to see if his wife would experience fatigue during childbirth, but this was not enough. Jin Yang remembered that in this era, childbirth could lead to death due to some complications, and then Jin Yang felt that he needed to create a disinfectant in time to reduce the risks of childbirth. Within a few days, Jin Yang was able to create Sojut Kori, a special container used to store soju a traditional ancient Korean alcoholic drink. After this, Jin Yang called a local doctor to see him, to whom he wanted to show his invention. Jin Yang showed the doctor that he first pours alcohol into a container, which passes through a special narrow tube that cools the contents in the container. After this, Jin Yang ordered to bring him all the soju that was in the house in order to test the operation of his device in practice. After a while, Jin Yang was able to extract the alcohol he needed from soju, and he wanted to test the purity of the alcohol. In order to check the purity of the alcohol, Jin Yang took out another container, which was 80% filled with water. The specific gravity of pure alcohol must be 8 tenths of a percent, and Jin Yang could not allow the container with alcohol to be lighter or heavier than the container with water. After several attempts, Jin Yang finally managed to reach a certain level of alcohol purity which could mean that he could make a disinfectant. Since Yong Jik found himself in the Joseon era, a lot of time has passed, and to return back to his time Yong Jik couldn't do it. Every day, Yong Jik wondered what happened during the time he was here. However, a few months later, Jin Yen's child was born, and from that day on, he became fully immersed in life in Joseon. The first thing Jin Yang decided to do was tell his father the good news that he finally had a child. Upon arrival, Sejong said that Jin Yang had changed a lot in recent months, and that his invention of soap and disinfectant had greatly changed the life of Joseon. Jin Yang told his father that his father's mercy was limitless, but he still had some way to go. However, Sejong told Jin Yang that he should not be modest, and Sejong told Jin Yang that he would give him 200 nyan of silver as compensation for his expenses for creating the soap. Sejong also told Jin Yang that the birth of his son was the blessing of the entire royal family, and Sejong remembered that thanks to Jin Yang's remedy, his wife returned to normal within a week after giving birth. Sejong then said that from this day forward, Jin Yang's disinfectant should be used in the treatment of newborn children and their mothers after difficult births. At this moment, Sejong looked at Jin Yen and thought that Jin Yen used to be a simple youth, but now he has matured and is benefiting both families and the entire Joseon. Sejong's health deteriorated greatly, making it suddenly difficult for him to breathe. Within seconds, Sejong fell from his throne, and his subjects immediately called doctors to try to bring King Sejong back to his senses as quickly as possible. That same evening, Li Hyang told Jin Yang that their father's condition had worsened, but this time Sejong was still able to come to his senses, but he was still worried about his condition. Li Hyang also told Jin Yang that Sejong is now constantly thirsty, and his eyesight has deteriorated so much that he now has to hold a book right in front of his eyes to read something. Li Hyang also said that doctors are now giving Sejong a special healing decoction, but it does not have any effect. Then Jin Yang asked Li Hyang if his father had told him that he could see flying insects, or a whitish fog. In Yong S past life Jika had a grandfather who suffered from diabetes and who had similar symptoms to Sejong, sometimes complaining about seeing insects or cloudy fog. However, Li Hyang told Jin Yang that Sejong did not complain of such symptoms, 
and he only said that he had difficulty seeing things in the distance. Then Jin Yang told Li Hyang that in this case the situation was not critical, and he believed that now Sejong was simply experiencing a slight malaise, which was caused by ordinary overwork. Then Jin Yang believed that if King Sejong's condition continued to deteriorate, then within a year he would completely lose his sight. Jin Yang also remembered that September would soon come, and his mother's birthday would be celebrated in September, and he thought that this would be an extremely good opportunity to influence his father. Li Hian believed that Jin Yang was planning to do something grand at the royal feast. Jin Yang told Li Hian that his book only described three exercises using heavy weights. Among these three exercises, Jin Yang described the squat, bench press, and deadlift in his book. During a deadlift, Jin Yan should try to lift a barbell with a very heavy weight to waist level. Then Jin Yang calculated that by his mother's birthday he should reach 400 kilograms in these exercises. Li Hyang he was shocked that Jin Yang seriously decided to lift 400 kilograms of weight at his mother's birthday. Li Hyang then told Jin Yang how he had recently asked one of Joseon's most experienced soldiers to lift 600 kilograms. However, a barbell with such weight turned out to be too heavy for the soldier and he was unable to lift the barbell. Jin Yang said that at the moment he is not able to lift 900 kilograms of weight, and to lift 400 kilograms, he needs to try hard. However, Jin Yang believed that he should put in all his efforts to become strong enough to lift 400 kilograms of weight, and for the sake of his father. Yang then told Jin Yang that he would also help him, and he said that his book described too many things that would be difficult for an ordinary person to understand and he would try to make his book more understandable. Yang also told Jing Tian that he would try to improve his younger brother in his studies. Jin Yang was afraid that in addition to writing the book, he also had to improve his teaching. Li Yang reminded Jin Yang that he himself had written about honoring his parents, and Li Yang said that his book should contain at least 13 sutras, the Confucian precepts of the Ming dynasty. Jin Yang felt that it would be extremely difficult for him to raise the level of his teachings since the only scriptures he had once read were the five classics. However, Jin Yang believed that all this should help his father understand even more the importance of a healthy lifestyle. Jin Yang then told Li Hyang that from that day on, he would try not only to lift 400 kilograms, but also to raise the level of his teachings. Then Li Hyang said that he would definitely ensure that their father became interested in Jin Yang's book and understood it. After this, Jin Yang and his brother Li Hyang immediately drank and ate in the name of their father's health. The next day, Jin Yang began to think about how he should prepare to lift 400 kilograms for his mother's birthday. Jin Yang also thought that if he himself did not try to lose all his excess weight, then he would definitely not be able to convince his father to think about leading a healthy lifestyle. Then, before starting his attempts to lift 400 kilograms, Jin Yang decided to first get rid of 8 kilograms of his excess weight. Then Jin Yang believed that in the conditions of this era of Smama, an effective way to lose excess weight is to climb a mountain. Jin Yang began to climb the mountain with Li Hyang, who hoped with all his heart that Jin Yang would actually be able to lift 400 kilograms on his mother's birthday. Soon, the Jin Yang finished their climb up the mountain, and he immediately began to raise his level of teachings. Jin Yang began to read a book with various teachings and he did not understand how he would be able to learn everything that was described in this book. Then Jin Yang remembered Li Hyang's words that he managed to learn all these teachings in two weeks. He believed that with such talent, Jin Yang could learn these teachings in a week. In order to lose weight, Jin Yang also changed his diet, replacing it with cabbage, cucumbers, red tofu, and oatmeal. Jin Yang's wife was surprised that her husband would actually eat this and modest foods for a long time. Then Jin Yang told his wife that at his mother's birthday he was going to show all his respect to her and to his father. Jin Yang also said that if he had less fat in his body, he would be able to achieve this goal even faster. After a couple of seconds, Jin Yang started eating and said that he had everything he needed to achieve his goal. Jin Yang's wife apologized to her husband because she again failed to understand all of his plans. At one point, Jin Yang paused before eating when his wife told him that she had decided to add a little salt to his tofu so that it wouldn't taste too bland. Jin Yang's wife called the servants over and ordered them to remove all the food from Jin Yang's table and prepare all his food again. Also, Jin Yang's wife ordered the servants to carefully check her husband's food from that day on, so that all of Jin Yang's food would always be fresh. For a long time, Jin Yang continued to train hard, 
lifting more and more weight every day. Jin Yang also continued to try to get rid of excess weight by climbing mountains with Li Yang, and every day they climbed higher and higher. In between training sessions, Jin Yang also did not forget to increase his level of teachings, memorizing more and more wisdom each time. At one point, Jin Yang and his brother were able to climb to the very top of the mountain that they climbed together every day. Jin Yang looked down at Josian and thought only that the time he had spent on all this had passed too quickly. Soon the birthday of Sejong's wife arrived, to which a lot of guests came. There were a lot of people at the birthday party who entertained Sejong and his wife in every possible way. Sejong's wife was very pleased with how people could ride horses in such an unusual way. Sejong himself pretended to like everything but in reality he could not properly see everything that was happening around him. Jin Yang was scheduled to perform last, and he asked Li Hyang if he had discussed his performance with anyone else. Li Hyang told Jin Yang to the crown princess that Jin Yang plans to lift 300 kilograms, which only made the crown princess angry and didn't believe what was said. Then Li Hyang asked Jin Yang to be sure to carry out his plans, and in this case, their mother might also be interested in teaching a healthy lifestyle. Hyang also told Jin Yang that he was counting on him very much, after which Jin Yang went to show the public the capabilities of his body. Soon it was Jin Yang's turn to wish his mother a happy birthday. Jin Yang bowed his knee in front of his mother and began to congratulate her on her birthday from the bottom of his heart. Jin Yang also told his mother that he owes her everything he had before, what he has now, and what he will have in the future. Meanwhile, Several subjects tried to hold iron plates in their hands, which they would then have to place on a barbell. Jin Yin also told his parents that he would like to demonstrate to them his teachings on a healthy lifestyle, which described methods for healing and improving the body. Sejong noticed that there was a lot of iron behind Jin Yang, and he asked Jin Yang what he was going to do with all these iron things. Jin Yang told his father that all of this was just a small performance that he would like to repay his parents with. After that, Jin Yin took off the canvas and told his parents that today he would like to demonstrate to them the capabilities of his body, which they gave him at birth. At this moment, the entire royal guard was shocked by how strong and strong Jin Yang seemed. At this moment, Jin Yang's servants had already managed to place the required number of iron plates on the barbell. The first thing Jin Yang planned to do was bench press, but no one understood what Jin Yang wanted to do. At this moment, Jin Yang was being observed by Li Qi and his undercover soldiers, and they noticed that the barbell had become several times larger and heavier since their last meeting. Meanwhile, Jin Yang had time to prepare to perform a bench press, after which he removed the heavy barbell from the support racks. After a few seconds, Jin Yang was able to lift such a heavy barbell almost effortlessly. Everyone who looked at Jin Yang was shocked that Jin Yang was actually able to lift such a heavy barbell. After the exercise, Jin Yang put the barbell back on the support stands, after which he turned to his parents. Jin Yang told his parents that they were now watching the bench press, one of the most important exercises in his book, which allows you to pump and strengthen the muscles of the chest shoulders and arms. Jin Yang's mother told her son that she did not fully understand what she had just seen. After that, Jin Yin was asked how much all this iron weighed, and Jin Yin said that in total all this iron weighs 280 kilograms. Sejong and his wife were shocked that Jin Yang was actually able to lift so much weight. Soon, several more people approached the bar with iron plates for Jin Yang's next exercise. After a couple of seconds, Jin Yang's servant placed another couple of weights on Jin Yang's barbell which made the barbell begin to weigh even more. Jin Yang's next exercise was the barbell squat, during which he must use the strength of his legs to successfully complete the exercise. Jin Yang also said that this exercise perfectly pumps and strengthens the muscles of the legs and lower back. Jin Yang's mother was afraid that Jin Yang was planning to do this exercise with even more weight, and she asked her son to stop. However, Jin Yang had already managed to pick up the barbell and he said that this barbell now weighs 340 kilograms. After that, Jin Yang slowly began to squat, which this time turned out to be somewhat harder than the previous exercise. Soon, Jin Yang squatted down completely, and all he could do was stand up again with the heavy barbell on his shoulders. After a couple of seconds, Jin Yang began to rise up again with a heavy load. As a result, Jin Yang was able to perform such a difficult squat again with even heavier weight. Sejong and his wife were shocked that Jin Yang also managed to lift such a heavy barbell. After this, Sejong called one of his servants to him, 
and asked him how this was even possible. Sejong's servants suggested that this was all thanks to the book that Jin Yang was writing. At this point, Jin Yang said that he would now show the most difficult exercise that is described in his book, namely the deadlift. Jin Yang said that during this exercise he would use his heaviest weights, while Jin Yang's servants tried to carry the heaviest iron plates to the barbell. Before Jin Yang started demonstrating the deadlift, Li Hyang told his father that he was a little worried that Jin Yan might hurt his back during this exercise. Then Li Hyang picked up a special belt for deadlifts and said that in this exercise it is necessary to use additional means of protecting the back from sudden injuries. After that, Li Hyang walked over to Jin Yan and pulled a special deadlift belt on him. Before doing the deadlift, Jin Yang said that the barbell now weighs 400 kilograms. Jin Yang also thanked his parents again for giving him such a capable body and he said that he would continue to take care of it and improve it. At this point, one of Li Qi's soldiers told his captain that, against Jin Yang's standard training, his statements should indicate Jin Yang's lack of sanity. Meanwhile, Jin Yang believed that if he had not been on a diet, then managing such weight would have been somewhat easier. Jin Yang also believed that even with a belt it would be extremely difficult for him to cope with such weight. Then Jin Yang leaned towards the barbell, grabbed it as tightly as possible, and prepared to demonstrate his deadlift. A second later, Jin Yang concentrated all his strength on the barbell, tensing all his muscles. Jin Yang tried with all his might to lift the heavy barbell off the ground, but in the first seconds Jin Yang was unable to lift the barbell steadily. After a couple of seconds, Jin Yang still managed to put in more effort and lift the extremely heavy barbell off the ground. Captain Li Qi and his soldiers could not believe that a person was even capable of something so heavy. Even though Jin Yan managed to lift the barbell, his arms were under so much tension that they immediately began to bleed. But despite all this monstrous load, Jin Yan was able to hold the barbell in his hands. At one point, Sejong's wife was so shocked by what her son was able to do that she briefly lost consciousness. After a few minutes, Jin Yan placed the barbell on the ground, causing the brick road under the barbell to begin to crumble a little. All the spectators were still in shock that Jin Yang was able to pump up his body so much that he was able to withstand such a huge load on the body. After Jin Yang showed everyone his exercises, Sejong's wife suddenly stood up from her seat. At first, Jin Yang didn't understand what his mother wanted to do, and then she just silently walked up to Jin Yang. After Jin Yang's mother approached her son, she grabbed his hand to see what had happened to them during his entire training. Jin Yang's mother was deeply touched that her son had gone to such great lengths to show her and Sejong his respect for them. At one point, Jin Yang's mother could not hold back her tears, after which she immediately began to cry. Following Sejong's wife, the girls who served Sejong's wife immediately began to cry, since they had never seen such sincere emotions of Sejong's wife before. At this moment, one of the spectators said that before, he had only heard that people who study martial arts also become as big as Jin Yang's abdominal muscles. Sejong then told Jin Yang that he was truly amazed at how his son was able to strengthen his body so much. Sejong also asked Jin Yang what inspired him to write his book on improving the health of the human body and continue to further develop this idea. Jin Yang said that his parents had given him an extremely amazing body and so he decided that he should now take good care of his body and continue to develop it. Sejong then asked Jin Yang if lifting a thousand pounds was necessarily the norm, since he was worried that not everyone would be able to lift something that heavy. However, Jin Yang said that he first started training just to get rid of excess weight, and as he did these exercises, his strength began to increase naturally. Jin Yang also said that thanks to the training, his movements became smoother, and his constant fatigue almost completely disappeared. After this, Sejong told Jin Yang that he would look at the book that Jin Yang wrote with his brother. Sejong also told Jin Yang that he would definitely discuss his book with him after he fully read his book. At this moment, Jin Yang was happy that he finally managed to entice his father into the topic of a healthy lifestyle. Sejong also said that he was somewhat unhappy with Jin Yang's current name, and he said that he would now have a new official name. From that day on, Jin Yang now had a new official name, Grand Prince Siang, in which Su meant head. Towards evening, Li Hyang handed the book to his younger brother Zhejiang, 
who at first thought that Su Yang's book was somewhat extraordinary. Su Zhong also asked Li Hyang where Su Yang had such knowledge about methods of healing the human body that he was able to write his own book about it. However, Li Hyang told Su Zhong that he himself was surprised at how detailed and intelligibly Su Yang was able to describe all the training methods in his younger brother's book. Hyang also told Su Zhong that in his book Su Yang had thought of using something he called a table, which had not previously been found in any book in all of Joseon which interested Sejong very much. Sejong started reading Sejong's book, and it described all the research on eating habits, exercise, and other factors of a healthy lifestyle. The book said that if you cook 6 kilograms of rice, it will be enough to feed one adult for 10 days, while children will be fed for 20 days. However, the book described that excessive overeating can lead to several complications in the body such as excess weight and decreased muscle mass. The book also stated that if you add one spoon of sesame oil to a child's daily diet, his body will always be full of strength and energy. However, with such a diet, the child will gain 300 grams of fat per month, after which Sujong looked at his plump body and thought about something. The next day, Li Hyang came to Suyang, and Suyang asked his elder brother what his father said about his book. Li Hyang told Suyang with a smile on his face that his father wanted to study Suyang's teachings, which made Suyang very happy. The joyful Suyang told Li Hyang that he had already prepared all the supplies necessary for Sejong for his first training. Happy Suyang wanted to start training with Sejong as soon as possible, since first he was going to teach him to hold the correct position while doing the exercises. However, Li Hyang told Suyang that Sejong was somewhat busy right now and that he would like to discuss things a little later, which surprised Suyang somewhat. In fact, Sejong simply walked around the territory of the royal estate, regularly asking the servants to bring him Jokian, a Korean toffee diluted in water. Then Suyang decided that if Sejong was not going to come to the training on his own, then Suyang himself would come to him with all the necessary items and his book. After that, Suyang grabbed several rods and ran to the royal estate, and then Li Hyang also wanted to go with his brother. After some time, the royal guards noticed Suyang just kneeling in the middle of the royal court, and they told him that he shouldn't behave like that. However, Suyang said that he was not going to leave so easily, and he told the guards that they could try to drive him away on their own. Then the guards tried to lift Suyang and take him away but they failed to raise Suyang. Soon Sejong arrived at the scene and demanded an explanation of what was happening here. Sejong also began to threaten the guards and Suyang that if something like this happened, he would personally rip the skin off their faces. However, Suyang approached Sejong and told him that they needed to discuss something together. Sejong thought that Suyang wanted to talk to him about his book, and he told Suyang that he had read it, and that he would like to try the exercises a little later. First, Suyang thanked his father for his generosity, after which he said that they should start studying from today and continue studying further. Suyang insisted that Sejong start studying with him now, but Sejong himself firmly insisted that he was busy now and that he would like to start studying later. Sejong also began to suspect that Suyang wrote this book solely because he knew about Sejong's illness. Suyang said that all of Sejong's symptoms had already become extremely noticeable, and he believed that Sejong should recover from it as soon as possible through exercise. Sejong then asked his royal physician what symptoms Suyang was talking about and the doctor said that Suyang was most likely talking about King Sejong's constant thirst and excessive sweating. Then Suyang believed that Sejong consulted a doctor precisely after his book, since it was after reading it that he began to worry about his health, but he still rejected physical exercise. Then Suyang decided to scare Sejong a little and said that he suspected Sejong of diabetes, and he decided to bring his body to the state of a person who suffers from this serious illness. Then Sejong was very surprised by what Suyang had just told him about diabetes. Suyang told his father his idea so seriously that even Li Hyang for a moment believed Suyang's words that he had conducted such experiments on himself. Diabetes is a serious disease that occurs due to excessive overeating and high-calorie foods such as sweets or baked goods only contribute to the development of this disease. Suyang drew attention to the fact that Sejong drinks Choshin too often, which is most likely the main cause of diabetes and its further development. The main causes of diabetes are continuous thirst and excessive fatigue, which can cause a person to suddenly fall asleep. Suyang then told Sejong that he was showing all the primary signs of diabetes. In fact, Suyang lied to Sejong a little about how he was trying to get diabetes through training, 
and at that moment even Li Hyang believed his words. Sejong then asked Suyang how long it would take to completely get rid of diabetes and its symptoms. Suyang told Sejong that it would take six months of hard training to get rid of diabetes. Then Sejong said that he would try to do physical exercises, and if there was no change in six months, then he would punish Suyang for deceiving the king. Suyang agreed to Sejong's terms, after which they went to train together. First of all, Suyang decided to give Sejong a little warm-up in the form of horse riding. While riding a horse, Sejong found it very difficult to sit with his back straight. Sometimes Sejong began to slouch, and Suyang constantly reminded him to keep his back straight. Sejong could not look at such a stern expression on Suyang's face, because if Sejong leaned over even a little, then Suyang would immediately show his dissatisfied face and point out to Sejong his mistakes. During this training, Sejong only dreamed of finishing this exercise as soon as possible. An hour after starting the exercise, Suyang told Sejong that he could finish this exercise, which made Sejong very happy. However, Suyang told Sejong that this exercise was just a small warm-up before the main exercises, which made Sejong very upset. After horse riding, Suyang told Sejong to do barbell squats. Sejong that this exercise was even more difficult than riding a horse, which made Suyang look at his father more and more sternly, pointing out his mistakes when performing the exercise. During the barbell squat, Suyang gave Sejong tips on how to properly perform the exercise, such as the required number of repetitions, leg and back position. After a few exercises, it was time for lunch. Sejong was incredibly happy that he would finally be able to eat and regain his strength. Sejong was brought rice, oatmeal, tofu and other foods that Siyang ate during his training. Sejong was very disappointed with his lunch today, as he was already used to eating various delicious dishes every day. The first thing Sejong decided to try was rice, but it seemed to him that the taste of rice was more like horse feed. Then Sejong decided to stop eating what they brought him, after which he called his cook to him. Soon, Sejong's personal chef arrived and Sejong then began to express his dissatisfaction with him about his food today. Then Sejong demanded that they bring him what they usually cook for him, and throw what was now on the table to the horses. Meanwhile, Suyang watched his father from the side and listened as Sejong began to complain about his food today. After a couple of seconds, Suyang looked at Sejong again with his intimidating gaze and asked him why he refused to eat the food that was just brought to him. Sejong was scared by his son's sudden appearance in the room and Suyang explained to his father that he himself asked the cook to prepare such food. Suyang also said that in order to control sugar in the body, he also asked the cook and the rest of the servants not to pour Sejong any more jokian, to make it easier for Sejong to lose weight. However, Sejong was still dissatisfied with his food, as he thought that these dishes tasted very bad. Then Suyang himself reminded Sejong that he himself had promised to follow his instructions for six months. Suyang also recalled one of the Confucian teachings, which said that for a noble man, any promise he makes should be even more valuable than life. Then Suyang showed Sejong all his dissatisfaction with the fact that his father could not follow such a simple thing as a proper diet. Then Sejong calmed down a little and continued to leisurely eat his lunch, all thinking about how Suyang could be so stubborn and expedient. After one of his regular workouts, Sejong went to his bedroom to do some work. However, Sejong was so tired after another training session that his hand was constantly shaking from tension, which made him unable to write on paper normally. Due to the constant tension in his hands, Sejong had already ruined several sheets of paper, but he still tried to write normally. That evening, Sejong thought only that after two weeks of hard training he had not achieved any result. At this moment, Sejong suddenly became hungry, and he ordered his servant to bring him his night meal. However, at that moment, instead of the servants, Suyang arrived to Sejong, who again looked at Sejong with his creepy and cold gaze. Sejong was very frightened by such a sudden appearance of his son, which is why Sejong thought that now he would simply die of fear. Suyang then apologized to his father, and told him that he just wanted to check on him and make sure he was okay. A few seconds later, Suyang left Sejong's bedroom, who at that moment thought that now this cold gaze of Suyang would appear in his nightmares. Soon Sejong decided to go to bed, and he began to somewhat regret that he agreed to these trainings, since because of them he could not normally carry out his government duties. Suyang soon fell asleep and the guards who stood at the entrance to Sejong's room were very surprised that for the first time in a long time, Siyong stopped snoring in his sleep. 
At this moment, Sejong had a dream in which he still managed to strengthen his body in the same way as Seung once did. It's been a month since Sejong started following a healthy lifestyle. One day Seung decided to contact Chan Young Siliu, who was an inventor at the royal estate. When Seung arrived at Chan Young's place, he saw that Chan Young was sleeping right at his workplace. Seung was also somewhat frightened by the unusual wooden doll that stood on Chan Young's desk. After a couple of seconds, Suyang noticed that Chan Young began to become delirious in his sleep. However, after a second, Chan Young raised his head, looked at his head, and continued to rave. Suyang felt that Chan Young had some mental problems if he was talking to a doll, which made him feel a little awkward watching Chan Young. Meanwhile, Chan Young was still delusional, and his behavior became more and more creepy with each passing second. At one point, Suyang finally decided to try to talk to Chan Young who did not expect that there was someone else in the room with him. Then Chan Yong apologized to Suyang for his impartial appearance, and politely asked Suyang about what issue Suyang came to him. From his past life, Suyang remembered that Chan Yong was a true genius of his time who made invaluable contributions to the life and development of Joseon. At one point, Suyang felt that the Chan Yong he was looking at right now was very different from the Chan Yong he had read about in his previous life. Suyang decided not to pay attention to Chan Young's mental state, and then he told Chan Young that he would like to ask him to make one device for him. Suyang also handed Chan Young his drawing and said that the emperor himself wanted Chan Young to create this device. However, Suyang said something wrong, which instantly caused Chan Young to become extremely hysterical. Suyang didn't understand what he did wrong while Chan Young continued to scream. Suyang then asked Chan Young if he knew about his book on living a healthy lifestyle. And then Chan Young said that there are literally no people left in Joseon who don't know about his book. Young also said that he saw with his own eyes how Su Young lifts a monstrously heavy barbell. Then Su Young believed that Chan Young was probably aware that Su Jong had begun to independently study health promotion techniques. But due to the upcoming cold weather, the king would not be able to train outside. Then Su Young showed Chan Young his drawing and said that he would like Chan Young to assemble special stilts for Su Jong that would simulate a real run. Chan Young said that he had not worked with such structures before, and he told Su Young that it could take up to several years to create such a device. At this point, Su Young realized that it would be difficult for Chan Young to design a device similar to a modern treadmill. Then Su Young told Chan Young that when he began to strengthen his body, he also experienced a lot of difficulties and torment. Suyang also said that every time he tries to imagine Sejong going through the same torment, his heart becomes heavy, and then he said that they should not count on this path yet. At first, Chan Young thought that this device should help strengthen the body, to which Suyang said that along with the growth of skills, the weight with which one has to strengthen one's body also increases. Suyang also said that when he himself was just starting to strengthen his body, he repeatedly felt unpleasant sensations such as pain in his arms, legs and stomach, and Suyang was still uncomfortable with these sensations. Then Chan Yong considered that using such a treadmill could provoke even more unpleasant sensations. Then Chan Yong said that he would like to refuse to create something like that, but if King Sejong and Prince Suyang himself want this, then he must create this device as soon as possible. At this moment, Chan Yong immediately became eager to quickly study Suyang's drawings who was surprised that just a minute ago Chan Young said that it would take several years to create this treadmill. A minute later, Chan Young began to study Su Young's drawing, thinking about how it would be better to change the design and what materials should be used for this. A couple of minutes later, Chan Young offered Su Young his version of a device for simulating walking, which was somewhat similar to a wheel for domestic hamsters. Then Su Young asked Chan Young how many months it takes to create such a structure and Chan Young said that if you don't focus on unnecessary decorations, it will take no more than 10 days. However, Chan Young still believed that creating this design would require a lot of effort, and then Su Young said that he was ready to help Chan Young with creating a training wheel. After 10 days, Su Young and Chan Young were able to create a working training wheel, and the first thing Su Young wanted to do was demonstrate the new training wheel to Li Hiang. Despite the reliable design, Li Hiang was worried that this wheel was not tested, and he believed that Sejong would be the one to test this wheel first. However, Su Young told Li Hiang that after assembling the wheels, he decided to test them in practice, and they turned out to be reliable enough to be easy to practice with. However, Li Hiang meant that he believes that this wheel should be tested by someone who has never trained before, 
so that one can understand whether such people can train in this wheel. Then Su Young told Li Hyang that he knew just one such person on whom this new simulator could be tested. Li Hyang thought that his younger brother was talking about him, and he told Su Young that he should no longer joke like that. However, Su Young, with all the seriousness of his gaze, showed Li Hyang that he was not going to joke. And then Li Hyang tried to explain to Su Young that he could not endure physical activity consistently. As a result, Su Young still managed to force Li Hyang to try a new simulator, which was very difficult for Li Hyang to train on. During such a run, it seemed to Li Hyang that he had been running for an hour, but Su Young said that Li Hyang had only run for 15 minutes, which made Li Hyang very upset. After running in the wheel, Su Young sent Li Hyang to do the bench press but Li Hyang himself could not understand why he had to do this exercise. At this moment, Su Yang said that he was somewhat saddened by the fact that his elder brother, who also had a very strong and resilient body, could not put in enough effort. At that moment, when Li Hyang was able to perform 12 bench presses, Su Yang ordered him to do three more bench presses, which really annoyed Li Hyang, since this was not the first time Su Young forced him to do the exercise three more times. Su Young said that he first looks at the workload of the muscles, after which he can better understand how many times he needs to do the exercise, to which Li Hyang only said that Su Young should learn to count. After the bench press, Su Young told Li Hyang to squat the barbell eight times, and Li Hyang asked Su Young if he would also make him do the exercise a few more times. Su Young told Li Hyang that his calculation method was highly dependent on Li Hyang's muscles, and if he was not adjusted correctly, he would not be able to strengthen his body. During the exercise, Su Young repeatedly pointed out Li Hyang's incorrect movements during the squat, such as bowed knees or a bent back. At one point, Li Hyang simply could not stand it and cried, asking Su Young to again become the same kind person as he was before. However, Su Young said that for the sake of his brother's health, he was ready to become even angrier, and then Su Young told Li Hyang that from that day on he would also study his methods of improving health. The next day, Su Young trained with Su Zhang, who was running on a wheel. Su Young was surprised that even though Su Zhang almost lost his breath at the beginning of the exercise, he still continued to run for more than 15 minutes. Su Yang also noticed that Li Hyang also performed well in training, and he believed that the physical abilities of the royal family were simply amazing, and Chan Yang's contribution was simply invaluable. At one point, Chan Yang asked Su Yang to tell him a little more about the methods of strengthening the body so that he could improve the simulator in every possible way. Soon, Su Yang told Chan Yang some information, and during the conversation, Su Young realized that despite the fact that Chan Yong went down in history as a brilliant inventor, in reality he turned out to be an eccentric. Then Su Young came to the conclusion that in fact Chan Yong turned out to be an ordinary workaholic who was very devoted to his work. Some time after Su Zhang began training, some ministers began to suspect that the disease had already overtaken Su Zhang. Also, some ministers did not like the fact that since Su Zhang began training with Su Young, he devoted all his time to training completely forgetting about government duties. At this point, Li Hien was approached by Sejong's doctor, who suspected that King Sejong's diabetes was rapidly developing, and that Sejong's body had been severely emaciated over the past three months. However, Li Hien tried to reassure the doctor by telling him that Sejong began to lose weight after Su Young's training, just like him and Su Young. Then the doctor reminded Li Hyang that Su Young himself said that rapid weight loss indicates progressive diabetes. Then the ministers began to be indignant at Su Young's methods and believe that these methods were not at all effective, and that they should urge people to abandon these methods right now. At that moment, King Su Zhang came out in front of the ministers, who right now wanted to know what these people were arguing about. The ministers could not believe their eyes how King Sejong was able to change so much for the better. Then the ministers told Sejong that it was time for them to go about their business, so as not to accidentally run into a conflict with Sejong. At that moment, Li Hyang approached Su Yang and told him how the ministers began to think that Sejong's illness was continuing to develop due to his training. However, Su Yang told Li Hyang that they had nothing to worry about and that Sejong's medical records showed excessive sweating with minimal fluid intake. The doctor wanted to tell Su Young that all the signs had already begun to appear, to which Su Young said that only three months had passed, and that they needed another three months to finally be sure of everything. Soon, severe frost began in Josian, during which a lot of snow began to fall on the ground. Su Young looked at the sky and thought only that with every day he lived, 
his past life seemed more and more like a dream to him. At this moment, Inspector Li Chi approached Siam, who wanted to talk to Siam personally. The inspector, with a good-natured expression on his face, pointed out to Su Young that he had arrived at the estate very early. In response, Su Young also decided to ask Li Qi why he also decided to come to the estate at such an early hour. Li Qi told Su Young that Su Zhang has been unable to fulfill many government obligations recently due to excessive fatigue, and he wants to help him with his duties. Then Su Young expressed his admiration that Li Qi also wants to preserve the strength of Su Zhang's body and spirit. Su Young also decided to ask Li Qi whether he was going to start strengthening his body after all. However, Li Qi said that he has too little time to take care of his health, and he said that he cannot spend this time on his own physical and spiritual well-being. Su Young said that he did not know the duties of the chief inspector but he believed that it was quite possible for Li Qi to spend at least one hour a day strengthening his body, and devote the rest of the time to his work and responsibilities. However, Li Qi said that even one hour can greatly affect the government structure, and that he does not want to take that much risk. After a short silence, Li Qi told Su Young that he simply wished the best for his king, and that he was doing everything in his power for this. After that, Li Qi turned back and went to the exit from the royal estate telling Su Young that the same six months for which Su Young promised to help the king would soon pass. Soon the winter frosts passed, and one spring day, Li Qi gathered all his subordinates in the inspector's department. The inspector department worked in such a way that they could make accusations without any evidence, based only on various rumors. All inspectors considered their main goal of their department to be to keep everyone following the basic principles and rules of Josian, as well as to keep all royal officials at bay. This time, the inspector's department met to discuss their further actions before the start of the royal hunt tomorrow. After a meeting at the inspector's department, Li Qi and her subordinates went to the royal estate to personally talk with the king about leading a healthy lifestyle. At this time, Sejong was just at his daily training, and Li Qi and his subordinates asked Sejong to stop practicing health promotion techniques. Li Qi told Sejong that he was very worried that after Sejong began studying methods to improve his health, government issues still remained unresolved. Sejong then told Li Qi that he had never neglected his royal duties, to which Li Qi said that the king should always set the right example for his officials. Li Qi also argued that Sejong should never put state matters on the back burner, and he wanted Sejong to give up on little things like improving his health. In response to such rudeness, Sejong told Li Qi that his principles were already more like a challenge to the king than loyalty. In response, Sejong said that the real reason for his training is to try to keep himself in good shape to set an example for everyone in the royal hunt. Then Li Qi said that this was too huge a risk, since this year the royal hunt was established by Tai Zhou, the king of Kangwon province. At this point, Li Qi's subordinates argued that these competitions could be dangerous since it was very difficult for inexperienced riders to learn to confidently shoot a bow while galloping. In response to this, Sejong said that if a person constantly worries about his question, then he will not be able to learn anything new and will not be able to achieve any success. Sejong also said that until then, he will continue to train to set an example for all participants in the upcoming royal hunt. Finally, Sejong told Li Qi that he, too, should think about his training after which Li Qi and his subordinates simply left the territory of the royal estate. The next day, Sejong and Suyang went on a royal hunt, which took place in Chorwen, one of the cities in Kangwon province. Before the start of the royal hunt, Sejong informed his hunters that this year he himself would lead the hunt. Sejong also told his hunters that in order to win this royal hunt, they all must stick together and act as one. At this moment, the royal inspectors could not believe that for the first time in many years, King Sejong himself was taking part in a royal hunt. During the last royal hunt, Sejong had such difficulty moving on his own that his subjects had to use a special stretcher for the king. After some time, the start of the royal hunt was announced, and Sejong was very pleased to ride a horse again. While riding the horse, Sejong began to realize why King Taejo strongly recommended that Sejong take up horse riding. At this moment, Sejong looked at his father and did not imagine that one day he would ride horses with him. At one point, Sejong turned his attention to the boar, and he was shocked that he could now clearly see into the distance. Meanwhile, a couple of royal inspectors were discussing that the king had decided not to hunt with Li Qi this time since Sejong wanted to catch his prey on his own this time. At that moment, 
Li Qi was watching Su Yang and trying to understand why and how he was hiding his true plans so subtly. Li Qi also thought about the fact that, in essence, the royal hunt is a kind of preparation for a war in which almost anything can happen. At this moment, Li Qi took out his bow to quickly get rid of Su Yang while there were no witnesses nearby. However, at that moment, the hunters reported that Su Zhong had managed to catch a wild boar, and then Su Yang immediately went to his father. Satisfied, Su Zhong looked at the dead boar carcass and could not believe that he himself was able to catch his prey. Then Su Zhong decided to get off his horse to get a better look at his prey. Su Yang arrived and wanted to make sure that his father was okay. However, in response to Su Yang's questions about King Su Zhong's condition, Su Zhong only remained silent for a moment after which Su Zhong immediately began to laugh loudly. After this, Su Zhong told Su Yang that he was finally able to realize the beauty of horse riding and archery after he was able to hit a target with a bow for the first time in his life. At this moment, Li Qi was still standing on the cliff where Su Yang had stood a couple of minutes ago, and he was angry that he had failed to get rid of Su Yang once and for all. Then Li Qi had to remove his arrow, since he understood that he would definitely not be able to implement his plan to get rid of Su Yang. At this moment, Su Zhong thanked Su Yang for writing such an outstanding book on strengthening the body. After that, Su Zhong looked at Li Qi's subordinates and told them that now it was their turn to start training, and all the subordinates said that they would definitely work on themselves. The day after the royal hunt, Chan Yung presented Su Yang with the lat pull-down machine that Su Yang asked him to make. Su Yang was very happy about the appearance of the new exercise machine, and he immediately prepared to perform new exercises. After that, Su Yang sat down at the simulator and began to pull the crossbar of the simulator down to check the reliability of the structure. After a few repetitions, Chan Yung asked Su Yang if he was satisfied with the new exercise machine. Su Yang then apologized to Chan Yung for being distracted from the conversation, and he told Chan Yung that this machine was just perfect for pumping up his back muscles. Chan Yung then told Su Yang that during the creation he had learned a lot of information for himself, and he was able to understand the method of using a movable pulley, a wheel that gives movement to the drive belt. At this moment, Su Yang was somewhat surprised that Chang Yung learned pulley technology for the first time, as he believed that this technology was very common in this era. Yung also said that he also tried to use the new exercise machine, but he severely injured his arm, and he was worried about what kind of torment Su Zhong would have to endure. After this, Su Yang asked Chan Yung to also build a leg flexion and extension machine. Chan Yung calmly told Su Yang that it would not be difficult for him to create such a simulator and he promised to create this simulator in a month. Su Yang looked at the new simulator and thought that Chan Yung was working very hard for the king, and he told him that when he created the new simulator, he would ask Su Zhong to give Chan Yung a vacation. However, Chan Yung was categorically against the vacation, and he said that he was able to reach great heights thanks to the king, and he cannot just relax and enjoy life. Chan Yung said that he is happy to see people like the king exercise and become healthy and happy. Yung also thought that with the new simulator, the king would experience even more pain, as a result of which the king would develop and strengthen his body even more effectively. Su Yang believed that something was definitely wrong with Chan Yung, and he believed that he definitely needed a vacation. Some time later, Li Qi's subjects arrived at the royal estate trained by Su Ya and Su Zhong. The inspectors tried their best to do all the exercises that Su Yang and Su Zhong told them to do. However, due to such exercises, they began to get tired very quickly. Su Zhong also trained with the inspectors, and he felt that they were not trying at all, which made him think that they wanted to break their promise. But the inspectors said that they would keep their promise. At the same time, the inspectors looked at Su Yang and asked him to persuade the king to stop for a while. However, Su Yang only looked at the exhausted inspectors with a wide smile on his face and told them that he would never dare to stop the king from doing anything. Then the inspectors believed that these exercises were Su Yang's revenge for the incident when they suddenly burst into the estate. During a warm-up run, one of the inspectors accidentally tripped over one of the dumbbells, causing him to fall to the ground, and his comrades wanted to know if he was okay. Then the fallen inspector told his comrades that they urgently needed to continue running after Su Zhong. At this moment, Su Yang did not take any action to help the inspectors in any way, and he simply continued to watch the inspectors suffer. Su Yang also enjoyed the sound of the inspectors barely breathing, and he believed that this particular sound was a sign that very soon Josian would become even better. A week after the royal hunt, 
Lichi announced that very soon he would have to leave Josian for a short time and go to Hamgyando. Some of the inspectors believed that soon unknowing people would begin to gossip that Sejong had demoted Captain Lichi in rank and sent him into exile. However, Lichi reminded that he is already fifty years old and that he is unlikely to make any new decisions. Li Qi admitted that he was pleasantly surprised by how Sejong's condition and health improved thanks to exercise. Li Qi also noticed that lately Prince Suyang had also changed and became a completely different person. Li Qi said that although he had distanced himself from the royal court, he was greatly worried about the activities of the Tunguska tribe and he should go to Hamgyando as a provincial governor. Li Qi also asked to tell Suyang to be careful with Saragama the Ministry of Supervision of the Ming Dynasty. Li Qi learned that the head of Saragama recently ordered a batch of hundreds of bars of soap, and this soap suddenly ended up completely in the hands of Wang Jin, the head of Saragama. About Wang Jin that in fact Wang Jin was a person who had a powerful evil spirit hidden in his soul and body. At this moment, Wang Jin looked at the soap and promised himself that sooner or later he would be able to get closer to Siyang. In the era where Jik lived Yun, one evening a special report began stating that a historically important figure like Suyang was actually a time traveler. The evening news reported how on Chuziak, a traditional Korean holiday, one guy deadlifted 20 kilograms more than last year. The reporter said that the main reason why everyone in Korea was so strong was Suyang, who developed such an interesting traditional game as the deadlift. The reporter also said that it was Suyang who invented silk from which it could be concluded that Suyang was a time traveler. Li Dongwon, director of the History Museum, believed that Suyang had the physique of a modern bodybuilder and was so talented that it would seem that Suyang was a time traveler. Li Dong also said that over time, Suyang has become more negligent and lazy, which makes Suyang's personality subject to a lot of criticism from historical experts. Li Dong also said that if Suyang's book on methods of strengthening the body had become more significant, then Suyang would have gone down in history as a significant person, and not as an author of simple entertainment. However, all this turned out to be just a nightmare, from which Suyang suddenly woke up. Li Hiang was very concerned about Suyang's condition, and he was interested to know what was so terrible that Suyang dreamed that he woke up so quickly with loud screams. Suyang only thought that his nightmare was too plausible but there was still no way he could become some kind of time traveler. Then Suyang looked at the large pile and believed that if he didn't put in enough effort, he would actually go down in history as the author of entertainment for traditional holidays. However, Suyang felt that he could not spend so much time on books, and he decided that tomorrow he would create a new writing system. At that moment, Suyang remembered how Sujong suggested that he make a joint effort to bring as much benefit as possible to Josian and its people. Sujong also remembered that Sujong knew Sanskrit, and Sujong believed that Suyang could help him write the Hangmanjianam that Sujong wrote. At that moment, Suyang began to remember all the things he had to do, and now he began to understand what Chan Yung was like right now. Due to his constant work, Suyang was also unable to spend quality time with his wife and his child as he only came home late at night, after which he would sleep for several hours and then leave again for errands. At this moment, Li Hiang noticed how often Su Yang began to sigh, reminding him of Chan Yung. Then Li Hiang reminded Su Yang that he wanted to appoint someone as the head coach, and he suggested that Su Yang take on a student. Then Su Yang immediately remembered Ma Ao Liang, who was a commoner who could not achieve the highest government position even with his extraordinary abilities. Despite such a good candidate, Suyang also wanted to appoint people from several classes to the positions of head coaches. Previously, Li Hiang believed that in a healthy lifestyle, a person should have a desire to respect his parents. But Suyang also believed that high-ranking people were also needed here. Suyang believed that in order to train people on the territory of the royal estate, the position of head trainer should be filled by one of Suyang's relatives. Suyang believed that his cousin Seo Sangun could be cast in the role but he also needed to somehow entice him. Sang Gong was the son of the former King Yang Ning, who was overthrown for adultery in secret from the royal family and for committing corruption, after which Sujong became king. Also rumors in Josian that Sang Gun was not much different from his father, and Suyang believed that Sang Gun could very well become a bad person like his father. The next day, Suyang was still able to personally meet with Sang Gong, who did not stand out in any way. Suyang believed that his cousin had gone mad after his father subjected his concubine to cruel trials. However, 
Now Sangun looks like a completely normal and calm person, and Suyang believed that this event simply had not happened yet. Suyang asked Sangong if he knew about his book on healthy living, and Sangong said that he was aware that Suyang was able to open a new scientific field. Then Suyang invited Sangun to become his student, to learn all the secrets of a healthy lifestyle and Sang Gun immediately agreed with this proposal. Suyang was then happy that Sang Gong agreed to train with him, and he told Ma Yil that he would train him. Ma Yil approached Sang Gun and told him that they first needed to warm up on a wooden block, after which they could begin the main exercises. However, at this moment, Sang Gun immediately began to insult Ma Yil, telling him that he stinks very much afterward. Suyang and Ma Yil were amazed at such a sudden change in Sang Gong's behavior and Sang Gong asked Suyang how he could even have such an illegitimate and low-born commoner like Ma Il in his circle. Ma Il was a little confused about why Sang Gong suddenly became rude, and then Ma Il didn't pay attention to Sang Gong's words, and he simply told him to go train. After a few minutes, Sang Gun began to try to squat with a barbell, but after a couple of minutes he began to get very tired. Then Suyang drew Sang Gong's attention to Ma Il, who could easily withstand a lot of weight while Sang Gong couldn't even handle 60 pounds. At this point, Sang Gong began to beg Suyang to do the exercises with lighter weights. After a couple of seconds, Sang Gong, exhausted, simply fell to his knees in front of Suyang and Ma Il. At this moment, Suyang asked Sang Gong why he treated Ma Il like that if people had treated him so rudely before. Suyang also said that everyone used to treat Ma Il the same way because he was an illegitimate son and Suyang didn't understand why Sang Gong was acting the same way people treated him before. Sang Gun said that if he had not done this, he would have started to feel so humiliated that he simply would not have wanted to live anymore. Sang Gun said that his older and younger brother were better than him in everything, and because of this, Sang Gun had no chance to conduct government affairs. Sang Gun was also constantly surrounded by people who were afraid that he might pose some kind of threat to the royal throne. Sang Gun said that he was very upset by his powerlessness, which only made him more anxious about his unsuccessful attempts to change something in his life. Then Suyang told Sang Gong that in any case he should not behave as basely as those who offended him since he believed that the oppression of a nobleman was the worst thing for any commoner. Then Sang Gun said that he was very ashamed of that, and promised that he would not behave like that again. At this moment, Suyang and Ma Ayo were glad that Sang Gun realized everything, since this could have a positive impact on Sang Gun's future. Suyang then told Sang Gong that Ma Ayo should teach him the three basic exercises. Suyang also told Sang Gong that if he could lift 650 pounds in each of the three exercises, then he would make him responsible for a healthy lifestyle in the royal palace. Sang Gun could not believe that Suyang could put him in such a position, and Suyang reminded Sang Gun that Sejong had personally verified the effectiveness of his training. Suyang said that now anyone who wants to become part of the royal palace must definitely know everything about a healthy lifestyle, and the coach will have to control it. Suyang also said that if Sang Gong becomes the head coach in the royal palace, then he will train Prince Li Hyang, that is, Sang Gong will also become the personal trainer of the future king. Suyang also thought that if Sang Gong achieved such an important position in the royal palace, then no one would mock and humiliate him anymore. Sang Gong could not believe that he would become part of the royal court, and he was somewhat ashamed that he could not even master the thirty books. Then Suyang and Ma Il told Sang Gong that he need not worry about this, since they promised him that they would definitely help him since Suyang was going to create his own letter system. Hong Minjomian soon emerged, since Korean speech was very different from Chinese speech and Joseon residents could not use the Chinese script. Previously, illiterate people could not put their thoughts and problems on paper through writing, but with the advent of the new letter system, anyone could master writing. Years passed, and over time, Suyang's little son, Hyun Dan, grew up. One day, Little Hyung Dan came to his father to show him how easily and deftly he could lift a cat to show Su Young his strength. After that, Su Young picked up Hyung Dan in his arms, and the little boy asked Su Young why Uncle Young Ho falls to the ground after every practice. Su Young told his son that in order to become stronger, Uncle Young Ho and Sang Gun train every day, and if their muscles start to hurt, then over time they become bigger and stronger. After that, Su Young and his son approached Sang Gun 
and Hyung Dan noticed that Sang Gun always sits or lies down after training. However, Sang Gun said that it was hard for him to train because everyone around him was practicing longer than him, and he told Hyung Dong to start learning new sciences as early as possible. Then Hyung Dan took out his father's book on a healthy lifestyle and believed that Sang Gun was talking about it. Sang Gun was amazed that little Hyung Dan managed to learn to read and write and then Hyung Dan invited Sang Gun to read his father's book together. Su Young thought about the fact that he had been in this era for five years already, and during this time a lot of sports equipment, such as various barbells, dumbbells and weights, had already appeared in Joseon. A lot of time has already passed since Su Young found himself in the Joseon era, and every day his past life seemed to him like a distant dream. Soon, the palace began to show more and more interest in a healthy lifestyle, and even Siyang's wife began to train and strengthen her body with various exercises. During another training session, Siyang's wife finally managed to lift the dumbbells on her own. However, at one point, Siyang's wife felt unwell, causing her to suddenly lose consciousness and begin to fall. But Siyang managed to catch his wife and prevent any damage from the fall from occurring. After a couple of seconds, Siyang's wife was able to regain consciousness, and she told Siyang that she began to feel dizzy after which her eyes darkened and her breathing became a little difficult. Su Young's wife complained that she was starting to feel a little nauseous, which scared Su Young's wife's servants and Ma Yil a little. Su Young then told his wife that these were only temporary symptoms caused by the sudden flow of blood from the head, and he told his wife to take a deep breath. At this moment, Su Young was thinking that he was lucky to have his wife by his side and that he was able to save her from more serious injuries that could have occurred after the fall. Su Young also thought that as the number of people who began to practice exercises grew, the number of such cases would only increase, and he had to figure out how to reduce such cases to a minimum. During another training session, Sang Gun told Su Young that he would like to introduce him to one person. Sang Gun said that he would like to introduce Su Young to Hyun Gyu, who one day passed his exams and became an officer of Tony Mum one of the eight great gates of Seoul. One day, Hyun Shio heard that Su Young was able to lift 150 pounds, and Hyun Gyu wanted to repeat this exercise by lifting a stone of the same weight, and he managed to do it. However, after a while, Hyun Gyu was fired from his position because the exercise severely injured his back, causing him to be unable to straighten his back properly. At one point, it seemed to Su Young that he had once heard about this man somewhere and he remembered how this man was able to suppress an entire uprising. Su Young believed that he still managed to somehow change the course of history, since Hyun Gyu had to retire only after receiving the highest rank, and soon after that he was seriously wounded. Gun then told Su Young that he made a strong impression on Hyun Gyu, and Sang Gun believed that Su Young should not ignore the potential of such a talented person as Hyun Gyu. Su Young was interested in this story and thought that he should really look at Hyun Gyu to understand his true potential. Meanwhile, Hyun Gyu sat at home, drinking and blaming Su Young for what happened to him. Also, Hyun Gyu, what exactly is Su Young put him in such a bad light in front of people? Then one of Hyun's friends Gyu said that the king himself went through the path of Su Young's teachings which once again proves the real effectiveness of these trainings. At this moment Hayak Gyu promised himself that he would personally find out from Su Young whether he really managed to lift 250 pounds. At this moment, Su Young was already standing behind Hyun Gyu, who continued to desecrate Su Young and his method of strengthening the body and leading a healthy lifestyle. At one point, Su Young finally decided to interrupt Hyun Gyu and tell him that he was actually only able to lift 150 pounds that time. Hyun Gyu was very frightened by the sudden appearance of Su Young, who had a visit with Hyun Gyu's small talk. At this moment, Su Young was able to get a better look at Hyun Gyu, and he believed that after Hyun's injury Gyu began to neglect meals, which made him gain weight. Even though Hyun Gyu gained weight, about Hyun there was a rumor that even after a back injury, he still continued to enjoy horse riding. After that, Su Young said to Hyun Gyu that due to the fact that he continued to train, his condition worsened somewhat, and Hyun Gyu believed that he would not be able to recover. Su Young said that there is a way that can cure Hyun Gyu. However, there was no guarantee that this method could completely cure Hyun Gyu, and all he had to do was trust Su Young and listen to him. First, Su Young showed Hyun Gyu how to do lunges that stretch motor muscles and joints. Su Young also showed Hyun Gyu how to do the McKenzie exercise, which also strengthens and warms up most of all muscles. First, Hyun Gyu did not understand how these movement exercises could help him with his illness, 
and Suyang decided to immediately tell Hyun Gyu about his treatment method. Suyang said to Hyun Gyu that he will not be able to lift heavy weights, and despite the fact that after these exercises he will feel better, his back pain appeared a year ago, from which it will not be able to be completely cured. Hyun Gyu could not believe that he would not be able to completely cure his back, and he believed that now he would not be able to fulfill his duty as a man which would make him unable to even look his wife in the eyes. After Hyun Gyu mentioned his wife, Suyang remembered a recent incident where his wife fainted during exercise. Then Suyang said to Hyun Gyu that under such circumstances Hyun Gyu can look for ways to treat such diseases. Hyun Gyu believed that Suyang wanted him to become a doctor, which he was very afraid of, since he had never read any medical books. Suyang said to Hyun Gyu, that even doctors cannot know all the intricacies of the structure of human muscles and bones, and therefore we need a doctor who will engage in rehabilitation therapy, who knows about the connection between muscles and skeleton. Then Hyung Gyu told Suyang that he was a very deep thinker, and he told Suyang that now if anyone spoke ill of Suyang, he would personally punish such people. Soon Hyung Gyu began training with Suyang, and with each passing day, the number of people who wanted to start training and strengthening their bodies grew more and more. Suyang believed that with the advent of the new language system, more and more people could learn to read, which made his book very popular, and at this rate, all people would practice on the street. At this moment, Suyang began to think that he needed to design such sportswear so that even poor people could afford such clothes. After another training session, Suyang and his wife went to the royal tailor who made them special training clothes from cheap cotton fabric. However, at first Suyang's wife was somewhat displeased with the fact that these clothes were made of cotton, since she believed that cotton clothes were worn only by ordinary people. Then Suyang decided to try on new clothes so that his wife would appreciate the new clothes. It was the first time Suyang's wife had seen such clothes, and Suyang said that these clothes were specially designed for training. Suyang also told his wife that he specifically chose cotton for these clothes because it is not only cheap, but also comfortable. Suyang also told his wife that he was well aware that nobles were unlikely to wear such clothes because of the fabric. However, Suyang's wife said that she was a little hasty with her conclusions, and she agreed that these clothes should be good for training. Suyang was glad that his wife approved of such clothes, and then Suyang asked the tailor to take these clothes as a sample and begin mass production of these clothes. Soon, mass production of sports t-shirts began, which consisted of cheap materials, which is why even ordinary people could afford such clothes. One evening, several young men spent time at Ching Wangsa Temple, where they studied Suyang's book together. Shin Suk Chu, one of the scholars of Jipyangjiang, noticed that Mei Zhu Xian, who was also a scholar of Jipyangjiang, had been studying Suyang's book a lot lately. At this moment, Mei Zhu began to feel tired, and he did not even notice how quickly time passed while he studied Suyang's book. At this moment, Xing Chu wanted to ask Mei Zhu why he suddenly started spending so much time studying. Mei Zhu then told Xing Chu that he could not sit idly by while Suyang set such an example for them through his book. At this moment, Xing Chu noticed Suyang's book on healthy living in Mei Zhu's hands and he said that he had read a little about this book and really liked its contents. Mei Xu also turned his attention to how Tanj repeated the push-ups he learned about from Siyang's book. Mei Xu said that he noticed Tanj suddenly disappear and return early in the morning, and he believed that Tanj was going for a run in the mountainous area. Tanj said that he would like to run up the mountain, but Sam Gaxon Mountain was too steep for jogging, and Xing Chu suggested that Tanj jump rope to warm up his body and get rid of unnecessary thoughts. Xing Chu also told Tanj that Suyang's book did not seem that good to him, and despite the fact that it described ways to strengthen the body, most of the information was taken from other manuals. Then Tanj told Xing Chu that he should not take the book so lightly that the king himself praised it. Mei Zhu wanted to prevent further disputes between Tanj and Xing Chu and then he suggested that they discuss this topic in more detail tomorrow. The next morning, Tanj, Mei Zhu, and Xing Chu with several other scholars gathered at the temple again, and Mei Zhu asked Tanj to give his opinion on Siyang's book, since he had read the most books. Tanj said that the book showed many ways to strengthen the human body, but there was no clear description of developing an understanding of the essence of these exercises. Xing Chu said that usually religious books contain the thoughts of true sages, and he doubted that Suyang was one of those sages. Mei Xu also asked Tanj how cultivating one's body allows one to show respect for one's parents, 
if one's respect for one's parents should be manifested in one's reputation. Mei Xu also learned from the book that developing one's body allows one to survive any heat and cold. But Mei Zhu himself was not entirely sure of the correctness of this idea. Xing Chu said that he is somewhat concerned about the fact that many exercises require a person to use a lot of different expensive equipment. Xing Chu also asked Tanj how many people were able to change for the better thanks to the exercises described in Siyang's book. To dispel all doubts of Mei Zhu and Xing Chu as much as possible, Tanj cited King Sejong himself as an example of change. Tanj then believed that Mei Zhu and Xing Chu were trying to belittle the king and his achievements in developing his body, but Mei Zhu and Xing Chu immediately began to refute this theory. Tanj said that from the moment Sejong began studying Suyang's book, he became a completely different person, and even Josian ministers believed that the king became even more active than in his youth. Tanj also said that despite the fact that the book had its flaws, the body is still transformed, and even if they start training as well, they will still be able to walk normally the next day. After Tanj's words, Mei Zhu believed that Tanj was suggesting that they buy the same expensive exercise equipment to start training their muscles. However, Tanj said that even though they won't be able to afford such expensive machines, they can still use nearby tools of the same weight, such as rocks or logs. Tanj also told his comrades that if they were not going to start training their muscles, then no one would force them to do it. After this conversation, Mei Zhu and Xing Chu began training for a whole week. However, on the eighth day, Mei Zhu, Xing Chu, and several other scientists began to complain of extreme fatigue, which is why everyone decided to stop their training. At this point, only Tanj remained, who was somewhat surprised at how quickly his comrades surrendered. Then Tanj believed that his comrades simply did not have enough patience and then he was the only one who did not give up and decided to continue training hard. About a month later, Chan Young created new shoulder press and seated row machines for Suyang. First of all, Suyang decided to test the new simulators in practice, and for this he called a couple of inspectors. However, at this moment, Chan Young was not listening to Suyang, and he was only thinking about how difficult it would be for the inspectors to exercise if he added more weight to these machines. At this point, Suyang continued to praise Chan Young, to which Chan Young said that a loyal subject like him is simply obliged to work as hard as he can for the good of the king. After some time, Chan Young noticed that the inspectors were still exhausted after testing the new simulators for strength. The moment Li Hyang arrived, the inspectors immediately began to pay their respects to him. Even after Li Hyang sat down at one of the simulators, the inspectors still continued to bow to Li Hiang. However, the weight of the simulator turned out to be too much for Li Hiang, and he said that he would punish these inspectors right now for choosing to mock Li Hiang in this way. Then Su Young thought about how Li Hiang would react when he found out that it was Su Young who put such weight on the simulator to test the physical abilities of his older brother. After that, Su Young sent Li Hiang to perform a bench press with a barbell. Soon, Li Hyang still managed to perform the bench press as many times as Su Young told him. After the exercise, Su Young congratulated Li Hyang for finally being able to lift 500 pounds. Li Hyang was flattered by such praise from Su Young, and he believed that after just a year and a half of hard training, he would be able to lift 700 pounds. However, Su Young told Li Hyang that each person's muscles grow differently and gradually Su Yang increased the weight of his barbell to 800 pounds. Su Yang also said that after he started lifting 800 pounds, his muscles began to grow much more slowly. Su Yang believed that even though he and his brother had equally strong muscles, due to Li Hyang training less, it would take him two to five years to be able to lift 700 pounds. However, Su Yang believed that it did not matter how much time it took him, because it was important for him that Li Hyang did not go astray and then he ordered Li Hyang to repeat the bench press one more time. The next day, Su Yang's wife was not feeling well, and Su Yang wanted to know what happened to his wife. However, Su Yang's wife said that her food poisoning and nausea had gotten a little worse, making her feel a little worse, so she asked Su Yang to get her some meat that Su Yang didn't eat. Su Yang considered that his wife was telling him about pork meat, and he said that because of his proper meat diet, he only eats chicken and lean beef. However, within a second, Su Young left his wife's room and told her that he would get the best pork for her. A few minutes later, Su Young arrived at the farm, and he asked the farmer to bring him the best pig, 
and then the farmer showed Su Young the biggest pig on the farm. However, Su Young saw in front of him a cute little pig, which in size was more reminiscent of a baby pig. Su Young looked at this pig and thought that the farmer decided to play a trick on him, but the farmer swore that this pig was the largest on the entire farm. Soon, Kim Jong So, one of the best warriors of Joseon, arrived at Sejong who wanted to tell Sejong the news that he had managed to defeat the northern barbarians. Sejong told Kim Jong that he had come a long and hard way, and that with the coming of winter it would be more difficult for the northern savages to reach the borders of Joseon. Kim Jong paid his respects to Sejong, after which the king hosted a small private banquet to celebrate Kim Jong's return. A few minutes later, the servants set the table especially for Kim Jong and Su Young invited Kim Jong to drink to the king. While Su Young was pouring Kim Jong a drink, Kim Jong told Su Young that he had heard about how Su Young was able to strengthen his body, and he said that Su Young could now rival the Joseon general himself. Su Young was pleased to hear such compliments from Kim Jong addressed to him, and he said that he did not build muscles in order to shoot a bow or swing a sword. However, Kim Jong told Su Young that he was sending something more valuable than bows and arrows to the north, but Su Young did not understand what exactly Kim Jong was telling him. Kim Jong then explained that he was talking about the alcohol that was sent to him and his army. Kim Jong also said that it was thanks to alcohol that he was able to reduce the number of people in his squad who would suffer from rotting wounds. Then Su Young realized why there was still no rust in his distillation apparatus, which indicated that his invention was now being used everywhere. However, Kim Jong also said that this alcohol had a downside and soldiers often drank bottles of alcohol to prevent the occurrence and development of colds. For this reason, many problems arose in the detachment due to the fact that sometimes some soldiers were intoxicated. Then Su Young became interested in how Kim Chin was able to solve the problem with drunken soldiers, and then Kim Chin told a very effective and funny way to wean soldiers from drinking alcohol. Kim Jong said that they started adding motherwort to alcohol, and if the soldiers tried to drink even a little alcohol, they would immediately spit out all the alcohol, which made Su Young and Kim Jong laugh very much. Suddenly, Lee Ji Nak walked past Su Young and Kim Jong, and Kim Jong invited him to join them and have a drink together. Su Young heard a familiar name, and he remembered that Lee Ji Nak was also considered one of the strongest warriors of Joseon, who performed well during the battle with the northern savages. At this point, Lee Ji stopped and told Kim Jong that he was simply serving the king and following his will. Then Kim Jong decided to go about his business, leaving Su Yang and Li Ji alone, hoping that two strong people would certainly find a common topic for conversation. While walking, Li Ji told Su Yang that he came here to carry out Su Jong's orders and learn a new writing and alphabetic system. At this point, Su Yang decided to try to study Li Ji's physique, and for the first time in Joseon, Su Young saw a person with a body as strong and toned as his. Su Young also remembered that at the time when he became the new ruler and began the cleansing, Li Ji would try to gather an army from the Jurhan tribe. However, at the most unexpected moment, the generals will stab Li Ji in the back, which will greatly weaken the Joseon army, making Li Ji one of the most powerful individuals in Korean history. Su Young also thought that if Li Ji did survive during historical events, then Su Young would have to get rid of Li Ji on his own. Such thoughts made Su Young very uncomfortable being around Li Ji, and he believed that Li Ji wanted to talk to him about this topic. At one point, Li Ji broke the silence and told Su Young that rumors that Su Jong had changed a lot had reached the very north. Li Ji also said that he had some questions for Su Young about his work, and he asked Su Young if he could personally visit his estate to learn more about his teachings. At this moment, Su Young felt that Li Ji just wanted to compete with him but he still allowed Li Ji to visit him sometime. The next day, Sang Gong trained with Ma Il again, and on the same day, Li Ji arrived at Su Young's estate. Seeing Li Ji, Sang Gong and Ma Il couldn't believe that Li Ji was an ordinary person. At this moment, Li Ji looked at Sang Gong's hand and saw a dumbbell in it, and then Li Ji asked Sang Gong to let him try to lift it. Before handing the dumbbell to Li Ji, Sang Gong told him to be careful as this dumbbell might be much heavier than it might seem at first glance. Li Ji took the dumbbell in his hand and began to lift it, and he was convinced that the dumbbell was indeed somewhat heavy. San Gong was shocked at how Li Ji could bend his arms so easily with the dumbbells in his hand, 
as San Gong had previously used the dumbbells solely for deadlifting. After this, Li Ji said that he had heard rumors that Su Yang was once able to perform three basic exercises with a total load of a thousand pounds. Li Ji then turned to face Su Yang behind him and asked him how much weight he could lift. A few minutes later, Li Ji prepared to lift a 700-pound barbell, and he successfully completed the task. While Li Ji was deadlifting 700 pounds, San Gong looked at Li Ji and thought that he would not be able to lift that kind of weight even after half a year of hard training. After Li Ji placed the barbell on the ground, Su Yang told him that this was the first time he had seen a person who could successfully handle such weight. At this moment, Su Yang was thinking that in the conditions of this era, Li Ji could be called a strong man from God. At one point, Su Yang thought that Li Ji was dissatisfied with something, but Li Ji tried to hide it by telling Su Yang that he had learned a lot about body training. However, Su Yang asked Li Ji to be more honest, as Su Yang realized that his book had a lot of flaws since he did all the research in his book alone. Recently, Li Ji visited Sejong, and Sejong said that Su Yang had developed a book with new techniques for training the body and he said that this knowledge could also be used in the military training of soldiers. Su Yong then realized that his training methods would be very difficult to apply to the Joseon military industry. Li Ji said that the book mainly describes muscle building techniques, while the muscles that are most used when using weapons are hardly developed. Li Ji also said that to use weapons, a soldier must also use other muscle groups about which almost nothing is written in Su Yong's book. Li Ji also said that the book says that in order to develop muscles, a person must eat enough meat, but in a real battle, an ordinary soldier cannot afford to eat meat. Li Ji also said that due to the current realities of military affairs, healthcare remains only a theoretical science that cannot be used in military craft. At this moment, Su Yang was greatly offended that Li Ji believed that he was unfamiliar with the craft of war. Even though Su Yang did not know the military trade, the young jik he used to be was very familiar with military affairs, since it was in the army that he began to get involved in bodybuilding. Then Su Yong promised himself that within three years he would be able to supplement his book with body strengthening methods for soldiers. Meanwhile, Sejong was studying another appeal from the ruler of the Ming dynasty. At that moment, Li Hiang arrived with Sejong, who wanted to know why his father had called him to him. Sejong told Li Hiang that the ruler of the Ming dynasty wanted to order 100 units of soap from them. And then Sejong was once again convinced that it was not in vain that his people began to grow so many linden trees. However, Sejong said that the ruler of the Ming dynasty wants to personally meet Suyang, who created the soap. Sejong knew that Suyang had no acquaintances or connections with the Ming dynasty. And then Sejong believed that the eunuch from the ministry personally wanted to meet Suyang. Li Hiang then decided that they should not worry about Suyang, since of all the people in Joseon he had the broadest outlook and Li Hiang suggested sending Su Yang to the Ming Kingdom as an ambassador. Meanwhile, Su Yang trained hard to update his book with new body-strengthening techniques for Joseon soldiers. The next day, Su Yang continued to train Sang Gun, and throughout his training, Sang Gun was able to achieve significant results. Su Yang praised Sang Gun for being able to lift 500 pounds less than a year after he began his training, and Su Yang believed that within the next year Sang Gun could become a true master. However, Sang Gun believed that he would not become a master in the next year, since even Hiang could lift much more weight. Afterwards, Sun Jianei reminded Su Yang about how much he had previously wanted to take a hostage, and Su Yang believed that Sang Gun had forgotten about it due to his training. However, Sang Gun said that he needs to start looking for a hostage again, since everyone around him is worried that he still doesn't have children. Sang Gun also said that he decided to choose Ham Niang Yun as his concubine. And at that moment Su Yang thought that in the Joseon era, people have children before the age of 20. Su Yang also thought that if in the Joseon era a man was already 20 years old, then instead of a wife he was looking for a concubine. And Su Yang at one time had a similar problem. And then his first son was born at 23 years old. Sang Gong believed that Su Yang suspected something. But Su Yang did not know how to explain to Sang Gong that his future one would be killed by his own father. Then Su Yang told Sang Gong that he had read fortunes from the Book of Changes, and he learned that if Sang Gong marries a second time, then a mysterious atrocity will overtake his wife. Sang Gong was somewhat surprised that Su Yang was able to foresee not just something bad, but a mysterious atrocity. Su Yang then told Sang Gun that physical strength would help him avoid such a sad fate. At this point, Sang Gong thought that by evil, 
Seung meant something like a thief who would attack him and his wife. Then Sang Gun wondered if a woman could develop her physical abilities. Then Seung looked at his wife, who was working hard, and he said that a woman can also develop and strengthen her body. Seung also said that he could train his future concubine in martial arts, after which he asked Sang Gun to capture him. Sang Gong grabbed Seung by the collar of his t-shirt and Suyang told Sang Gong that this grab is the most common move before a fight. Sang Gong then said with a smile on his face that he had also grabbed people this way before, after which he apologized to Suyang for that, that he had to grab it like that. At this moment, Suyang tensed his hands and said that he knew a great way for a person to get out of such a grip. After that, Suyang tensed his hands even more and hit Sang Gong's forearms, causing Sang Gong to immediately let go of Suyang. After this technique, San Gong fell to the ground, and Suyang told him that this technique could easily break the attacker's joint. After this technique, Suyang offered to bring Nian Yun to him so that his wife could teach her similar techniques. For several years, Nian Yun and Suyang's wife studied self defense techniques, after which they moved on to practical training. First, Suyang's wife showed Nian Yun how to hold the opponent from behind, after which Nian Yun tried to repeat the technique, but she did not have enough strength to stably restrain Suyang's wife. After a few days of training, Nian Yun was able to master several self-defense techniques, but she still did not understand why she had to learn such techniques. Then San Gong told Nian Yun that one day these techniques could save her life, and Nian Yun said that she would definitely use these techniques to protect herself from the robber. After some time, one of Suyang's servants came to him with the news that trouble had happened to Yang Nin. Suyang learned that Yang Nin's left arm was broken and his teeth were badly damaged, and Suyang began to guess what really happened. Even though Suyang taught Nian Yun self-defense techniques, he did not expect that Nian Yun would be able to inflict such serious injuries on Yang Nin. After this, Suyang, Sejong, Yang Nin, Nian Yun and several other people gathered in the palace to find out what really happened. On the day of the incident, Yang Nin was relaxing at home and thinking about how his son started training so hard. At one point, Yang Nin ordered Sang Gong's new concubine to bring him a cup of tea. After some time, Nian Yun brought Yang Nin his cup of tea, but the dissatisfied Yang Nin immediately threw the cup of tea towards Nian Yun. At this moment, Yang Nin didn't like that Nian Yun took so long to prepare tea for him, which made him feel like Nian Yun grew the tea leaves herself. At one point, Yang Nin stopped shouting at Nian Yun and then he began to take a closer look at his son's new concubine. Then Yang Nin thought that his son had chosen a very pretty girl for himself, since their tastes in girls were almost similar. After staring for a while, Yang Nin grabbed Nian Yun by the collar of her clothes. Nian Yun was panicked, and then she hit Yang Ning's jaw with her head as quickly as possible. Nian Yun's blow was so strong that after her blow, Yang Nin's teeth and nose were severely damaged. After Yang Nin accidentally let go of Nian Yun, Sang Gong's concubine immediately grabbed Yang Nin's hand and began to twist it. Nian Yun held Yang Nin's hand so tightly and tightly that his hand immediately broke. While clarifying the situation, Sejong turned to the investigator to tell him everything that he managed to find out. The investigator told Sejong that in this case, Prince Yang Ning was beaten by his son's concubine, resulting in several severe injuries. Then Sejong wondered how such a simple concubine as Nian Yun could cripple such a seasoned warrior as Yang Nin. At that moment, Yang Nin told Sejong that Su Yang and Sang Gun taught Nian Yun a special technique that made it possible to neutralize almost any person. Then Sejong believed that in such cases the criminal received punishment in the form of execution. Yang Nin also demanded that Sejong execute everyone who was in any way connected with this case, including Su Yang who taught Nian Yun this deadly technique. After this, Sejong asked Suyang to tell him what really happened, and Suyang only said that this technique was taught to him by none other than God himself. After Sejong learned all the details of the situation, he came to the conclusion that Suyang had developed a new method of defense. After this, Sejong asked everyone who came here on this matter who was really responsible for this incident. At this moment, the Prime Minister wanted to say that considering Yang Ning's disposition and character, he was sure that Yang Nin wanted to kill Nian Yun, while she was simply putting up proper resistance. After that, the head of the judge's order, Yu Jiamin, said that even though Yang Nin was to blame for all this, Nian Yun also committed a serious crime by damaging Yang Nin's body. At this moment, Sejong found himself in a very difficult position, because even though he knew about Yang Ning's previous atrocities, he still had to make a decision based on state laws. At this moment, 
Sejong thought that for such actions Nian Yun was subject to the same punishment as for treason, namely the death penalty. Sejong could not give Nian Yun the death penalty, and he gave Nian Yun the punishment of twenty lashes. A couple of minutes later, Nian Yun was tied to a special wooden cross, after which one of the guards approached her with a whip. Nian Yun was afraid that this guard would start beating her so hard that after the punishment she would simply not be able to move normally. Suddenly, after a second, the guard prepared to deliver the first blow of the whip to Nian Yun's legs. However, the guard's blow turned out to be so weak that at first Nian Yun did not even realize that she had already been hit. Nian Yun didn't understand why she didn't feel the blow, and then she realized that this guard felt a little sorry for hitting Nian Yun and he only decided to pretend that he hit Nian Yun hard enough. Then Nian Yun decided to play along with the good guard a little, and then she began to scream very loudly, feigning unbearable pain. At one point, Yan Nin noticed that something was wrong here, and then he stopped the guard, who was already ready to strike a second blow at Nian Yun. Yan Nin noticed that the guard decided to spare Nian Yun, and then he demanded from the guard that after her blows, her legs would be mutilated. However, after just a couple of seconds, Yan Nin pushed the guard aside and grabbed the whip. Yan Nin said that he would do the rest of the blows on Yan Yun himself, after which he swung the cut with all his might. However, within a second, Sijom was standing behind Yan Nin, who told his brother to stop right now. Yan Nin didn't understand how Sijong ended up behind him so quickly, since Yan Nin was much stronger than Sijong before. At this moment, Yan Nin believed that Sijong wanted to leave the person who crippled his brother unharmed. However, Sejong no longer wanted to listen to Yang Ning, and he demanded that he shut up right now. Sejong also told Yang Nin that if he tried to do something like that, Yang Nin would immediately end up in eternal exile. After that, Sejong let go of the whip that Yang Nin was holding so tightly, who immediately fell to the ground. Sejong then reminded Yang Ning that King Taejong had forbidden him to enter Joseon territory but today Sejong showed mercy and allowed him to return. Sejong also said that many of his subjects had repeatedly begged him to send Yan Ning into exile, and that he was no longer going to tolerate his grave atrocities. After this, Sejong asked the guards to put Yan Ning under house arrest, and the guards happily prepared to arrest Yan Ning. While the guards were tying Yan Ning's hands despite his injury, Yan Ning insisted to Sejong that he could not do this to him. After one of the guards tied up Yan Ning, he told Sejong that he was ready to proceed to arrest Yang Nin. After one of the guards began to take Yang Nin away, Sejong asked one of the guards to release Nian Yun right now. At this moment, Sang Gun was expressing his sincere gratitude to Sejong, and he did not know how he could thank such a merciful king as Sejong. However, Sejong told Sang Gun that he would right now provide him and Nian Yun with separate housing where they could live together peacefully. Sejong also felt that Nian Yun had gone through a lot of difficulties in life and he said that from now on they cannot worry about anything and rest peacefully. Soon, Yang Nin found himself under strict house arrest, and a few days later Su Yang had a daughter, whom he named Zhu Hyun. For some time, Su Yang lived quietly with his wife and children, but one day an unusual guest came to Su Yang's house. This very guest turned out to be Tanj, who was persistently studying Su Yang's book on strengthening the human body and leading a healthy lifestyle. Su Yang thought that he had already seen this young man in Chipyongjong, and Su Yang suddenly became curious as to what exactly prompted Tanj to put aside all his affairs and visit Su Yang. Su Yang also noticed that since the last time he saw Tanj, his body had become so strong that at first Su Yang didn't even recognize him. Tanj said that he started studying Su Yang's book after his back began to hurt badly and after studying the book and doing the exercises, the back pain went away. However, even after the pain in his back went away, Tanj did not give up training, and over time, his body became much stronger, and he wanted to personally thank Su Yang for such an invaluable contribution. However, Su Yang told Tanj that there was nothing to thank him for since he did not train Tanj personally. Tanj then asked Su Yang if he could participate in his physical training program. Su Yang thought that if Tang Ye were an ordinary person, he would agree, but Tangya was a member of Sioxin, and if Tangya were to study, it could affect the future scientific progress of Joseon. Then Suyong told Tanj that he was a little worried that such a talented scientist like him decided to give up studying other sciences and devote himself entirely to training. However, Tanj said with full confidence that his friends were more talented scientists, and that it was unlikely that anything could happen if he suddenly decided to change his occupation. Then Su Young believed that Tanj wanted to become a sports coach, 
and Tanj confirmed his guesses. Tanj also told Suyong that he had already informed the king that he would like to leave Chipyangjong. Then Suyong told Tanga that he was ready to train him, after which they went together for another training session. Before starting the training, Tanj decided to introduce himself in front of everyone. Sang Gun was already familiar with Tanj, and he believed that Tanj had only recently started training, and then Sang Gun told him that he still had a lot to learn. Tanj did not argue with Sang Gun, and he asked him to teach him all the necessary exercises. Before teaching Tanj new exercises, Tanj felt that the first thing he needed to do was check what he was already capable of. At first, Sang Gong suggested testing how many pull-ups Tanj could do and Sang Gong thought that it would be difficult for a beginner like Tanj to do this exercise correctly. Sang Gun also decided to brag a little to Tanj that in six months of hard training he was able to master four skills. However, after a couple of seconds, Sang Gun noticed how easily Tanj could do pull-ups, and then Sang Gun started counting the number of times Tanj could do pull-ups. Sang Gun felt a little ashamed that he would be able to do as many pull-ups as Tanj did and began to think that Tanj was simply doing the exercise incorrectly. Suyun watched how easily Tanj stretched, and he believed that with Tanj's arrival, everyone else would also try to practice with the same tenacity as Tanj. After training, Suyun went with Tanj to a small area that had an impeccable view of the mountains. Tanj looked at the forest and thought that with such volumes of raw materials it would be possible to grow plants with a total volume of 20,000 pounds. Tanj thought that if they put all this linden into making soap and started selling it to the Ming dynasty, they could get a lot of money. But Suyang said that they could get something more than money. At first Tang Ye didn't understand what Suyang meant, and Suyang said that they could achieve a bright future for all of Joseon. Soon Sujong called Suyang to tell him that one man named Ugan was able to heal his lower back thanks to Suyang's book and even doctors could not help this man with his illness. Sejong also told Suyang that for such achievements, he was entitled to a worthy reward. But Sejong had one small request to Suyang. Sejong asked Suyang to meet with Prime Minister Huang He, who resigned a month ago due to some health problems, and Sejong asked Suyang to try to help him. Sejong understood that most likely nothing could be done about the Prime Minister's current condition due to his advanced age but it would be nice to at least try to do something. Soon, Suyang went to the estate where the prime minister lives, and the local servants were very frightened that Suyang arrived to them so quickly. At this moment, the prime minister's servants began to make a big fuss about Suyang's arrival, but Suyang himself believed that these people were just a little strange. After this, Suyang entered the estate, and there he saw an eighty-year-old old man and a special person who voiced everything that the old man told him since it was difficult for him to speak himself. The old man said that he would like to carry out the king's order, but after seventy years of life he developed problems with his lower back. Suyang told the servants that King Sejong himself sent him here, but Suyang said that even he could not somehow help the prime minister in such a situation. Suyang also noticed a paduck board on the prime minister's desk, and Suyang told the prime minister that now, due to his condition, he should not play the game anymore. After this, Suyang put his hand on the board and noticed that the board was warm, from which he concluded that the prime minister had been playing padok just recently. After this, Suyang looked at the prime minister and told him that there was no way he could help him in this case. However, Suyang told the prime minister that despite such a serious condition, he could still train him to control some processes in his body. After this, the servant told Suyang on behalf of the prime minister that despite the fact that his old body could no longer be fixed, he was still pleased that Suyang was trying so hard for his health. The servant also told Suyang on behalf of the prime minister that he was very sorry that he could not look at Suyang on his own, and he said that he would definitely follow his advice. After this, Suyang stood up and told the prime minister that he, too, hoped that the prime minister's condition would improve over time. Before leaving the prime minister's estate, Suyang told his servant that they should warm up the prime minister's room, but they should not overdo it, because this could lead to disastrous consequences. Suyang also told the prime minister's servant that it was so hot here that even the paduka board was very warm. After this, Suyang said goodbye to the prime minister and his servant, and he returned back to his estate. When Suyang returned to the palace, he told Sejong that it was almost impossible to cure the prime minister since the main cause of his illness was his natural old age. Then Sejong thought that if they had started treating the prime minister at least ten years earlier, then perhaps they could have helped him somehow. At this moment, 
Sejong only thought that if they could help the prime minister, then they could discuss and solve many more government affairs together. Sejong also began to remember the time when ten years ago he and the prime minister spent days and days solving important government problems and making important decisions. During the walk, Sejong asked Sejong how the classes of his students, whom he actively trains, were going. At that moment, Sejong remembered how quickly his students get tired. But Suyang told Sejong that he had come across very talented and capable students. After this, Sejong told Suyang that he had recently met with Kim Jong, who also believed that Suyang should develop a training system for training soldiers. Sejong also asked Suyang about his plans for the Ming Empire, and Suyang said that after traveling to Beijing, he would also like to go to Hanam, one of the cities in Jiangi province. After Suyang said that he was going to cover almost half of Beijing, he said that the initial purpose of his trip was to develop livestock farming in Joseon. Suyang believed that the pigs in Joseon were too small, and he wanted to make sure that every person in Joseon could have the opportunity to eat enough meat. Suyang also noted that one Chinese character, which means meat, is associated specifically with a pig, and in the Ming Empire it is very easy to raise and fatten the required number of pigs. However, Suyang guessed that besides animal husbandry, Suyang had other reasons to travel halfway through the Ming Empire. At this point, Suyang believed that Sejong was not very happy about his imminent trip, since Suyang would be traveling around the Ming Empire for a whole year. Then Suyang told Sejong that in addition to livestock farming, agriculture was highly developed in the Ming Empire, which allows local residents to grow a lot of different vegetables. Suyang also said that in addition to agricultural samples, Suyang also wanted to be in Nanjing where he wanted to get some books. Sejong then reminded Suyang that Nanjing was an ancient city with a very long and rich history, and he believed that there were indeed a lot of books there. However, Suyang told Sejong that he was almost completely confident that the head of Sorigama, who invited Suyang, would definitely provide him with all the necessary books. Sejong knew that Wang Jin was so powerful that even the ministers called him father thereby expressing their respect. Then Suyang said that if Wang Jin tried to provide proposals that were unfavorable for Josian, he would refuse them, but otherwise he was ready to conduct mutually beneficial cooperation with him. Afterwards, Sejong remembered that Suyang just recently had a daughter, and he wondered if Suyang had discussed his trip with his family, and Suyang said that he had discussed everything with his wife. The next morning, the ship on which Suyang was going to go to the Ming Empire sailed to the Josian Pier and the entire royal family was going to see Suyang off. Suyang's wife was very worried that she would not see her husband in the next year. But Hyun Dan was not at all upset, since due to his age he did not understand how long he would not see his father. Suyang's wife understood that her husband was carrying out matters of national importance, but she was still worried that Suyang would miss her daughter's first birthday. At this moment, Suyang began to feel a little nervous because Suyang's wife was speaking very loudly and Suyang was worried that more and more people would look at them with incomprehension. At one point, Suyang's wife began to cry in grief, and then Suyang immediately began to calm his wife down. At this moment, Suyang was so amused watching Suyang and his wife that he couldn't even contain his laughter. After this, Li Hing approached Suyang and said that while he was away from Josian, he would look after his wife and children. Suyang was very grateful to his brother for such help, and Suyang said that he couldn't wait to meet again. After this, Li Hyang jokingly told Suyang that with his departure, Suyang decided to relieve Chan Young of his job and transfer it to Li Hyang. Then Suyang laughed and remembered that this was Chan Young's first vacation in fifteen years. Sang Young then began to thank Suyang for personally asking the king to personally grant Chan Young leave. At this moment, Hyung Dan walked up to his father with a small dumbbell in his hand to show his father that he also wanted to become as strong as his father. A second later, Su Young picked up his son and lifted him up, after which he told him that when he returned home, they would train the bench press together. At one point, Su Young remembered his conversation with Sejong, who did not understand what Su Young ultimately wanted to do, since he began to devote so much time to training, animal husbandry, and other things. Suyang then told Sejong that his dream was to make Josian the strongest state so that no one could look down on Josian. Soon Suyang and his team set off, and within a few minutes Pu Suchan, who worked as the royal translator, suddenly began to sneeze non-stop. Suyang was somewhat surprised that with such a physique, Suchan managed to catch a cold, 
and such han said that he spent too much time in the cold wind such han also punished himself non-stop for catching a cold on such an important trip for suyan and all of Joseon. then suyang looked at such han and thought that during his journey he would have the opportunity to force such han to take up sports a few hours later suyang saw the coastline which indicated that they had almost arrived in the Ming Empire. Before arriving at the port, Suyang decided to ask his crew if the soap had spoiled during their departure. Then Li Ge and Park Kang, who were scientists from Chipyongjong, informed Suyang that in such weather the soap was in excellent condition. Nam Bin, who was responsible for the safety of Suyang and his team, also went with Suyang. Then Suyang said that man is the center of the world, and Suyang wanted to get to the Ming Empire as soon as possible to see for himself. After Suyang and his team descended from the ship, they saw in front of them a huge gate that covered their further path to Pyktusen. Suyang and his team were shocked by such a huge structure, and for a moment it seemed to them that such a structure could not be built by man. At this moment, Chang Song, who was one of the emperor's eunuchs, approached Suyang and his team and he was a little amused by the reaction of Suyang and his men upon seeing the gate to the city. Chang Song was supposed to accompany Suyang and his team around Pektusen and make sure that nothing happened to them during the escort. Suddenly, Li Ge asked Chang Song when they would arrive at the emperor's audience, but Chang Song said that out of the entire team, Suyang would be the only one who would be able to see the emperor in person. After this, Chan Song decided to calculate how long it would take for the emperor to personally receive Su Yang and his team, and he came to the conclusion that the emperor would receive them in forty days, which greatly surprised Such Han. Soon, several people with large bags began to come in after Su Yang, and then Chan Song suggested that this was the very goods that Su Yang wanted to transfer to the Ming Empire. Then Chan Song approached Su Yang and told him that he recently decided to try using his soap and he really liked it. Suyang thanked Chang Sung for such nice remarks and said that this soap is far from perfect. Chang Sung was also very surprised when Suyang said that he improved his soap, making its aroma even more pleasant. After that, Suyang took one of the bars of soap, showed it to Chang Sung and said that he had prepared more than 2,000 pounds of soap for the Ming Empire. Chang Sung decided to smell the soap to evaluate its smell and he was pleasantly surprised by such a pleasant combination of the aroma of flowers and ginseng. After that, Chang Sung put down the soap and told Su Yang that he was pleasantly surprised that a country like Joseon could supply such a quality product. After that, Chang Song began to look at Su Yang with a bit of whim and think that Su Yang was like a fearless general in his physique. Suddenly, unexpectedly for Su Yang, Chang Song began to touch Su Yang's shoulder, and tell him that his shoulders were as strong and wide as those of the god Viridhak. Suddenly Su Yang was shocked by Chang Sung's sudden behavior, and then Such Han politely asked Chang Sung to stop showing such disgusting behavior. Su Yang soon found himself at Emperor Jing Tong's palace to greet him in person. After the greeting, the emperor told Su Yang that he had heard that Sejong had very talented sons, and he said that he also tried using soap. The emperor said that he was amazed at how easily all the dirt came off his skin after the soap, but he was even more surprised that this soap was created by Sejong's youngest son. The emperor also told Su Yang that he was pleased that Su Yang and his team had brought 2,000 pounds of soap, and the emperor wanted to talk to Su Yang about establishing trade ties. After this, Su Yang thanked the emperor, and at that moment it seemed to Su Yang that the situation suddenly became somehow hostile and tense. After Su Yang left the emperor's palace, he noticed that the emperor's servants around him began to look at him and his team with disgust. At this point, the servants began to discuss how much the emperor's eunuchs who accompanied Su Yang and his team stank. Su Yang continued to walk along the road, trying not to think about why these people were looking at him with such disgust. Soon Su Yang and his team reached the exit, where they were met by the emperor's eunuchs, who were waiting for them. Su Yang told the eunuchs that thanks to them, he was able to meet the emperor in person, and he told the eunuchs that thanks to them, he would be able to get an audience in just ten days. Su Yang also said that their future descendants would sing about this great event. But Chang Song suddenly interrupted Su Yang and asked him if he knew who he was talking to now. Su Yang said that he had already heard rumors that Sorgam was led by a certain dying, whom ministers and officials respectfully called father. Dayan then lowered his fan slightly and told Su Yang that he admired Su Yang's intelligence. After this, a couple of eunuchs told Su Yang that they really liked the soap that Su Yang had previously sent them, 
and they were very happy when they learned that Siyang had brought a shipment of soap weighing two thousand pounds. Then the eunuchs asked Siyang how much it cost him to create this soap, and Siyang said that the price very much depended on the ingredients. Siyang said that soap with ginseng scent cost ten mali, and soap with incense cost six mali. Then Dain calculated that six hundred grams of soap costs about forty grams of silver, and then Dain asked Siyang how he produces his soap. Such Han thought that this was a very mean question on Dayan's part, since he believed that Dayan was going to steal the method of making soap and start selling it himself. However, Suyang had no problem telling Dayan that first, to make soap, the Josian people collect seaweed from Hamildo Island and begin to dry it. Then even Dayan was somewhat surprised that Suyang would so easily tell him the secret of making soap, without fear that Dayan might simply steal his recipe. However, after this, Dang told Suyang that the emperor had recently imposed a ban on the extraction of sea products, due to which they could not independently obtain seaweed and dry it to make soap. It was for this reason that the Ming Empire had to ask Josian to supply them with soap, which greatly reassured Su Han. Then Dain asked Suyang if it would be possible to increase the production rate of new batches of fragrant soap for their further delivery to the Ming Empire. Then Suyang asked Dain how much soap the empire needed and Dayan said that six tons of soap needed to be brought to the empire, which amazed Suyang very much. Dayan also demanded that despite the increase in production, the quality must be equally high, and even the eunuchs found this to be very difficult. After that, Dayan removed the fan from his face and told Suyang that when concluding a contract, representatives of different parties must look each other in the face. Dayan closed his fan, showed his face to Suyang, and introduced himself as Wang Jin, the eunuch of Soragama. After this, Wang Jin told Suyang that their deal was successful, and then he offered his help to Suyang in whatever he needed. Suyang told Wang Jin that he had come to the Ming Empire to bring them their products. Then Wang Jin asked Suyang if he could bring a batch of soap to the empire if Wang Jin gave him two tons of silver. At one moment, Suyang and Such Han could not believe that Wang Jin could give them two tons of silver right now. Then Suyang thought that he should not think about silver since he believed that soon crops and livestock would be much more valuable than silver. After his thoughts, Suyang told Wang Jin that Josian would do everything possible to bring more soap to the empire. Wang Jin then told Suyang and his team that he would do everything possible to make their trip as pleasant as possible, after which Wang Jin and his eunuchs left the grounds of the emperor's palace. Once Wang Jin and the rest of the eunuchs left, such Han told Suyang that he probably understood why the eunuchs were actually so interested in fragrant soap. Such Khan told Suyang that in the empire, eunuchs are completely deprived of their male sexual organ, which shocked Suyang very much. Such Khan also said that because of this, the eunuchs cannot control the process of urination, which is why the eunuchs always had a very strong and disgusting smell. It was at this moment that Suyang realized why the eunuchs were so interested in supplying soap to the empire. After Suyang and his team left the territory of the emperor's palace, a luxurious carriage drove up to them. Soon three people got out of the carriage, who were just looking for Suyang and his team. Then one of the people who got out of the carriage told Suyang and his team that Wang Jin himself had told him to personally ensure that Suyang and his team's journey was as pleasant as possible. At that moment, Suyang and his comrades saw in front of them a luxurious cart, which was very similar to the cart that the emperor's son himself rode. Suyang could not believe that he was actually allowed to use this cart, to which the imperial servant told Suyang that the emperor's son's cart was twice as large, and that Suyang had nothing to worry about. Soon, Suyang and his group boarded the carriage, and everyone was amazed that this carriage could travel at 37 miles per hour so easily. However, due to the high speed and dusty road, a lot of dust got into the cart, which made it very difficult for Suyang and his group to breathe. At this moment, Suyan thought that roads with special coating began to be produced only in the 20th century, if we do not take into account the roads that were made in ancient Rome. During the ride, Suyang decided not to waste his time and he decided to start training his legs by leaning his back against the wall of the cart and holding his legs in one position. Tired, Xing Chu did not understand what Suyang was doing, and he decided to ask him what he was doing now. Suyang told Xing Chu that respect for one's ancestors is expressed in the fact that a person should not feel sorry for himself, 
and give himself concessions. Suyang also told Xing Chu that a person should never neglect the body that his parents gave him. Suyang also drew Xing Chu's attention to how large and noticeable his belly fat was. Especially unpleasant for Suyang to look at Xing Chu's third chin, which also appeared due to excess weight. Besides, Suyang noticed that it was so difficult for Xing Chu to walk that after taking just a few steps, he immediately began to sweat heavily. Xin Chu could not say anything in his own defense, since he himself understood perfectly well that everything that Suyang said about him was true. However, Suyang told Xing Chu that despite his grave condition, he could help him. Suyang told Xing Chu that they had to travel another 380 miles before they reached Chang'an, and they would cover this distance by cart in only 12 days. Then Suyang suggested that Xing Chu spend these 12 days to the benefit of his body in order to at least get him in shape a little. Sin Chu understood that he would not be able to refuse Suyang, and he also understood that for him this would be the most difficult twelve days of his life. After twelve days, Suyang and his group arrived in Chang'an, and during this time, Xing Chu actually managed to lose some of his excess weight. Suyang was very grateful to the imperial servant for his help, to which the servant himself said that he was just doing his job. Soon, Suyang was approached by one of the high-ranking officials of Chang'an, who was very happy to see Suyang and his group. This official believed that Suyang and his group had come a long way to get here, and then he invited Suyang and his group to relax with a meal. Soon, the official escorted Suyang and his group to one of the most luxurious and expensive restaurants, which is visited exclusively by officials or representatives of the imperial family. First of all, Suyang and his group were given portions of unusual noodles, which contained a lot of meat, vegetables, and some spices. However, once Suyang decided to examine the noodles, he noticed that the noodles were somewhat similar in appearance to potato skins. Then one of the scientists from Suyang's group said that this is not just noodles, but traditional doxiamin, the recipe for which was invented during the Yuan dynasty. After everyone had finished their noodles, the table was served with assorted meats, which included pork and beef. One of the scientists from Suyang's group decided to try the meat first, and he thought that the pork was very tasty, while the beef just tasted terrible. After tasting the meat, the scientist said that the beef tasted so bad that it would seem that the cow used for the dish had suffered from improper feeding. While this scientist was describing the taste of beef, Suyang noticed the evil and intimidating look of one of the cooks who was watching Suyang and his group eat. However, despite such an unpleasant taste of beef, the cold cuts seemed very tasty to him, after which the rest of the guests also began to eat. As the evening progressed, more and more different dishes appeared on the table, which Suyang and his group ate with pleasure, praising the chef's efforts. Meanwhile, one of the eunuchs arrived to Wang Jin to tell him about how Suyang and his group reached Chang'an. Jin also learned from this eunuch that the officials of Chang'an showed utmost cordiality and hospitality to the guests and that they asked Wang Jin to personally speak with the emperor about their partnership. After this eunuch told Wang Jin everything, he decided to ask him what was the reason that Wang Jin cared so much about commoners like Suyang and his group. At that moment, Wang Jin took one Liang in his hand and told the eunuch that he once had to become a eunuch, since until that moment, he had nothing that would help him survive. After Wang Jin finally became an influential eunuch, he wanted to achieve such greatness with which he could give people what they really needed. At this moment, Wang Jin briefly looked at his face in the reflection of the Liang, after which he simply threw the Liang out the window. At this moment, Wang Jin wanted more and more every second to see what the second son of King Joseon could do. The next day, the farmers of Chang'an showed Suyang and his group the pigs they were keeping for their sustenance. Suyang was pleasantly surprised at how large the pigs were in Chang'an as they were almost the same size as the wild boars he had previously hunted. The farmer also told Sien that their pigs could reach a weight of more than 200 kyns in two years. Then Suyang asked the farmer to cut one piece weighing 1 kyn from the pig to ensure the quality of the meat. Since you told Suyang that he didn't fully understand why they should worry about the quality of the pork, since he believed that even if they just brought the pig to Joseon, it would be in great demand. Suyang told Xin Chu that if they brought different types of pigs to Joseon, the pigs might have their blood shifted, causing the subsequent offspring of those pigs to not be as useful as they could be. After a couple of minutes, a small piece of meat was cut from one of the pigs so that Suyang and his team could evaluate the quality of the meat. Soon Suyang and his group arrived in the city of Luoyang, 
whose population was comparable to that of Beijing. Walking the streets of Luoyang Suyang and Xin Chu turned their attention to a local man who was selling some pills. Xin Chu heard the man saying something about Josian, but due to the large crowd of people, he could not hear the man. Xin Chu listened and heard the man telling people that if they bought his pills from him, they would become as strong as Suyang. As Zisi si Han was greatly outraged by how this vile man was using his ginseng pills and the name of Prince Suyang to make as much money as possible from naive people. Xing Chu was also outraged by the fact that this man claims that Suyang himself gave him these pills, while they did not bring any miracle pills. However, this news not only did not anger Suyang, but also made him very happy, as he was pleased to realize that in just a month of his stay in the Ming Dynasty, Rumors were already beginning to spread about him. After this, Suyang immediately took off all his outer clothing to show off his strong body to the locals. Sin Chu was afraid that Suyang's actions might lead to unpleasant consequences, and he asked him not to do anything stupid. Suyang then calmed down Xing Chu by telling him that he did not want to ruin his father's good name, and that he just wanted to show people his muscles. At this point, the man began to assure people that if they ate a hundred of his pills, they would immediately become incredibly strong, and that Suyang himself gave him these pills. After this, a large man stood next to the pill seller, and the seller told people that this man ate fifty of his pills, which immediately gave him such a strong body. At the same moment, the seller was shocked when a man with large muscles began to approach him. The people next to Suyang looked at him and couldn't believe that a person could actually have such a physique. The pill seller told Suyang that he was willing to give him fifty of his pills, to which Suyang told the seller that he didn't need his pills at all. After that, Suyang told the pill seller and his partner that he could easily defeat this big man, and then the seller realized that Suyang would now bring them to light. Suyang also told the seller that he was surprised that he did not recognize him as Prince Suyang, who, according to the seller, provided him with these pills. At this moment, the seller could not contain his anger and then he asked Suyang who he was and why should he suddenly recognize him. Then Suyang tensed his muscles as hard as possible, and told the pill seller that he was the same Prince Suyang from Josian, which scared the seller very much. The pill seller was at a loss, and then he told his assistant to try to defeat Suyang. A second later, Suyang and the pill seller's partner began to fight against each other, hoping to knock their opponent to the ground. Even though the pill seller's partner was much larger than Suyang, he began to quickly lose strength, and he could not understand how this was even possible. After a couple of seconds, Suyang knocked the pill seller's partner to the ground and told him that this was possible due to the fact that his muscles were many times stronger. After the fight, Suyang told the pill seller's partner that he must first learn to lift a thousand ky in weights in three basic exercises, and only then can he fight him again. At that moment, the pill seller and his partner realized that they had made a big mistake after which they immediately ran away. After the pill seller and his partner escaped, Suyang strained his muscles as hard as possible to show the locals what Josian muscle strength was all about. In addition to the local residents, one old man began to stare at Suyang, who immediately took out his ink and paper and began to draw the image of Suyang on paper. The old man needed to create a new Buddha statue for Long An, and he decided that Suyang's image would be suitable as an image for the statue. After a couple of minutes, Suyang finished showing off his muscles to the locals, and soon the rest of his group, who had been looking for Suyang and Xing Chu for a long time, came running to him. However, Suyang said that it was too early to decide which pigs they would take to Josian, and he decided to find out what his partners could find out. Then one of Suyang's partners took out several books and said that perhaps these old books could be useful to them in Josian. Suyang's second partner showed the seeds of some varieties of food plants. But this partner was afraid that these seeds would not be able to grow in Josian. Suyang was very happy to see what his partners were able to get, and he was especially surprised by the books, which turned out to be a new chronicle of beach. At that moment, one of Suyang's partners looked at him and saw the difference between a warrior and a civil servant, trying to understand why these books attracted Suyang's attention so much. Suddenly Suyang turned his attention to a book about General Han Xing from the time of the Chu Kingdom and this partner immediately wanted to familiarize himself with this book. Soon Suyang and his group were able to find everything they were looking for, and Suyang decided that they should move on. A few days later, Suyang and his team arrived at the Hongzhe Pier, where for the first time in their lives they saw a turtle ship, 
which the Chinese were very proud of. At that time, the turtle ship was the largest ship in the world, and in the entire Ming Empire there was only one such ship, which was used in expeditions under the command of the eunuch Chanhua. Seeing this ship, Suyang decided that when he was in Nanjing, where this ship was created, he would definitely visit the shipyard where this ship was designed and built. At that moment, Xin Chu turned to Suyang and told him that three whole months had passed since they left Zhou and Suyang said that he already missed Zhou and his family. Meanwhile in Zhou Zian, Sejong summoned Li Hyang to discuss with him the issue of creating firearms. Li Hyang informed Sejong that he and his best forges in Zhou were successfully working on the creation of firearms hoping that their warriors would soon use them for military purposes. Sejong was a little worried that this weapon was only used to intimidate the enemy, and he hoped that this weapon would make their army stronger. Li Hyang reassured his father and told him that he had decided to make this weapon a little longer. Li Hyang explained to his father that he decided to do this so that the warriors could inflict damage on the enemy from an even greater distance. However, at that moment Sejong remembered an incident in which a man in the north was shot with a similar weapon, and the next day he woke up unharmed. Then Li Hyang told Sejong that at that time they used arrows that could not penetrate the defense of this warrior. However, Li Hyang decided to use lead bullets as projectiles, which can easily penetrate the enemy's defense and cause significant damage to him. Hyang also said that he and his blacksmiths are trying to find new uses for the molds that Sejong used to create his barbell. Meanwhile, one of the government employees named Tae Ho Gun was in a local bar drinking sake. Previously, Ho Gun waited for a long time for the moment when he would be on vacation. But even when he received his vacation, he could not forget about Sejong. A man bringing him a drink passed by the table where Ho Gun was sitting, and he thought that Ho Gun was talking to him. However, a second later, the man saw a small homemade doll on Ho Gong's desk that he was talking to. Soon Ho Gong drank so much booze that he began to imagine this homemade doll talking to him. Soon another bar worker passed by Ho Gun's table, and he asked him for what purpose he came to their establishment, to which Ho Gun only asked the worker to bring him fried fish. Soon a plate of fried fish appeared on Ho Gong's table, which looked very appetizing, and Ho Gong immediately began to eat. However, as soon as Ho Gong tried the fish, he thought that the fish had spoiled slightly, and then the worker said that he would now bring Ho Gong's salad instead of fish. At this point, Hu Gong believed that he could solve the problem of spoiled fish so that it would last longer. Then Hu Gong remembered how Siyang created an apparatus for producing alcohol, which was first used to treat wounds. Then Ho Gun asked the bar worker how long ago this fish had been caught, to which the bar worker said that it had lain at the bottom of the boat for two whole days after which it was cooked. Then Ho Gong thought that if you rip open the belly of the fish, take out all the insides and immediately salt it, then such fish will be fresh for another two whole weeks. Soon Ho Gun left the bar and went fishing with the local fishermen. This time, the fishermen used a special water-lifting device, with which they caught much more fish than the fishermen had caught before. After the fishermen caught the required amount of fish, Ho Gong ordered them to lay out all the fish, cut the belly of all the fish, clean the fish from the entrails and immediately salt it. This time, Hu Gong used the same operating mechanism for his device that Siyan used for his overhead pulley machine. When the fishermen cleaned all the fish from the entrails, Hu Gong told them that if they did everything correctly, the fish would be suitable for consumption for another two whole weeks after it was caught. The fishermen were also very surprised at how many fish they were able to catch in such a short period of time. One of the fishermen told Ho Gong that before the ship could be overloaded with just a hundred fish caught, but now they can easily catch and take away more than a thousand fish. Ho Gun said that as the catch increases, the required area for storing fish will also increase, and with proper distribution, the amount of fresh fish for all of Josian can be significantly increased. However, at this moment, Hu Gong believed that if they had a boat to go out to the open sea, they could catch even more fish. Meanwhile, Suyang's ambassadors told Mai Lu to come to the royal palace to receive the royal decree. The ambassadors informed Ma Iao that the first training ground would soon be established in Josian, and Suyang wanted Ma Iao to be one of the first people to train the newcomers. Ma Iao was shocked when he learned that he would have to train a group of twenty candidates, each of whom was a member of one or another noble family. Ma Iao also learned that these candidates had failed the official rank exam, and Ma Iao felt that this would make his task much more difficult. A month after the start of training, exhausted and exhausted from training, 
Ma'ayal began to remember with warmth in his soul the days when he trained with Siyang. At this moment, Sang Gong arrived to Ma'ayal, who clearly saw how Ma'ayal realized how difficult it was for Siyang to train him. Sang Gong was also one of the trainers at the new training ground, and the students happily listened to Sang Gong and did whatever he told them. However, when Ma'ayal tried to teach his students, no one listened to him or took him seriously. Sang Gong also said that if these students failed to master their lessons, they would be urgently sent to Hamgildo, and judging by their behavior, they simply did not realize what awaited them if they failed. At this moment, Ma'ilu felt a little sorry for his students, since they do not know what will happen to them if they do not listen to him, and he began to think about how to make his students listen to him. At this moment, Li Hiang arrived at the training ground to personally make sure that if Ma'ilu's students did not listen to him, they would be sent to Hamgildo. Ma Ail looked at Li Hyang and couldn't believe that Sejong's eldest son was able to pump up his muscles so much. Then Li Hyang suggested moving on to practical training for students since they refused to listen to theory. At this point, Ma Ail apologized to Sang Gong and told him that he could no longer watch the common people suffer. Then Li Hyang told Ma Ail that those people who lack perseverance in training need to take up the barbell to strengthen their will. The next day, Ma Ayal had his students lift heavy weights while asking the students various questions about training their bodies. Ma Ayal asked questions to one of his students, but this student could not answer a single question from Ma Ayal, which made Ma Ayal very upset. Ma Ayal decided that if his student could not answer his question, then he needed to increase the weight of the student's barbell, and then Ma Ayal ordered another pancake to be hung on the student's barbell. Before Ma Ayal increased the weight of the barbell, his student told Ma Ayal that he now understood well what Ma Ayal had told him. At this moment, Ma Ayal believed that the level of understanding and talkativeness directly depended on the weight of his barbell, and then Ma Ayal threw another pancake onto his student's barbell. At this moment, one of the students tried to support his friend, telling him that he would definitely endure this torment. At this moment, this student was struggling to hold the barbell and he thought that he would not be the only student who would have to endure this. This student believed that not only he, but also other students who would be here after him would also know all this pain, and since then this method of teaching was called the teachings to which Iron provides answers. Closer to April, Su Young and his group arrived in Nanjing, and when Su Young found himself in this city for the first time, he believed that this city had almost the same crowd of people as in Beijing. Walking through the streets of Nanjing, one of Su Young's partners noticed that local residents had already begun to sell cucumbers, while in Joseon at that time they were just beginning to harvest rice. Then Su Young believed that growing and selling various vegetables was many times more profitable than selling rice alone. The fact is that after the invasion of the army of red turbans and the attack of Japanese pirates, the lands of Joseon were devastated, and Joseon had no choice but to grow rice. However, despite Joseon's current position in the food industry, Su Young believed that Joseon would soon also grow a variety of vegetables, both for local residents and for sale. Soon, Su Young and his group went to Gangnam, and they decided that this was a great opportunity to try various local dishes, so they went to one of the local restaurants. As soon as Su Young and his group arrived at the restaurant, they sat down at one of the tables and asked its owners to prepare something special for them throwing a couple of silver liangs on the table. The restaurant owners were shocked as it was the first time they had seen one of their customers give them such a generous payment, so they immediately went to the kitchen to prepare food for Su Yang and his group. First of all, Su Yan and his group were brought several portions of fried carp in a creamy sauce, and if you touch the head of this fish, it will immediately jump. After Su Yang and his group ate their carp, they were immediately served roasted pig, and the restaurant owners even completely deboned it. After Su Yang and his group ate roasted pig, they were brought sea turtle soup. Su Yen and his group were very well fed and they all enjoyed the food that was prepared for them. The owners of the restaurant were very tired while preparing all these delicious dishes, but they were sure that all their efforts were worth the income they received today. After a hearty meal, Su Yang decided that it was time to meet with a very important person. After the meal, Su Yang and his group went to the Joseon shipyard in Nanjing to meet the man who created the turtle ship. Su Yang soon met with Ban Kil Ju, who created the turtle ship, to ask him some questions about his profession. Kil Ju did not recognize Su Yang, and he believed that new porters had arrived to load and unload the ship with various items for export. However, Su Yang told Kil Ju that he was the prince of Joseon 
and Kil Ju immediately apologized to him for his words. Kil believed that he had almost committed a terrible crime, to which Su Young only asked Kil Ju about creating a vessel for the eunuch Chan Hua. Then Kil Shu told Su Young about how he created this huge and majestic ship, which he set sail. Kil Shu also said that this ship was his last achievement, since they soon stopped conducting expeditions, which is why the demand for such ships has dropped significantly. After this, Kil Shu began to create ordinary merchant ships in order to continue to earn his living. After this, Kil Ju, with resentment in his voice, said that for a master like him, there is nothing more important than striving for grandiose achievements in his business. Su Young listened carefully to Kil Shu, after which he asked him what other ships were created under his leadership. Kil Ju then spoke about how, in addition to the turtle ship, he also created a ship like Guisong, which was also famous in Joseon. Su Young then asked Kil Shu if he would like to start designing new majestic ships again, since he believed that Kil Shu was wasting his talents here. Kil Ju bowed down to Su Young and thanked him for inviting him to go to Joseon and build his ships there. Kil Ju believed that for a real man, nothing is more important than creating ships to conquer the vast oceans, and he believed that in Joseon he would create smaller ships. At that moment, Su Young realized that all masters of their craft were exactly the same, after which he put his hand under his robe. After a couple of seconds, Su Young showed Kil Shu a diagram of a ship that had only one sail and a few oars, and Kil Shu believed that it was an ordinary fishing boat. A little later, Kil Ju turned his attention to the lifting mechanism, and he asked Su Young what it was and what it was intended for. Then Su Young told Kil Ju that thanks to this mechanism it would be possible to raise a catch that would be four times larger than what could fit on a similar boat. Kil Ju thought that this was a great idea, since only one mast would be needed to raise one such catch. Ju then told Su Young that he was unlikely to be able to recreate such a boat, but he could still figure out how to design the individual parts of the boat. Then Su Young told Kil Ju that if the small boat of one master can surpass the large boat of another master, then this indicates the true skill of the first master. Su Young told Kil Ju that he could think about his proposal for the next ten days until they returned to Joseon, after which Su Young and his group moved on. Soon Su Young and his group went to one of the farms in Nanjing to evaluate the local vegetables. Su Yen and his group really liked the cabbage that grows here since it was not only very large, but also very tasty, and if you pickle it, you can eat it all winter. Su Young also believed that this cabbage was a very distant relative of the cabbage that he ate in a past life. After this, Su Young turned to the owner of this farm to buy some seeds of this cabbage from him. The owner of this farm immediately brought Su Young and his group several bags of seeds from his cabbage, after which Su Young and his group moved on. Soon Su Young went to another farm where pigs were raised and Su Young wanted to ask the owner of the farm about his pigs. Then the farm owner said that his pigs could gain more than 240 kyn in weight in less than a year, while pigs in Joseon could only gain 70 kyn in two years. Then Su Young told the farm owner that he would like to buy a hundred of his pigs from him, to which the farm owner said that this would be very difficult. However, Su Young was ready to pay any price for these pigs, after which he took out a lot of silver liang from his savings. After some trading, the farm owner was going to give Su Yen a hundred pigs, including twenty males and eighty females. That evening, Su Young realized that he had done everything he wanted to do during his journey, and he decided that his journey was coming to an end and that it was time for him to return to Joseon. Su Young also had almost no Liang left, which Wang Jin had given to him, but he believed that this amount could easily be obtained from further soap exports. At this moment, Xin Chu arrived at Suyang to inform him of the arrival of Bang Kil Ju, who nevertheless decided to go to Joseon with his group. This news made Suyang happy, and he decided that it was time to return to Joseon. Before setting sail, Suyang decided to make sure that his servants transferred all the things to the ship, which also included more than 400 books. Suyang was a little worried that due to the large number of books, it would be very difficult to fit them on the ship with the people. At this moment, Xin Chu began to wonder how Joseon would react to everything that they brought from the Ming Empire, to which Su Yang said that there would definitely be a large number of people in Jipianjiang. After some time, one of Sejong's ambassadors wanted to inform him about some sudden misfortune. The ambassador informed Sejong that there was now great unrest in Wach due to one sudden incident. Sejong was somewhat disappointed that he was distracted at this very moment, since he was currently trying to break the deadlift record. At first, the ambassador informed Sejong that Su Yang had returned to Joseon, 
which made Sejong very happy, but he did not understand how this was related to the incident in Watch. Then the ambassador told Sejong that all the chaos began to happen because of the escaped pigs. Hearing this, Sejong told his ambassador that there was no need to create such a strong panic over a small pile of piglets. However, the ambassador told Sejong that the escaped pigs weighed at least 240 kyan, which greatly surprised Sejong himself. Meanwhile, the guards tried to catch and calm the escaped pigs, and they were amazed that each pig weighed almost as much as one adult and well-fed boar. The pigs were so large that one pig could easily frighten not only the guard on the horse, but also the horse itself. Also, these pigs were so large and aggressive that they could also attack a person. However, when one of the pigs tried to attack one of the guards, someone managed to grab the pig right by the tail and stop it. Suyen appeared with his group, who were able to catch and stop several pigs at once. Soon, Suyang and his group finally managed to calm the angry pigs and bring them to the Josian farm. Sijong looked at these pigs and thought that in their temperament, and aggression they were more reminiscent of wild animals. At this point, Sejong handed one of the pigs some food to feed and calm it down. Sejong believed that these pigs had come a very long way to end up in Josian, and he decided to show the pigs that they had nothing to fear. After a second, this pig calmed down and began to eat food from Sejong's hands. After Sejong fed the pigs, he believed that due to their size, they would not have to worry about meat shortages in Josian. At this moment, the pigs began to grunt together and cheerfully thinking that Sejong did not pose any threat to them. However, at the same moment, Sejong said that tonight the chefs would cook the most plump pig for dinner. After that, Sejong and Siyang left the pig farm, and Siyang informed his father that he also brought many books since many books from Jipyangjiang were lost. Sejong told Siyang that he had done a lot for Josian, and he could ask Sejong for any reward without any problem to which Suyang said that he realized something during his journey. Suyang believed that if they used the same farming methods as in the Ming Empire, it would have a positive effect on the nutrition of all Josian residents. After this, Suyang introduced Sejong to kill Ju, who would now reside in Josian and create his own ships for him. Sejong promised kill Ju that he would provide him with all the conditions for a comfortable stay in Josian, for which kill Ju was very grateful to Sejong. After that, Suyang went to the new training ground, where Ma Il and his students were already waiting for him. The first thing Suyang did was praise Ma Il for doing his job so well. In response to this, Ma Il said that being a teacher is much more difficult than being a student. Ma Il also said that training is only a teaching about honoring one's parents, since a person's origin does not affect anything, and Suyang believed that the students did not listen to Ma Il. At this moment, Suyang looked at one of the weights that was standing near the entrance to the training ground, and he decided to apply a slightly different method of training to Ma Il's students. After this, Suyang told Ma Il's students that they would now do CrossFit to add some variety to their training. Suyang then suggested that Ma Il's students switch between several types of exercises to relieve them of depressing thoughts. First, Suyang decided to tell his students about an exercise called burby which he himself invented during his travels through the Ming Empire. Suyang also suggested that the students perform several jumps over a log after the burby. Besides, Suyang decided that the students should try performing arm swings with a 20 kyan kettlebell. After swinging their arms, students should perform several squats without additional weight. The students noticed that in these exercises they would not have to lift weights, and they were happy about these exercises. Suyang also told the students that if they could complete each of these exercises for two sets, then they could finish their training for the day. At this moment, Suyang looked at the joyful faces of the students and believed that a strong hurricane would soon begin. But the students did not understand what Suyang meant by the hurricane. After just a couple of exercises, the students began to get very tired and feel severe muscle pain. At this moment, Suyang observed one of the students, who began to complain that he was going to throw up due to extreme fatigue. In response to this, Suyang told this student that he should not hold back his urge to vomit, and that he urgently needed to vomit, after which he should continue to train. The students decided that this training would be the most difficult training they had ever done. After six months of training, Suyang told the students to familiarize themselves with some books and focus on their teachings. Suyang believed that even six months later, the students still had the same poor physical preparation, and he believed that they should invest their energy in something useful and necessary. However, the students, exhausted and badly battered by training, 
did not understand how they could read books in such a difficult condition. Then Su Young showed the students Ma Ila and San Gong, who were able to become so strong through training and reading books. After training, Su Young went to Jipyongjiang to study with his brothers the new books he had brought from the Ming Empire. Yan Pyong, who was Su Jong's youngest son, was amazed that Su Young was able to bring Cho Su Riang's manuscripts to Joseon. Su Young also told Pyong that he was also able to get Ouyang's work Xunya and Yan Jinqing and Pyong couldn't wait to read all these books as soon as possible. Li Hyang looked at the happy Pyong and thought that he would also want to become an imperial ambassador like Su Young. Pyong told Li Hyang that he would really like to visit the lands of the Ming Empire. Pyong also said that their mother and father were pleased with the results of Su Young's journey, and they asked Pyong if he would like to go on a similar trip next time. At this moment, Pyong turned to face his older brothers and he noticed that they had a very unusual expression on their faces. Su Young then told Pion that Xin Chu's physique had changed greatly during his journey, while Pion had an extremely weak physique. Li Qian also added that this kind of travel requires good endurance and physical fitness. In response to this, Pyong said that his arms were so weak that he could not lift the kind of pile of iron that they lift during training. Then Su Young invited Li Hyang to start training Pion together and Li Hyang said that he would be happy to help Pion pump up his muscles. Pion told his brothers that there was no need to train him, but Su Yang and Li Hyang insisted on training with Pyong. Meanwhile, one of the imperial blacksmiths was able to create his own firearms, and Li Hyang wanted to test it in action. This firearm was very similar to a regular metal pole wrapped in rope, and in the middle of this pole there was a small lever that, when pressed, fired a shot. As soon as Li Hyang pulled the trigger, a special mechanism was activated, thanks to which a small lead projectile flew out of the muzzle at high speed. Li Hyang said that such a weapon could easily penetrate leather armor at long range and penetrate iron armor at close range. All this was observed by one of Wang Jin's spies, who wrote down on paper everything he learned. Meanwhile, one of Wang Jin's ambassadors reported that their spy had no problems completing his mission at the moment. Wang Jin also noticed that Prince Suyam was a very smart, an inventive person. After this, Wang Jin told the ambassador that he would pay him five liang if he described in his letter as many details as possible about Su Yang's new inventions. Jin also told the ambassador that he would give him additional liang, the number of which would depend on how thoroughly his spy sketched and described Su Yang's new inventions. At that moment, Li Hyang told Su Yang that in order to neutralize the enemy with such a weapon, a warrior only needs to be 180 meters away from the target. After that, Li Hyang showed how to hold the weapon on the shoulder while firing. You can also try holding this weapon with your chin to improve the weapon's accuracy, but it will be difficult for an untrained warrior to hold it in this position. Then Li Hyang decided to hold the weapon between his hand and his side so that it would not move in any way. Su Yang looked at this weapon and thought that it was ahead of its time since such weapons appeared only during the reign of the Sianzhou dynasty. Su Yang also believed that such weapons could be useful during sieges or assaults. Li Hyang said that he did not intend these weapons for siege use, since he created them for palace guards. Then Su Yang told Li Hyang that this weapon was not suitable for close combat. First, Su Yang fired another shot, after which he became convinced that this weapon could indeed easily pierce both wood and iron. However, despite the penetrating ability of the weapon, it had some problems with accuracy, since this weapon was extremely inconvenient to aim, and the projectile could fly past the target. Li Hyang considered that an ordinary soldier might indeed have problems with this weapon, and he considered that he would have to reduce the size and penetrating power of the weapon. After this, Li Hyang tried to understand how to improve the accuracy of the weapon, and he decided to ask Su Yang how one could learn to aim with this weapon. At this moment, Su Yang wanted to understand how to aim this weapon but he heard the rustling of a spy in the bushes, which distracted him from his thoughts. At first, Su Yen tried to understand what made this rustling noise, but after a couple of seconds he decided that it was just his imagination. After this, Su Yan went to one of his partners, with whom he traveled throughout the Ming Empire, and at the moment he was improving his crossbow. At this moment, Su Yen's partner was just improving his crossbow, and he wanted to show the result of his work to Su Yan. Su Yan wanted to show Li Hyang, Using the example of a crossbow, what exactly was the problem with his new weapon? First, Su Yang takes good aim with the crossbow before firing. A second after the shot, the arrow flew right to the point at which Su Yan was aiming. At this moment, 
Li Hyang understood exactly how to solve the problem of the accuracy of his firearms. Then Su Young explained that the accuracy of the shot would greatly increase if the eye and the weapon were at the same level. Su Yen also considered that if the shooter aimed with one hand, it would be difficult for him to light the fuse of the gun to fire. In addition, the enemy will have enough time to approach the warrior and neutralize him even before the warrior has time to fire a shot. Then Li Hing believed that if they managed to combine his firearms with Su Young's partner's crossbow, they would be able to create an excellent weapon. After this, Su Young apologized to his partner for having to postpone the idea of his crossbow to which his partner said that he would be happy to help Su Yang and Li Hyang improve their weapons. Su Yen believed that after a few shots the warrior would lose strength to fire further shots and injure his face. Then Su Yang's partner suggested stretching a wooden beam and attaching it to the shoulder, which Li Hyang said that in this case, the helmet could be damaged, and that the direction and location of the smoke should be changed. Hyang also suggested attaching a dagger to the end of the barrel in case the enemy was too close. Three months later Su Yang and Li Hyang had finished designing their first prototype firearm, and they wanted to show it in action. Si Zhong was eager to see the results of his son's work in practice. Before Su Yang and Li Hyang demonstrated the performance of their weapons, Su Zhong ordered all the military officials to gather in the palace so that they too could evaluate their work. Soon all the military officials arrived at the demonstration, and Li Hyang ordered one of the soldiers to prepare the weapon for testing. First, the soldier poured some gunpowder into the gun and pushed it as deep into the barrel as possible, after which he put one shell into the barrel of the gun. Military officials looked at how Hyang was preparing to fire the first shot and they felt that such preparation for one shot was too loud. Also, military officials believed that these shooters lacked combat experience and discipline. Meanwhile, the soldier completed his training, and Li Hyang ordered him to shoot at the target. At that moment, the soldier took aim and pulled the trigger, after which a small projectile flew out of the gun. After the shot, another soldier approached the target to check where the first soldier hit, and his shell hit almost the center of the target. However, after the shot, the military officials immediately began to laugh due to the fact that this soldier spent so much time on just one shot. At this point, many military officials felt that such weapons took too long to hit the enemy, and they did not understand where the gun could be used. However, one military official said that in order to have any impact on the enemy, soldiers would need at least ten of their conventional weapons, while this gun could easily penetrate the enemy's defenses. After this, a second prototype of a firearm was brought to the palace, which was designed for an even longer attack radius. As soon as the second warrior raised his gun, the military officials immediately became afraid, since they believed that if this gun was larger than the previous one, then its shells could cause even more heavy damage. Meanwhile, the soldier managed to fire a second gun, the shot of which was even louder than the shot of the previous gun. Even though the soldier was standing further away from the target when the second shot was fired, the shell hit approximately the same point as the previous soldier. Despite the fact that this gun fired further, military officials believed that this gun would have to be reloaded for a long time, since in the same time you could shoot three arrows from a bow. Military officials also began to joke that this gun was only intended to start running away from the enemy immediately after the first shot. After the soldiers demonstrated the second gun, Sejong asked Li Hyang to approach him to ask him some questions about his invention. The first thing Sejong said was that it was difficult for him to consider these guns to be at least somehow useful, since both of these guns were much inferior to the bow and speed. Then Sejong asked Li Hyang to explain to him what exactly these guns were intended for. Li Hyang told his father that the first gun was a replacement for the bow, since in order to learn how to shoot a bow, you need to spend more than ten years of training. Meanwhile, in order to learn how to shoot a gun, you only need to study for two weeks, which surprised Sejong very much. At this moment, Sejong considered that in two weeks a person could hardly learn to hold a bow correctly, and in order to learn to shoot accurately, a warrior would have to spend more than a year on training. At the same moment, Li Hyang said that he had now shown the shooting skills of those warriors who had trained for two weeks and now he wanted to show what could be learned over a longer period of training. At this point, several warriors came out who had been learning to shoot a gun for more than two months. After just a couple of seconds, experienced and trained shooters prepared to fire their weapons. As soon as Li Hyang gave the soldiers the order to shoot, all the soldiers fired several shots at once. After the soldiers ran out of shells, Li Hyang calculated that almost all the soldiers were able to successfully hit the target 
being at a distance of 40 meters from the target. At this point, military officials calculated that if they were shooting at that distance with a bow, only three out of ten archers would be able to hit the target at that distance. Afterwards, Sejong liked the way these experienced marksmen showed off their gun shooting skills. Then Li Hyang told Sejong that even an ordinary person, after two months of practice shooting with a gun, could compare with experienced archers in accuracy and speed of fire. After this, Sejong arrived, carrying with him a large cannon that had all the best features of the first two prototype firearms. As soon as military officials saw the third prototype firearm, they decided that it was just a regular gun. Sejong became interested in what this gun fired, to which Sejong said that this firearm uses special buckshot as projectiles, which are used in shotguns. Soon Sejong prepared to fire the third gun, and at the moment of the shot there was a very loud sound from which one could easily damage one's hearing and go deaf. The force of the projectile was so strong that this gun easily destroyed one of the targets. Sejong was amazed at the force of the shot, and he decided that with such a weapon, Joseon could become the strongest state. Li Hyang was very pleased to hear such praiseworthy words from his father about his invention. Meanwhile, one of Wang Jin's ambassadors arrived to his ruler to inform him that the people of Joseon had already mastered various types of firearms. At first, the ambassador wanted to tell his spy to copy the drawings of the firearm, to which Wang Jin said that they were unlikely to be able to obtain accurate drawings of such a complex device. Wang Jin then decided that the best way to understand the mechanics of the firearm would be to get his hands on one of the prototypes and further study its operation. After demonstrating the new type of weapon, Sejong told Siyang that despite all the advantages of firearms, they might have problems mass-producing them. Sejong also told Siyang that he had received a letter from the Ming Empire, in which the emperor expressed his concern about the appearance of a completely new invention in Joseon. Also in this letter, the emperor demanded that samples of the invention of Li Hyang and Siyang be sent to him to the Ming Empire as a sign of his respect, and Sejong believed that the emperor wanted to receive their new weapon. At this point, Suyang became interested in how the Ming Dynasty Emperor knew about their invention, and he decided that if he only demanded samples, then we could be talking about any other invention of theirs except weapons. Sejong thought that this might be the case, but if they sent samples of another invention and they later found out about their weapons, it could shake the relationship between Joseon and the Ming Empire. Then Suyang believed that the Emperor had specifically chosen these words in his letter in order to, in any case, try to obtain their weapons for further study. At this point, Suyang suggested to his father that he send Wang Jin 2,000 silver coins as tribute to avoid sending them their weapons. Sejong could not believe that Suyang was actually offering to send such a large and impressive sum to Wang Jin, since Joseon usually sends only 500 silver coins per year to the Ming Empire. However, Suyang still insisted on giving Wang Jin so many silver coins, as he believed that in the current situation this would be the most thoughtful and cunning decision. A few days later, Wang Jin learned that instead of a sample of Suyang's invention, he would receive 2,000 silver coins. Jin's ambassador said that Suyang would personally bring part of this money to the Ming Empire this year. After this, the ambassador asked Wang Jin why he still indicated in his letter only a sample of the invention instead of directly demanding a new weapon from Sejong. Then Wang Jin said that he deliberately did not indicate the specific name of the new invention in the letter, since if Sejong had sent him something else, he would have suspected some kind of secret plan in it. Wang Jin believed that if this had happened, the Joseon government could have run into some trouble, including an increase in the amount of tribute. However, in fact, the Joseon government made a very unexpected move and Wang Jin believed that this time Joseon would not be threatened by the Ming Empire. Wang Jin also believed that if Joseon had problems granting their requests, then they could easily take something more valuable from them. Wang Zhang believed that in this way he could easily get Siyang as a hostage, for whose ransom he could ask Joseon for almost everything he needed. Meanwhile, one of the Joseon residents named Yun he was chopping wood while his neighbor wanted to tell him about the recent news that the capital would begin collecting volunteers for military training. Then Yun he told his neighbor that he was not very interested in this news, as he believed, since due to the fact that he was illiterate, he could not make out anything. Hearing all the details Yun he believed that if even the slightest mistake was made, he could easily be sent to the north. Also Yun he said that if training takes place in the capital, then the capital's military leaders will train them, which creates its own certain difficulties. Besides Yong, he believed that if the training took place in the capital, 
then the training there would be exclusively for palace guards or warriors of the cavalry division. More young he recalled that he did not know how to read and write, which made him feel that he would be of no use in these exercises. However, neighbor Yun he told him that no one spoke about the cavalry, and among the conditions there was nothing said about the fact that only high-ranking people were recruited there. At this moment, Yong he thought for a moment, and said that if all this was true, then he really had a chance of becoming one of these volunteers. The advertisement also said that a volunteer would only need to indicate his name and have a strong body paired with a strong will. At this moment, one of the slave owners, who lived in the northern lands of Josian, sent one of his slaves to the capital for training, giving him some money, food and warm clothes. Also, this slave owner told his slave that if he simply plans to run away from him, then his parents will suffer heavy punishment. Despite the inhumanity of his master, the guy was very grateful to him for allowing him to go to these capital exercises. A few months later, the day came when 1,052 volunteers from all over Josian arrived in Nodunaru, where present-day Noriangjin is located, for the exercise. Suyong looked at all these people and thought that he would be able to gather a little more people. Then the man who stood behind Suyong told him that these simply do not yet know what awaits them during their exercises. From this, Suyong concluded that among all these volunteers there were quite a few naive people who expected some kind of privileges, and he believed that they would have to experience a lot and learn a lot. However, at this moment, Suyong was wondering why this man suddenly decided to hide behind him. It was An Song, who was formerly a civil servant calligrapher, whom Sejong appointed as a military adviser. An Song was very scared, as he was afraid of screwing up in front of Suyong and Sejong, to which Suyong told him that if Sejong appointed him to this position, then he would definitely handle his new responsibilities. After this, Suyong decided that there was no point in postponing his plans and he decided that it was time for him to go out in front of the volunteers and give a speech to them. First, Suyang came out in front of the volunteers, greeted them, and introduced himself to them as their coach. Suyang also told the volunteers that, by order of King Sejong, he would personally train them in the coming months and teach them military skills. Suyang also wanted to teach volunteers to master new methods and weapons for combat, which are very different from what the current royal troops can now do and possess. However, before the training began, Suyang wanted to conduct a small series of tasks to which he could determine those who would continue the training, while the rest would be considered unfit. Suyang recruits was to run from Nodunara to Tanchen. Before the test began, Suyang explained to the recruits that if they were able to get to this place on their own, then their legs should be strong enough to withstand this entire difficult journey. Also Suyang told the recruits that the legs are an extremely important part of any soldier and that a man must have exceptionally strong and resilient legs. After a short introduction, Suyang told the recruits that they must run from Nodonara to Tanchen, following their teacher, who will guide them. Soon, some of the recruits prepared for the test, while some of them did not understand the seriousness of the test. Once all the recruits were ready for the test, Suyang told them to start running to Tanchen as soon as possible. Also during the test, Suyang told the recruits that if they felt that they could not handle this test, then it would be better for them to withdraw from the race so that the other recruits would not accidentally trample them. After some time, 649 recruits failed the first test, while the remaining 403 recruits successfully made it to tension. After the first test, Suyang told the recruits that during their next test they must show their body's strength and resilience. First, recruits will need to perform the bench press a certain number of times with a certain weight. The next exercise for recruits will be barbell squats and deadlifts, during which the weight of the barbell will be equal to 20% of their own body weight. To better understand which of the recruits would be better able to cope with the test, Suyang ordered them to approach one at a time and perform all these exercises in turn. The first to approach the barbell was a slightly thin and fit man who was about to lift the barbell. One of the assistants told the man that if he felt like he couldn't stay on his feet, he should just keep trying. The man tried his best to lift this barbell, but the barbell was too heavy for him, causing him to immediately fall to the ground. Suyang looked at this man and thought that his assistants were well prepared for the tests and therefore the recruits would be avoided from being injured during the tests. 182 recruits failed the second test, and only 221 recruits remained, with whom Suyang went to Mount Namhansen, where a training camp for recruits was built. A lot of time had passed since the start of the tests, and therefore the remaining recruits had to climb the mountain in the evening, 
and at that time it was very cold on the mountain due to extreme fatigue and low air temperatures many recruits found it very difficult to climb the mountain while climbing the mountain one of the recruits turned to one of his partners to ask him how he felt in such harsh conditions however this partner looked very cheerful and calm and it seemed to him that these tests were too easy for him and that he could run even further and lift even more weight soon su young and the remaining recruits arrived at the namhan sansiang fortress on the territory of which there was a training camp where the recruits would train upon arrival at the fortress su young told the recruits that the structure was designed to repel enemy attacks and other unforeseen threats that might threaten Josian. after this su young suggested that the recruits go wash and go to dinner to which one of the recruits asked su young if such things were not some kind of luxury for them in response to this su young told the recruit that while they were undergoing training they could use the local bathhouse at least every day to wash and clean themselves up hearing this the recruits were very happy and they immediately began to thank su young for his concern for them after five this su young told the recruits that tomorrow morning he would personally talk with each of them and today they could calmly go to rest after which the soldiers went to wash have dinner and rest the next morning su young interviewed each of the new recruits to better understand their goals and motivations for training with the others su young had almost finished interviewing the recruits and he only had two more recruits left to talk to the first to visit su young was hong san who was a slave in kangwandu and he believed that this young man had come here to change his current situation when su young asked hong san what exactly brought him here hong san said that if he enlisted in the military his master would free his parents hong san also told su young that he began training as a child to free his parents from slavery making every effort to express all his gratitude and respect to them su young looked at hong san and thought that even with such a small weight and height he must have tried his best to become stronger su young told hong san that the training during the exercise would not be easy but if he tried hard he could easily complete it after which hong san thanked su young and left his office su young had only one interview left to conduct and he asked this recruit to come see him however su young was horrified when he learned that this latest recruit was none other than hong yun song in korea hong yun song was known not just as an ordinary butcher but as a real monster who never spared his enemies and did not feel any pity for them going into su young's office yun song told su young that he was born in hong that he had a strong body and a poor family which is why he was unable to learn horse riding however despite his background and status yun song still wanted to succeed and so he decided to become one of the recruits at this moment su young believed that now he had a unique opportunity to rewrite the history of young yun song making him a strong and brave warrior su young then told yun song that a true leader should lead his army without showing any cruelty since he believed that a leader does not have to beat and abuse his subordinates however yun song somewhat disagreed with su young's statement and then he asked him why warriors are needed in the world if they do not use cruel and extreme measures instead of giving yun sung a clear answer su young told him that he would make sure to explain this to all the students during the training after which he ended his interview with yun sung when yun sung left the office su young thought that sejong was also very stubborn at one time and that he still managed to take the right path and he hoped that such problems would not arise with yun sung after the interview su young began training his recruits to maintain the correct formation position many recruits thought that this kind of training was very strange and at first glance it did not give them any skills however yun sung told the other recruits that this training will sharpen their teamwork skills since in real combat orders must be carried out quickly and unconditionally in addition to combat training su young was going to teach the recruits writing since he wanted communication between the troops to be carried out through writing during writing training Recruits made every effort to not only understand what was written in their text, but also to be able to write various hieroglyphs on their own. One of Su Young's assistants, who taught writing to new recruits, noticed how one of their soldiers had already begun to successfully read and write. This student was Yun Song, who claimed that writing was easy for him. At this moment, Su Young also turned his attention to Yun Song's progress and thought that if he had any problems with him, he would have to take appropriate measures however now su young saw that he was not having any problems with yun sung yet and he believed that if he continued to try so hard he could become one of the first instructors after writing lessons and a few extra drills the recruits were allowed to take a break from training while the rest of the recruits decided to play go 
Hong San decided to take a short walk around the training camp. The other recruits asked Hong San to play with them, but Hong San said that he wanted to get some fresh air. However, the recruits did not understand why Hong San decided to take an extra walk around the camp instead of resting, after which Hong San left the rest of the recruits and went for a walk. Walking outside, Hong San thought about his past and how his owner allowed him to go to these military exercises and about the last time he saw his parents. The day Hong Sang's father learned that his son was going to military training, he gave him some things and told him that this was his only chance to earn money and free himself from the shackles of slavery. Hong Sang's father also told him that he shouldn't worry about them and that he should just run away. But Hong Sang firmly insisted that he would free him and his mother. At this moment, Hong San was also thinking about whether his parents were still alive and whether he would ever see them again. Suddenly Hong Sna turned his attention to the tent, from which the light always burned until nightfall. Curiosity got the better of Hong San, and he decided to find out what was going on in this tent, that the light was constantly on there. Moving the curtain of the tent, Hong San saw Ma Il training with some strange devices that looked very similar to large bowling pins. A few seconds later, Ma Il saw Hong San looking at him, and he told him to leave if he came here just to watch him, which scared Hong San a little. At this moment, Hong San looked at one of the walls of the tent and saw that on this wall there were several more devices of different sizes, which were very similar to the ones Ma Il was holding. After this, Hong Song asked Ma Il what his rank and rank was, to which Ma Il said that he was a junior assistant to the commander-in-chief of the eighth rank. At this moment, Hong San turned to Ma Il as a junior assistant and asked him why he needed those big batons he was just twirling. However, before answering, Ma Il handed this club to Hong San and told him that he could explain everything to him and familiarize him with this device, which at first somewhat frightened Hong San. Then Ma Il told Hong San that this device is called Heavenly Condescension, which is used to teach a warrior how to properly wield his weapon. However, this baton was so large and heavy that Hong San could not only rotate it, but even hold it in his hands. After a couple of seconds, Hong San said that he wanted to personally look into the eyes of the person who came up with this training device. In response to this, Ma Il told Hong San that it was Mr. Suyan who developed these devices to make it much easier for recruits to master the skills of using their weapons. Ma Il also told Hong San that there are several types of such batons, the weight, size, and shape of which depend on what kind of weapon the recruit wants to learn to wield. Hong San was afraid that Ma Il would now force him to try all types of these clubs, and he said that he wanted to become a shield bearer hoping that in this case Ma Il would leave him behind with his clubs. However, at the same second, Ma Il took out the heaviest instrument, which imitated a battle shield and which had approximately the same weight. At this point, Hong San began to apologize to Ma Il for the fact that he still did not understand what types of melee weapons the recruits would have to wield. At first, Hong San wanted to escape from Ma Il's tent as quickly as possible, but at that same moment Ma Il stood in front of the exit of their tent, and told Hong San that now he would not let him go so easily. Ma Il told Hong San that since they started the topic of shield training, they should try to learn how to use it. This news greatly upset Hong San, as he realized that he was now stuck in this tent with Ma Il for a long time. As night approached, Ma Il finished training Hong San, and he decided that now he could go back to camp and go to bed. At this moment, Hong San was very exhausted and tired and he felt that if things continued like this, he was unlikely to be able to survive all this training. On the way to the camp, Hong San saw Yun Song in front of him, who was also awake in the camp. Hong San found Yun Song outside the camp a bit suspicious and decided to ask him what he was doing here. A blood-stained Yun Song told Hong San that he was tired of repeating these simple exercises that they do during training, and he decided to do a little training on his own and alone. At the same moment, Hong San noticed that all of Yun Sung's clothes were stained with blood, which scared him very much. Later, a frightened Hong Sang asked Yun Sung if he was okay, as he was afraid that Yun Sung had his own blood on his clothes and that he might have accidentally hurt himself. After a short silence, Yun Sung believed that Hong San was the only one who saw him in this state, and then he asked Hong San to just forget about what he just saw. Sung also felt like Siyang was watching him closely and that he too could see what Hong San saw. After that, Yun Sung turned to face Hong Sang and headed towards his side of the camp, 
believing that Hong Sang would quickly forget that he had seen him outside the camp. After walking a few steps, Yun Sung grabbed Hong San by the shoulder and told him that his clothes were not stained with his blood, which only scared Hong San even more. The next day, Suyang and Pyong arrived at the royal palace to demonstrate the results of their training in the three main exercises. Pion was going to be the first to show the results of his training, and during this time his muscles and body became much stronger and stronger. Li Hyang and Suyang were very interested to see how their younger brother showed his skills. Pyong performed was the bench press and he was able to lift a 140 kyn barbell without any difficulty. Sejong was very happy that now his youngest son had become so strong. After Sejong expressed his pride in his youngest son, Pion prepared to perform his next exercise. Pyong's next exercise was the deadlift, and he managed to perform this exercise with a barbell weighing 180 kyn. After that, Pyong performed a squat with a barbell weighing 190 kyn and Sejong calculated that the total load on Pyong was 510 kyn, which made Sejong very happy. After all these exercises, Pyong told his father that if his older brothers had not helped him, he would never have been able to achieve such amazing results in his life. Then Sejong told Pyong that even after he became so strong, he should never give up the path of improving his body. Pyong promised his father that even while he was in Beijing, he would not stop training and would continue to improve. Sejong also told Suyong that he would also like to know how much stronger he had become, since Sejong had heard that Suyong had become even stronger. However, at this moment, Suyong remembered that he had been spending more time on various government affairs recently, leaving him with less time to train. Suyong was especially upset that he had only trained for six days this week, but he couldn't refuse his father's request and he would still have to demonstrate the results of his training. Since Suyong last demonstrated his strength, his muscles have become even larger and stronger. Suyong's training were so noticeable that even Sejong's wife, who had some vision problems, saw how much stronger her son had become. Before starting the exercises, Suyong told his parents that he would not stop training his body so that he could continue to show his respect to them. Suyin decided to perform a squat with a barbell weighing 440 kyn as the first exercise. For Suyin to stand up with such a heavy barbell, but despite such a heavy load and severe muscle pain, he still managed to successfully complete the first exercise. After squatting with a barbell, Suyang performed a bench press, and this time the weight of the barbell was 330 kyn. But even despite such a large weight of the barbell, Suyang still managed to complete this exercise. Before performing the deadlift, Suyang looked at his palm and could not believe that he would actually be able to overcome this seemingly insurmountable threshold of his body's capabilities. Suyang had such a hard time completing the previous two exercises that his palms were very worn out, but this only motivated Suyang to train further. Meanwhile, one of Suyang's assistants looked at him and felt like a weakling who would never in his life be able to lift so much weight in even one of these exercises. Meanwhile, Sejong told Suyang that he should rest a little before doing the last exercise, as he believed that after the first two exercises, Suyang would become very overexerted. However, Suyang insisted that he was not tired at all, and that he was still able to show his strength, which somewhat surprised Sejong. Suyang prepared to perform a deadlift and Suyang tried to put all his effort into this, since this time the weight of the barbell was 430 kyn. All the eyewitnesses were so tense that some of them thought that Suyang would not be able to handle such weight this time. However, despite all the doubts, Suyan was able to perform a deadlift with such a huge weight. Suyan's total load in all exercises amounted to more than a thousand kyns. Suyan was incredibly happy for his sons. After this, Sejong immediately asked Pion to take a folding paper screen and depict Suyang's body on it. Suyang thought that it would be very similar to the poster of the gym where he went to train in his previous life. Suyang didn't expect his father to decide to do something like this, and he wanted to try to talk Sejong out of the idea. Suyang then told his father that such an action would look somewhat shameful in front of their descendants, and he said that they should not depict his body in such a way. However, in response to Suyang's claims, Sejong said that they must make sure that Suyang leaves his mark on the history of Joseon and becomes an example for future descendants. Sejong also said that from now on, the weight category in which Suyang just completed the three main exercises will be called Suyang's weight, which only confused Suyang more. The next day, 
Suyang returned to the training camp and informed the recruits that from that day on he and his assistants would train them in military affairs. Suyang also told the recruits that in addition to training in close combat, he would also train them in firearms skills, which were developed by Crown Prince Li Hyang. After this, Suyang distributed the warriors into various classes, among which were 41 shield bearers, 51 spearmen, 63 swordsmen, and 66 assistant commanders. Initially, Suyang expected that he would be able to gather fewer assistant commanders than he expected, and he simply believed that these people simply did not learn how to wield melee weapons well enough. Suyang also doubted that all the recruits would train well enough, and he felt that he should definitely control this as carefully as possible. Soon, the soldiers from the shield bearer class saw the metal plates they would be training with, and they were confused not only by their weight, but also by their unusual shape. One of the shield bearers looked at these plates and believed that these were the very shields that even a mountain falling on them could not break. Soon, one of the trainers yelled at the shield bearers for their slowness, and then all the shield bearers immediately grabbed their shields and headed to the training area. Upon arriving at the training site, one of the shield bearers complained that the shields were too heavy for their training, as it was very difficult for them to even just hold them. However, the shield bearer's trainer immediately ordered all his students to shut up and prepare for training, and the shield bearers had no choice but to begin training. Suyan looked at the shield bearers and thought that at first it would be very difficult for them, but with all this, this was a necessary measure for the most effective training. The first reason for the use of such strange shields was their size, since they had the highest area of protection for the warrior from enemy attacks. The second reason for using such shields was their high strength due to the highest iron content, which is why these shields were so heavy. Suyang believed that in the event that the Ming Empire decided to attack Joseon, then these recruits would become trained enough to fight back the Ming Empire soldiers. During training, Suyang heard a conversation between two recruits about how some recruit was training harder and harder every day. Suyang was interested in this conversation and he decided to personally find out who this soldier was and how he managed to put in so much effort during training. This same soldier turned out to be Hong San, who became one of the shield bearers, and who already at that time had some skills in using a shield after training with Ma Il. Meanwhile, new recruits in the spear class were trying to master the Mikambo, which was the Korean equivalent of the Japanese Bicento, two and a half meters long and weighing 15 kyan. At first, many recruits had some problems mastering Mikando due to its length. However, already at this time, Yun Sum was easily swinging his Mikando so quickly that the other recruits did not have time to follow the movement of his body. A week had passed since the start of recruit training, and during the training it was easy to see the difference between those recruits who were doing well and those who were still having a hard time. However, despite all the difficulties, Within a month most of the recruits were able to master the basic skills of using their combat instruments. One day, Hong San decided to eat a little rice cake with pork together with one of the soldiers. Hong San believed that despite how harsh the conditions in this camp can sometimes be, this camp still feeds all the soldiers very tasty. During his training, Hong San became so proficient in wielding the shield that he could easily carry it on his back even during breaks between training sessions. When Hong Sang's partner asked him how he could eat so many rice cakes, Hong Sang said that because of the pork, the rice cakes had a very pleasant taste that was very hard to resist. With the abundance of juicy and tasty pork, Josian chefs decided to try adding pork meat to rice cakes instead of vegetables which is why Josian residents began to eat these cakes even more often. Hong San soon finished his rice cakes, and he decided to return to camp and get some more of them for himself and his partner. Due to his continuous and rigorous training, Hong San began to expend a lot of energy, causing his appetite to become even stronger over the past few weeks. Soon all the soldiers were gathered in the camp, as Suyang wanted to tell them about a new test that all warriors must pass since this test should help the warriors strengthen and strengthen their legs. Suyang told the warriors that in two days they would all go on a campaign, during which the warriors would be given heavier equipment. However, the soldiers did not fully understand what kind of campaign Suyang was telling them about, and they decided to ask him as many details as possible about this campaign. Then Suyang told the soldiers that they would have to walk a distance of 40 kilometers along a mountain path in heavy uniforms. At that moment, the soldiers lost all their fighting spirit, 
because they could not even imagine how difficult the path they would have to overcome. After two days, the warriors armed themselves with new equipment and set out on a hike up the mountain while it was raining heavily outside. Many warriors thought about leaving everything right now and going on a hike, but due to the risk of running into mountain raiders, they still had to continue on their way. Suyang turned his attention to how many of the warriors were exhausted after several kilometers traveled, and he decided to organize a small halt at which they would regain strength and continue their journey. At this moment, the warriors began to take jugs of water out of their bags, because despite the barely cool rain, all the warriors were very exhausted and they were all very thirsty. Then Suyang told the warriors that when they drank water, they would also have to swallow a grain of salt in order to maintain the water balance in the body longer, and so that they would be less thirsty. Suyang also told the warriors that they should not worry about running out of water, since at the next stop they could easily replenish their water supplies. During the halt, the warriors felt a little better, and at that moment they considered that they were very lucky that they went on this difficult campaign together with such a person as Suyan. Soon Suyang and his warriors continued their march, during which Suyang began to think that in less than a month he would be training new instructors. Suyang also drew attention to the fact that Yun Sun remains the same extraordinary and very mysterious person. Suyang also noticed how, during his training, Hong San turned from an emaciated and short guy into a strong young man who was confident in his abilities. However, not only Yun Sung and Hong San were able to distinguish themselves, but the rest of the warriors also changed for the better during their training together. Su Yang was very proud of his students, and he couldn't wait to show his father how he had trained his warriors to protect Joseon from any danger. Meanwhile, Pyong had already arrived in the Ming Empire and headed to Beijing where he wanted to personally meet Emperor Zhu Jizhen. Zhu Jizhen was glad to welcome Pyong to Beijing, and he was glad that Zhou Zian was striving for enlightenment and respect for the Ming Empire. Jizhen also heard that Pyong was passionate about calligraphy, so he asked him to demonstrate his skills and practice. Pyong thought that Jizhen wanted him to write him some beautiful and wise phrase, to which Jizhen said that he was always glad to read a letter that was written by the hand of a master. Immediately after this, Jijin asked Pyong to give them the small arms that Pyong had brought to Beijing as tribute. When Jijin asked Pyong why the Joseon army did not use these weapons in the fight against the barbarians, Pyong said that they decided that they should not be too willful again. Pyong also told Jijin that Joseon shows its respect for the Ming Empire in the same way as a son shows his respect and respect for his parents. At this point, the imperial eunuchs believed that the Joseon warriors had not yet used this weapon in practice from which they concluded that they were dealing with an as yet untested model. Pion also told Jijin how powerful this weapon is and that almost anyone can learn to use it masterfully in just a couple of months of practice. Then Jijin decided that if Pion praised a completely new type of weapon so much, then it was worth checking its performance in practice. A few minutes later, a firearm was tested in the imperial courtyard, giving it and several shells to one of the imperial guards. After a couple of minutes of testing, Eight shots were fired from a firearm at a target in protective clothing, three shots of which were able to hit the target. One of the eunuchs conveyed to Jijin that if these shots were fired at a person, then he would have no chance of surviving these shots. Jijin also learned that this weapon not only requires much less gunpowder to fire a shot, but also allows you to fire at the target much more efficiently. Jijin was very pleased with the result of the tests and he believed that this time Joseon was able to create a weapon that was superior to any weapon of the Ming Empire in all respects. Jijin asked Pyong to bring a thousand of these weapons to the Ming Empire as tribute, but Pyong said that in this case Joseon would not be able to hold the line against the Mongol invaders. Pyong also said that as a tribute to the Ming Empire, he brought with him two thousand liang instead of firearms. Meanwhile, after conducting a joint campaign, Suyang hit Yun Song right in the face with all his might. The fact is that the reason for what happened was the first dismissal of a soldier from his post for unworthy behavior. Meanwhile, Pyong was walking through the dragon cave in Nagan, which contained many caves and Buddha statues. And Kyung, one of Joseon's painters and sculptors, accompanied Pyon and told him about this place. While walking, An Kyung turned his attention to the new Buddha statues that had recently appeared and he wanted to show them to Pion as soon as possible. This statue was very similar to Suyang, and Injiang said that the local sculptors decided to take his image as the personification of one of the aspects of the four great heavenly kings. Kyung also showed Pion that if they continued their walk, 
they would see that the sculptors had made several of these statues at once. Suddenly Pyong noticed that these statues looked suspiciously very similar to Suyang, which raised some questions among them. Then in Jiang approached one of the sculptors and asked him who carved these statues and where their image was taken from. This sculptor told Pyong and in Kyung how two years ago a couple of people were selling counterfeit medicines on the streets of Beijing and one unknown gentleman really didn't like it. Then this gentleman struck down one of these deceivers, and people say that it was none other than the king of growth himself. On that day, one of the artists captured the image of this gentleman, which entailed a change in the image of Buddha. Then in Kyung remembered how Suyang once told him about a very similar incident that happened to him during his stay in Beijing, and in Kyung found this coincidence somewhat funny. However, Pyong was not amused at all and was furious that the sculptors had made such an implausible image of Suyang. An Kyung was at a loss, and he asked Pion to calm down, as he was afraid that with his behavior and emotional state he might attract unnecessary attention to him. Pion didn't like how the sculptors depicted Suyang in such a way that it looked like he had a lot of fat in his abdominal area, which he thought was just disgusting. Pyong couldn't let anyone else see it, so he said that he would have to postpone his trip to Beijing and paint the real image of Suyang. After some time, Pion and Njiang arrived at a huge rock twenty meters high to depict the real image of Suyang in it. Standing next to this rock, Pion told An Kyung that Suyang stood out not only for his body, but also for his mind, and therefore he wanted to portray him as a bodhisattva. A few months later, a group of sculptors led by Pyong stood on the site of this rock with a majestic statue of Suyang. And Kyung said that this statue has an unusual dark aura, and that it vaguely resembles a celestial black dragon. Chongyang Mountain Festival arrived in Joseon, during which people visit the mountains and admire the beauty of autumn. On this day, Suyang wanted to show his father the results of his soldiers' training. The first thing the soldiers did was greet Sejong, and at that moment all their movements were almost perfectly synchronized. Sejong could not help but pay attention to the coordinated movements of the soldiers, from which he concluded that their training was more than successful. Sejong also told the soldiers that they would become an example not only for future soldiers, but also for all the people of Joseon. After the greeting, Sejong asked Li Hyang to evaluate the level of training of the newly minted soldiers. Li Hyang came out in front of the soldiers and ordered them to prepare for battle formation. The shield bearers came forward first, while behind them stood the spearmen, behind whom stood the archers. To test the level of training of the soldiers, the royal soldiers decided to try sending several heavy rolling logs at them. When the royal soldiers cut the ropes, the logs immediately rolled towards Suyang's soldiers. To protect himself from the blow, Hong San ordered all the shield bearers to put their shields forward and reflect the blow. After the logs collided with the shields, the shield bearers immediately began to attack, using small axes to do this. A few seconds later, Almost all the logs were cut into small logs. The next to demonstrate their skills were the spearmen. The essence of the test for spearmen was that each spearman had to hit the weak points indicated on the dummy with his spear as quickly as possible. However, Yun Sung decided that this test was too easy for him, and then he cut his dummy into pieces. Next, Sejong decided to test the skills of the shooters by placing a small target on the test field in the center of which the soldiers were supposed to hit. During this test, the soldiers took turns stepping forward and starting shooting towards the target. At the end of the test, the soldiers rolled forward a large structure, which was loaded with hundreds of explosive arrows, which were supposed to be fired at one moment. A second after the weapon was fired, the arrows immediately flew towards the target, and at that same second the target was completely destroyed. Sejong was very pleased with Siyang's work, and he believed that with such a strong army and powerful weapons, no country would fight against Joseon. After the tests were carried out, many soldiers received higher social status, and among these soldiers was also Hong San, who was now called Yung Biem Su. A couple of days after the combat testing, early Joseon General Li Ji Nak, aka Li Wan Bang, received a letter saying that the recent combat testing of soldiers in Joseon had been successful. Ambassador Wanban said that Sejong not only confirmed the successful completion of the combat tests, but also approved many of Suyang's soldiers for military service in the Joseon army. Then Wanban said that if all this was true, then these new soldiers were very gifted people, and that ordinary soldiers could not be compared with them. However, Wanban also believed that despite the level of training of these soldiers, 
they had no real experience in combat. Ambassador Wan Bang agreed with the words of his superior and added that such a high level of training of these soldiers does not give them any guarantee of survival in the face of a real threat to Josian. Von Bang was also confident that despite such an effective training program, these soldiers were not trained to withstand extremely low temperatures. Wan Bang then decided that this method of training new soldiers, although good, was far from ideal and he wanted to contribute to the training of soldiers. Ambassador Wan Ban believed that perhaps they should not train soldiers in mountain ranges, as it was quite dangerous terrain even for the most experienced and trained warriors. However, Wan Ban said that he did not intend to send all the new soldiers to the mountains, and he said that he intended to send all of the couple dozen people to the mountains. Wan Ban also said that he would definitely assign one of the local residents to these soldiers so that they would not get lost and die in this harsh terrain. However, even under such conditions, Ambassador Wan Ban was afraid that if at least one soldier died during his training, it could greatly damage Wan Ban's reputation in the person of Sejong. Wan Ban then said that he must prepare new soldiers for such conditions anyway, otherwise he simply could not entrust the defense of northern Joseon to such soldiers. Suyong's soldiers arrived in Hanyang, where a new stage of their combat training was planned to begin. Wan Ban greeted the soldiers and told them that he perfectly understood how difficult their military exercises were. However, Wan Ban said that Hamnyung is an extremely harsh and inhospitable place, where bandits and severe cold reigned. At this point, a couple of soldiers who were with Wan Ban told the soldiers about how they once lost an ear and received many different scars that still left discomfort. Wan Ban then told the soldiers that he would like to see their level of training, and that their first test would be the brutal cold of the local mountain ranges. The warriors will have to climb to the top of Mount Bactobong and leave something there that would indicate that they actually managed to climb to the very top. Before the warriors begin the test, they must choose 30 people and two commanders who will have to climb to the top of the mountain. One Ban also told the warriors that in this test they would be very limited in time, and therefore they would have to climb up and down the mountain as quickly as possible. After Suyong's soldiers decided who would participate in this test, one of the local residents arrived to them, who would have to accompany these warriors. Yun Song then told the man that they first needed to make a plan and route for their journey, and he asked the villager if he really wanted to go with them. Yun Song also told the resident that if a warrior received some kind of assignment, then it was his duty to carry out this assignment to which the resident said that he himself understood this very well. However, the resident told Yun Song that their soldiers had only spent a day in the mountains, and the places they would go to would be even more harsh than those they had been to before. The resident also said that even their most experienced and experienced hunters put their lives in great danger when going to these places. At this moment, Yun Song squeezed the map in his hands and interrupted the resident, telling him that if he was not going to accompany them, then he could get out of here and not disturb them. At this point, Hong San said that one of the people who had previously trained them was from Gap San, and he told the warriors a lot of useful advice in case they had to wander through the mountains. Yun Sung became more and more irritated by the second, and then he pushed Hong San on the shoulder and said that it was time for them to pack their equipment and move out. When all the soldiers prepared to go to the mountain, one Ban looked at their confident faces and believed that such self-confidence would not help them survive in such harsh conditions. One Ban also began to suspect that these soldiers didn't even know how to fight, and that they would probably lose at least a couple dozen fingers during this ordeal. In addition, One Ban looked at the guns in the warrior's backpack and tried to understand why they still needed these strange iron rods. During the hike, a local resident noticed that almost all the soldiers were climbing the mountain holding heavy shields and weapons to which Hong San said that this was nothing for them. Hong San also said that they also have special devices that make moving on slippery and icy surfaces much easier. When the resident asked the warriors who came up with all these wonderful devices, Yun Song immediately remembered the very moment when Su Young hit him in the face with all his might for violating discipline. Then Yun Song still replied that it was all Su Young's idea, after which he immediately said that it was time for them to stop talking. Soon evening came and the warriors decided to find a place to spend the night, where they set up a small camp. Soon the soldiers found an excellent place to spend the night, where they immediately began to pitch their tents. While the rest of the warriors were setting up tents, Hong San made a fire, 
and the local resident was very surprised at how these warriors were able to set up this camp so quickly. Hong San told the villager that Suyang also originally wanted to train them in mountain survival, but due to lack of time, this type of training had to be postponed. By this time, Hong San had just managed to cook military stew, the smell of which the resident really liked. Then Hong San gave one portion of the stew to the resident and said that he learned to cook it just during military exercises and that this food is very satisfying and gives a lot of strength. The villager tried the stew and really liked its taste, and then he wondered how Hong San managed to achieve such a great taste. Hong San then said that they first roast the pork, dry it and grind it, then they use various spices, and this time Hong San used cinnamon and dried cherries. Soon, one of the warriors arrived at Hong San, who reported that they had finished laying out the tents, and Hong San decided that now it was time to decide how the warriors would guard the camp. Hong San told the warriors to pair up and take three positions in the camp, in which they would take turns regularly. It was deep night, and at this time Yun Sung sat near the still unextinguished fire and monitored the situation in the camp. At this moment, Hong San approached Yun Sung, and Yun Sung Wu told him that it was not his turn to be on duty at the camp yet. However, Hong Sang told Yun Sung that he just wanted to talk to him a little about how he should be at least a little kinder to the rest of the soldiers. Yun Sung then said that even though they all had a common goal, he still couldn't give up, as he believed that in this case the soldiers would take advantage of his good nature. Yun Sung also told Hong Sang that if he doesn't like the way Yun Sung commands his warriors, then Hong Sang can calmly tell him so. Yun Sung then told Hong Sang that he understood that he was some kind of hindrance for him which is why he informed Su Yang that he left their camp area at the wrong time. Soon, Yun Sung noticed that his time on duty had come to an end, and he prepared to return to his tent. Before returning to his place, Yun Sung told Hong Sang to be careful, since other times he might be the first to set him up somehow. The next morning, all the warriors, together with a local resident, were able to climb to the very top of the mountain and plant their flag there. The resident said that he had been up and down this mountain many times before, but this time the climb up the mountain was much easier than usual. Suddenly, Yun Sung felt that something was wrong here, and then he looked up at the sky, where dark clouds could be clearly seen. At the same moment, Yun Sung ordered all the other soldiers to demolish the camp and prepare torches, since they should under no circumstances remain in these mountains. While Yun Sung was giving orders to his warriors, a large tiger appeared behind him and was ready to attack Yun Sung and tear him into small pieces. However, by this moment, Yun Sung managed to take out his blade and neutralize the tiger for a while. However, the wound was not critical enough to completely neutralize the tiger, and after a couple of seconds it prepared to attack Yun Sung again. However, Hong San could not allow Yun Sung to die, and then he immediately prepared his shield and headed towards Yun Sung. As a result, Hong San not only managed to arrive to Yun Sung's aid in time, but also repelled another tiger attack. However, the tiger's blow was still strong enough to knock Hong San down. At that moment, there was a ravine behind Hong San and Yun Song, and they immediately began to fall from it to the very foot of the mountain. The rest of the soldiers were very scared for Hong San and Yun Song, and they did not know how they could help them and save them. Even during military exercises, Su Yang forced his recruits to perform the same exercise many times. On one such day, Su Yang ordered the soldiers to perform 31 repetitions of touching the heavens with their feet, which seemed to the soldiers a virtually impossible task. However, Su Yang didn't care at all about how difficult it would be for his soldiers to complete this exercise, and all the soldiers began to perform it while Su Yang counted the number of repetitions completed. As a result, the soldiers had to perform the exercise with straight legs, pointing them to the left, then up, then to the right. After just a couple of dozen repetitions, Many soldiers found it very difficult to perform the exercise, and they tried to continue doing the exercise with their legs bent. However, Su Young saw that these soldiers began to perform the exercise incorrectly, and he stopped counting until all the soldiers performed the repetition correctly. Because of this, the soldiers still tried to perform the exercise correctly, but due to extreme fatigue, many soldiers began to feel unwell. In the end, the soldiers still managed to complete all 31 approaches which is why it was even difficult for them to breathe after this exercise. After all the soldiers completed this exercise, Su Yang asked the soldiers how many sets the soldiers completed before performing the last repetition correctly. However, 
At this moment the soldiers were so exhausted that they could not even speak for a while. Then Suyang had to repeat his question, but this time his tone of communication was harsher than usual. At this point, the soldiers became very upset that Suyang had to talk to them in such a tone and then they said that they had performed the exercise sixty-two times before the last repetition. Hong San soon landed in the snow and survived his fall from a high cliff. After a couple of seconds, Hong San turned his attention to Yun Song, who was also lying in the snow and saying something, which indicated that he was still alive. Then Hong San decided that it was impossible to leave Yun Sung in this state, and then he tried to wake up Yun Sung. When Yun Sung one opened his eyes, Hong Sang asked him how he felt after falling from such a great height. Yun Sung said that he was fine, and Hong San guessed that the tree branches and soft snow greatly cushioned their fall. Yun Sung then tried to get to his feet and figure out how much time had passed since they fell, and Hong San guessed that it was more likely that only a few minutes had passed since they landed. Hong San then told Yun Sung that they should return to the rest of the warriors as soon as possible. Suddenly, Yun Sung saw a large, bloody spot on Hong Sang's side and he believed that Hong Sang was seriously injured. Soon, Yun Song got to his feet, and he and the wounded Hong San headed to the warrior's camp. After a couple of minutes of walking, Hong San told Yun Song that he couldn't walk anymore and that he should continue on his way without him. Hong Sang also said that he does not want to become an obstacle for Yun Sung on his way to promotion, and that he needs to return to camp within the next few days. At this moment, Yun Sung noticed the fresh tracks of the tiger and he did not understand how Hong San could stay in this place when a dangerous and ferocious predator was roaming nearby. Hong San then told Yun Song that he shouldn't worry about him, and that he could defend himself if the tiger attacked. At this moment, Yun Song looked at Hong San and thought that with his injury, he could actually become a serious obstacle. After a couple of minutes of thinking, Yun Song told Hong San that he would do as he told him and that he shouldn't stay in these places for too long. After a couple more minutes, Hong San walked up to a tree and sat down next to it with a weapon in his hands in case the tiger actually found him and wanted to tear him to pieces. Hong San believed that the tiger tracks he saw with Yun Sung were far from fresh, and he assumed that the tiger had been walking around this area for a long time and was tracking him with Yun Sung. Soon Hong San finally saw the same tiger that Yun Sung managed to wound at the top of the cliff. Hong San also noticed that with his blow, Yun Song was able to severely wound the tiger right in the eye, and he decided that because of this injury, the tiger had become worse in vision, and he decided that this could give him some advantage. However, Hong San believed that he still should not relax, since he only had one chance to neutralize the tiger by shooting it directly in the head with his gun. Suddenly the tiger saw Hong San and immediately ran towards him, while Hong San aimed his gun at the tiger's head. However, when the tiger began to approach Hong San, he immediately fired his gun, but he failed to hit the tiger's head. With every second the tiger was getting closer and closer to Hong San, and Hong San decided that these were his last minutes of life. However, at the same moment, Yun Song appeared, who thrust his blade into the tiger and completely neutralized it. Yun Song then looked at Hong San and told him that he hoped he didn't regret having to come back here. Yun Song also said that he only returned here because he was afraid that if he returned to the camp alone, it might question his leadership skills. Hong Sang then asked Yun Sung if he still harbors a grudge against Su Yang for what he did to him. That evening, when Hong San saw Yun Sung outside the camp, they were both also seen by one of Su Yang's assistants, who decided to immediately report this to Su Yang. Soon this assistant arrived at Su Yang, reported everything to Su Yang, and invited him to expel Yun Sung from the camp without any right of return. This assistant was also worried that if they continued to train Yun Sung, then sooner or later he might jeopardize Su Yang's good name. The very next day, he undertook his methods of educating the soldiers towards Yun Sung for his yesterday's offense. In the evening of the same day, Ma El asked Su Yang whether it was really worth applying such methods of education to Yun Song, since this act led to strong unrest among the soldiers. Su Yang then said that such a method of educating soldiers would moderate the discontent towards Yun Sung and give him time to rethink his behavior. Then Ma Ayo considered that in this case it would be enough for Su Yang to limit himself to a severe reprimand to Yun Sung in order not to give the soldiers grounds for unrest. Su Yang then said that Yun Sung was a very proud person, and a simple reprimand would only provoke him even more and Su Yang would not accept such harsh methods towards anyone else. At this moment, Hong Sang overheard Su Yang and Ma Il's conversation, 
and Su Yun said that he was confident that a person like Yun Sung could bring a lot of benefit to Josian. Then Yun Sung told Hong San that he had long ago overcome feelings such as resentment and hatred towards Su Yun. At the same moment, a group of warriors, along with a local resident, continued to conduct a joint search for Hong San and Yun Song. Soon the warriors managed to find Hong San and Yun Song alive and well. Meanwhile, heavy snow began to fall in Hamnyang, and this greatly worried Wan Ban, since it indicated that in the mountains where Su Yang's warriors were now, the snowfall was several times heavier. Then Wan Ban summoned his best warriors to go to the mountains as soon as possible and save the warriors of Su Yang. Then one of Wan Ban's soldiers said that there was heavy snowfall at the top of the mountain and even if they hurried, they were unlikely to be able to save all the soldiers. Then one Ban said that if these warriors died, it would be entirely his fault, and therefore he could not just sit and wait until they returned. Then one Ban mounted his horse and ordered all the soldiers who knew how to ride horses and knew the rules of survival in the mountains to follow him to save Su Young's soldiers. Soon one Ban recruited his strongest warriors and prepared with them to save the warriors of Su Young. However, as soon as the gates from Hamnyang opened, Wan Ban and his warriors saw in front of them all the soldiers of Suyang, whom he sent to carry out his task. At the same moment, all the soldiers unanimously greeted the somewhat perplexed Wan Ban and saluted him. Wan Ban was shocked by what he saw, as he did not expect that Suyang's warriors would actually be able to return, and he asked them how they managed to return. Then Yun Song told Wan Ban that they placed their flag on the top of the mountain, and completed his task. Yun Sung also showed Wan Ban the dead body of the tiger that attacked them, and said that they also decided to bring the body of the defeated tiger to Wan Ban. Then Yun Song decided to briefly tell Wan Ban the story of how they were attacked by this tiger, and how they managed to neutralize it. When Wan Ban got off his horse, Yun Sung apologized to him for being so late in their task. Wan Ban could not believe that a group of still young and inexperienced soldiers could cope with the ferocious tiger while even a group of mercenaries could not cope with it. Then a local resident told Wan Bang that in fact, this tiger was defeated by only two soldiers, namely Yun Song and Hong San. Yun Song told Wan Bang that they really enjoyed the trip despite such harsh natural conditions, and that they were able to survive solely because of Hong San. Then one of Wan Bang's soldiers did not believe that this tiger was defeated by just two soldiers, and then he immediately demanded proof that it was true. At that moment, Wan Ban became convinced that despite the lack of real combat experience, these warriors possessed outstanding skills that were necessary for a real warrior. Soon, all the soldiers who took part in this expedition were promoted, and Hong San was given the honor of training Wan Bang's new soldiers. However, on the first day of training, the recruits only said that the story that Yun Sun and Hong San were able to defeat the tiger and return alive was a lie. However, Hong San tried not to pay attention to the words of the recruits, and he, holding back his anger, greeted his students and announced to them the start of their training. Many recruits were frightened by Hong San's behavior, as they did not understand how he managed to contain his displeasure with them and act as if nothing had happened. After this, Hong San told his students that their training would be very easy and stress-free, and that they should not worry about not being able to pass his training. However, Hong San's students only asked him to say that the whole story about how they climbed to the top of the mountain and defeated the tiger on their own was a lie. However, instead of saying anything, Hong San took off his outer clothing, which at first greatly frightened many of the recruits. Hong San then pointed to his scar on his side and said that if his wound had been a little deeper, he could have died due to loss of blood and organs. Hong San also decided to make fun of his students a little and said that in addition to this, in the mountains he defeated another tiger, which he decided to eat in order to gain strength and continue his journey. This time, the recruits said Hong San, and they were scared to imagine how their teacher not only defeated another tiger, but also ate it. Hong San also said that in some places tiger meat is considered an exquisite delicacy, and that he is sorry that his students are unlikely to experience this wonderful taste. With every passing second, the recruits became more and more convinced that Hong San was some kind of psycho, and they understood that if something happened, he could do something to them that they could not even imagine. After that, Hong San asked his students to take a stick, and the recruits, scared to death, thought that Hong San would now beat them. However, Hong San told the recruits that he had something else in mind, 
after which all the students took sticks and headed out with Hong San. Going outside, Hong San picked up his shield and told his students that in order for them to be convinced of his strength, they would have to take turns attacking him while he defended himself. Hong San also told his students that if someone managed to break through his defense, he would reward each of his students with a five-fold portion of rice. This condition greatly motivated the recruits, and then they immediately began to attack Hong San. After a few hours, all the recruits were exhausted, and no one managed to break through Hong San's defense. Then Hong San told his students that since they could not break through his defense, and he managed to prove his strength, now they will have to follow all the instructions that he will give them. One of the soldiers was very scared of Hong San's intentions, and then he invited him to peacefully resolve their small conflict over a drink. However, Hong San did not want to listen to his students, and he immediately told them to prepare to do the exercises that Si Young taught him. Meanwhile, Pyong had already returned from his journey through the Ming dynasty with good news. Pyong informed Sejong that he and Emperor Ming had managed to resolve the issue of providing the Ming Empire with tribute and weapons, which in turn greatly pleased Sejong. Soon, Suyang also learned that his younger brother had finally returned after a long journey in the Ming Empire, and he was very happy to see him home again. Pyong told Suyang that during his travels he was able to personally speak with the descendants of Confucius about their ideas about food and body culture. Pyong also said that those people were amazed that someone could be so full of respect for his ancestors, after which Pyong handed Suyang a bundle of paper and said that he had a gift for him. When Suyang opened the package, he saw that it depicted a picture of the Dragon Moon Grottoes, which Pyong had visited. Pyong also said that now this place has a special connection with Suyang, since he was able to erect his statue there, which greatly admires the people and attracts new tourists there. Pyong also told Suyang how initially he was very outraged by the first image of Suyang's statues, since Suyang had too much fat on them. Suyang was very pleased that Pyong did something like this for him and he said that someday he would go there and look at this statue in person. The next day, while Su Yang and his son were training, guests arrived. Then Su Yang remembered that on that day Li Hyang and Su Zhong were supposed to go to the hot springs. At this moment, Li Hong Wai, who was the son of Li Hyang and along with this nephew of Su Yang, arrived at Su Yang. When Su Yang asked Hong Wai why he came to them, Hong Wai said that he would like to hear a little about his journey through the Ming Empire. Hong Wai heard that in the Ming Empire there are ships that can sail through mountains, to which Su Yang said that in fact these ships sail on rivers that flow between the mountains. Then Hong Wai became interested to know how these ships managed to sail between the mountains. Su Yang then said that about 800 years ago, the Ming Empire was replaced by the Sui dynasty ruled by Emperor Yang Di. Yang Di was a very cruel ruler who forced his people to seize lands along the Yellow River and Zhangjiang. Su Yang wanted to tell Hong Wai many more interesting things, but at that very moment Hong Wai's teacher arrived. Ji Piang Jiang, who was Hong Wai's teacher, told Li Hing's son that it was time for classes and that it was time to prepare for lessons. Su Yang saw that little Hong Li didn't really want to start his lessons, so Su Yang decided to do something. Then Su Yang asked Piang Jiang, can he, as a representative of the royal family, also study a little with the son of Li Hyang? Piang Jiang didn't really want to delay Hong Vai's training, but he allowed Su Yang to spend another half hour with Hong Vai, which Su Yang was very grateful for. Su Yang then stood up from the bench and walked towards his training ground, asking Hong Wai to follow him. Soon, Su Yang and Hong Wai found themselves at a small training field where he wanted to teach Hong Wai to play badminton. Su Yang picked up the racket and shuttlecock and reminded Hong Wai that his father was also cultivating his body, thereby expressing his respect to his parents. Su Yang also said that such training can only be done after the coming of age ceremony, when the body is fully formed. Su Yang said that for those who have not yet reached adulthood and who already want to start training their body, he specially developed a game like badminton. After this, Su Yang wanted to demonstrate to Hong why how to play badminton by throwing a shuttlecock in his direction. However, this time Su Yang was unable to correctly calculate the force of his blow, and the shuttlecock flew past Hong Wai at great speed. Su Yang's blow was so great that if the shuttlecock had hit Hong Wai, he could have been seriously injured. At that moment, Su Yang realized that he needed to reduce the power of his blow several times and the frightened Hong Wai said that he was unlikely to be able to learn how to play this game. The fact is that before this, Su Yang had only played badminton with Ma Il, and when playing with him, they always hit the shuttlecock with all their might. Su Yang then told Hong Li that he had simply tripped this time, 
and he suggested that Hong Vi try again. This time, Su Yang hit the shuttlecock with normal force, which gave Hong Wai some chances to hit the shuttlecock back. And this time, Hong Wai was actually able to throw the shuttlecock aside, and at that moment Su Yang and Hong Wai began to play badminton leisurely and calmly. Soon, Hong Wai really enjoyed playing badminton and did not want to stop playing. However, Pyong Jiang, who was watching Su Yang and Hong Wai play, told Hong Wai that they should start practicing. At this moment, Su Yang understood Pion's desire Jiang to teach Hong Wai something new, because when Li Hyang returns from the hot springs, he will probably want to check what his son learned today. Then Su Yang said to Pion Zion that working on one's body is also a form of training, and if it is included in Hong Wai's curriculum, it can greatly help him in the future. First Pyong Zion thought a little and decided that he would still include such a discipline as physical training in Hong Vi's training program. After Pyong Jiang approved of Siyang's idea, who suggested that Hong Wai start training in badminton. While Hyung Dong was watching the practice, Siyang thought it would be nice if Hong Wai played with his son. Hyung Dong was very happy about this offer, and he also wanted to try playing badminton with his cousin. A lot of time had already passed and Hong Wai and Hyung Dan did not stop playing until the evening. While one of the assistants was counting how many points Hyung Dan and Hong Six had scored, Pion Jiang began to get very annoyed that he had not been able to teach Hong Vi any of his lessons. Then Pion Jiang told Su Young that Hong Vi would have enough games for today as it was already very late, and it was time for Hong Vi to return home. Then Su Young proposed Pion Jiang wants to play badminton with him, but Pion Jiang refused this offer but Suyang continued to insist on playing at least a couple of rounds with him. Pyong didn't like Suyang's insistence, Jiang, and he said that it would be very sad if Li Hyang found out that his son missed his classes today. But after a few minutes Pyong Jiang finally decided to play a few rounds of badminton with Hong Wai, and this game fascinated him very much, and he did not want to stop. At that moment, Suyang's wife arrived and wanted to invite him and Hyung Dan to dinner. Suyang then invited his wife to play badminton with them. But Suyang's wife said that she would love to play with them. But it was too late to play. But after a few minutes, Suyang ended up playing a few rounds of badminton with his wife. And the game captivated her as much as Hong Wai and Pyong did, Zayana. The next day, Li Hyang returned from the hot springs and the first thing he wanted to do was talk to his son about his activities. Li Hyang told Hong Wai that he had missed too many classes and it would take a lot of effort for him to learn everything he should have learned yesterday. After this conversation, Hong Wai told his father about badminton, and Li Hyang also decided to play several times with Su Young. Soon badminton gained immense popularity, and not only representatives of the highest nobility, but also ordinary people began to play it. Meanwhile, in the Ming Empire, Jijin wanted to know from his assistant how many weapons they had managed to create. Jijin's assistant reported that they were able to obtain 3,000 guns from Josian, while they also expect to receive another 8,000 firearms. Jijin also learned that due to the weight and volume of heavy firearms, they had some problems with their transportation and further operation. Then Jijin ordered that only his strongest warriors be trusted to use heavy firearms. Jijin also said that he was planning to attack and seize the northern Yuan territories soon. While Jijin's assistant was trying to understand the motive of the emperor's actions, Jin told the emperor that everything would be done on time. Then Jijin said that he was going to use the power of firearms in order to finally deal with the arrogant power of the northern Yuan.